have indicated we are meeting here to discuss a very important topic the decolonization of the of our collection we decided on this topic after looking at our collection and we decided that it was it was time for us to decolonize the collection we're looking at what we have about 500,000 plus collection and then we said what is it that we can do to make sure that we add on. It's not about we're removing, but we're adding on. We're making sure that the others are also um, uh, included. I'm very excited to be part of this uh, symposium, an inaugural one. Yes, of course, it's biannual, and I'm already looking forward to the next one. We also decided to have this symposium in June, which as uh, some of you, if you don't know, in South Africa is the Youth Month. This is important because it is the young people who in June 1976 decided that they were going to, they were fed up with the, 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 change, the, 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 the fact that the changes were not happening at the time. And then they decided that, that it was time for them uh, to stand up. And again, if you remember the Arab Spring, it was the young people who stood up and they decided that it was time uh, to effect change. And I've recently noticed and I've heard in Kenya that it is the young people who have decided to stand up and say they wanted to see change. So that is what is, uh, is happening when it comes to the decolonization uh, project. We are going to, as you have seen, the, the, the program, the lineup, is filled with researchers, practitioners, and normal uh, uh, individuals who have got interest when it comes to decolonization. We intentionally decided that we wanted to, to be like that because we're just starting, it's an inaugural one. We want to make sure that as we carve this path to a decolonized path, we've got all the, the people that are the, the stakeholders involved. I am looking forward to the, the to hearing. I'm looking forward to hearing from all the different uh, speakers. As you have noticed, they are local and some are international. We've got uh, six sessions. There are also uh, uh, session chairs who are going to, uh, who I'm going to introduce at a later stage. They are going to be the ones who will be steering those different sessions. I just want to also to make you aware that the online uh, etiquette will, will apply. Make sure that you, you, you mute it and make sure that you on raise your hands when you want to be, when you've got questions and we've got the charts. We also, I also want you to, to make use of the charts as you're listening to the different presentations. Make sure that <laughs> you engage. Uh, Mr. Mestile, you can have your camera off, if you don't mind. Thank you. So let's make sure that also we engage the speakers. The questions and answers will be at the end. Out of each session, we'll allow the speakers to present, and then at the end, we'll have uh, we'll give a chance to members of the public to um, to raise whatever questions. But I'm also encouraging people to use the chat so that they can also engage uh, the speakers later. We are now going to start, and as you have seen the program. We are going to start uh, with um, the local uh, uh, the heads. The first person who's going to um, to take on the podium is the captain of the UFS libraries uh, um, library services, the director Majinet Molopiane. Over to you, Majinet. I'll stop sharing. Thank you. I'm sorry, Monday. Um, Jeanette is not available at this point in time. She has an emergency. Sorry about that. No, that's fine. Uh, that is okay. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Mr. Neka. I would like also to ask um, uh, the, 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 te the technical team to play a message of support from our DVC, Professor uh, uh, Reddy, who is the DVC for Research and Internationalization. Over to you, Tim.
Are you winning, Tim? The UFS Library and Information Service Director, Jeanette Molopiane, the UFS Library and Information Services Management Team, the entire collective of the UFS Library and Information Services staff and the UFS community at large across all three of our campuses. Distinguished guests, esteemed guests. My sincere apologies for not being able to physically join you at this inaugural biannual symposium. Due to the wonders of technology, I share this recorded message well ahead of this important event. I congratulate the UFS Library Apologies for that. Uh, Tim, are you okay? Are you fine, Tim? Okay. Thank you. The UFS Library and Information Service Director, Jeanette Molopiane, the UFS Library and Information Services Management Team, the entire collective of the UFS Library and Information Services staff, and the UFS community at large across all three of our campuses. Distinguished guests, esteemed guests. My sincere apologies for not being able to physically join you at this inaugural biannual symposium. Due to the wonders of technology, I share this recorded message well ahead of this important event. I congratulate the UFS Library and Information Services for this fantastic initiative that aligns well with the UFS's Vision 130, which is our strategic roadmap leading us to 2034, when the university will commemorate our 130th anniversary. Vision 130 is ambitious, aspirational, and prioritizes excellence, impact, and real visibility amongst other drivers such as care, social justice, and sustainability. The library and information services are integral to the successes of our vision. As I browse through your wonderful program, I've noticed that the symposium features local and international speakers who are knowledgeable about a range of topical and current concerns in the knowledge domain. To all our speakers, thank you for agreeing to be part of this important event. You have no idea how proud we are to have you in our midst. I must apologize in advance for taking a little bit away of the thunder from the distinguished speakers. Our theme is highly topical and relevant. Decolonization and decoloniality are important concepts that inform key debates informing higher education. Decolonization is a political process recognizing the histories of colonialism and our divided yet shared histories. Decoloniality is an epistemological process informing the knowledge to domain that reminds us about inclusivity, diversity of voices, and the project of decentering knowledge. Decolonization and decoloniality are both intellectual and political projects that direct us to new ways of being and knowing. 
these aspects will strongly feature in what promises to be robust discussions. I hope that you will engage in lively, energizing, and healthy conversations throughout the symposium to rethink, expand, enhance, and develop our knowledge base. Colleagues, once more, congratulations to the UFS Library and Information Services and the UFS community at large for hosting this timely symposium. We would like to assure the speakers that your valued insights will form part of current and future discussions inside and outside the UFS. I wish you all great successes and thank you. Wow, thank you. Um, thanks a lot, Professor Reddy in absentia. And I would like us using also the wonders of technology to give uh, Prof. Reddy a round of applause. Sorry. Can you please un uh, unmute the, the, the yourselves? Are you fine? And Tabi, I see your hand is up. I'm not sure if you were clapping. <laughs> I was clapping and raising my hands to our leader. <laughs> That's the wonders of technology. <laughs> thanks a lot, and thanks once more to Prof. Red in absentia. And we are really, as University of the Free State, uh, promising that through this symposium, we want to make sure that the UFS Vision 130 becomes a reality, and we are indeed ready. And moving on, I'm not sure if Prof. Um, Msila is on the line. He has a few minutes ago, she, he sent me a message that he was he hasn't received the, the, the link, but I did send it to him. Uh, Prof. Msila, are you on the line? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Prof. Do you want me to project or you can project from your side? The presentation? Please do. Please do. Thank you, Prof. Please let me know if you can see the yes, presentation. Yes, I can see. I can okay, see thanks, Prof. Diva. Just before you start, Prof, uh, sorry for uh, for interrupting you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to um, introduce to you someone, uh, I would say he doesn't need uh, an introduction when it comes to decolonization, but just to, for, for cause of formality's sake, I would like to uh, just to share a short bio of um, Prof. Voisida Msila, whom I'm, I'm very excited uh, that he's part of this inaugural uh, um, decolonization symposium. Uh, uh, Professor Msila is a situated NRF research, uh, a, a researcher and a former Fulbright Fellow at M M Michigan State University. He is a former head of UNISA's Institute for African Renaissance Studies and served as a director of the change management unit at UNISA. At present, he's a professor of public leadership studies at the Tabombeki uh, School in UNISA. In 2013, he earned the Chancellor's Prize for Research. His two upcoming books in 2024 are Reading Biko, Critical and Reflective Essays, as well as Rethinking Higher Education in Africa, Examining the Ongoing Struggles for Cognitive Justice and Politics of Transformation. Other books include A Place to Live, Red Location, and Its History from 1903 to 2013, and Ubuntu, Shaping the Current Workplace with African Wisdom, and Finalizing the current indigenous perspectives and theories. His areas of specialization include leadership and management, decolonization, Africanization, curriculum theory and development, as well as the politics of education. Professor Msila serves as editorial board, mem in, in, in editorial board member of 16 journals and is an active journal reviewer of 15. 
From 2017, he had been an educator for the prestigious South African Literal Awards. He has also served as a board and council member of the Films and Publications Board, as well as Lutuli Museum, and is a regular keynote speaker in South Africa and abroad. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Prof, and over to you. Thank you so much, Mr. Madiba. I hope you can hear me. You're loud and clear, Prof. Thank you so much. And thanks for the invitation to, uh, to be part of this inaugural uh, symposium at the University of the Free State. Um, I will start reading my presentation. As you can see that uh, the title of my presentation is Decolonizing the Library Collections. In 2012 and 2013, the world was stunned by the destruction of the Timbuktu manuscripts during the occupation by Islamist militant groups. The collection of documents contained knowledge that spanned centuries. The knowledge destroyed in the conflagration comprised heritage, culture, and the legacy of intellectualism that has been part of African wisdom. Mali is the keeper of ancient manuscripts that reflected incipient writings in several areas, such as astronomy, mathematics, and ancient literature. The burning almost spelled a nail to the knowledge systems. The Malians appeared in the picture to salvage whatever they could to protect their heritage. Several manuscripts were smuggled out to Bamako, the capital city. The major paradox in the whole disaster is the revival of culture that was developed as one of the responses to colonization, then symbolized by the fire. A project referred to as Mali Magic ensured that people would learn from their history, which was reflected in the manuscripts. They revived interest in Malian culture and African history. The Malian empire was home to the King of Kings, who was the wealthiest leader of all leaders in the kingdom of Mali. Mansa Munsa's kingdom supported education and progress. And in his lifetime, the 1300s, Timbuktu was the center of knowledge production with a huge number of citizens being intellectuals who introduced disciplines at the University of Sankore. And these included various streams of learning highlighted above. Therefore, as the flames bent menacingly, they were destroying African knowledge and manuscripts that demonstrated the existence of intellectualism in Africa, despite contrary beliefs in Western narratives. Apologies, the Prof. Come again. Ap apologies, Prof. Can you just let me know if you want to, me to move to the next? I'm afraid I may be oh, stuck that, in one. Yes, if you don't mind. Thank so, you. Sorry for that. Thank you. The library's destruction in Mali was correctly cited as a hazard to heritage and collections. The collections we were innately part of decoloniality. This presentation examines the need to decolonize library collection, co co collections. The presentation touches, touches on the following subtopics. Decolonization and library material, collection and justice, equality and diversity, intellectual freedom and libraries, university intellectuals and collections, library and community integration, then the conclusion. You can go to the next one, Mr. Madiba. Decolonization of Africa has been ongoing process as the former colonies realized the extent of social, cultural, and epistemic violence against the indigenous. African leaders such as Julius Nyerere, Patrice Lumumba, and Kenneth Kaunda opposed the beast of colonialism in various ways. Nkrumah was once 
appalled as he walked on the premises of the University of Ghana, which he found to be a copy of the University of Oxford in England. When earlier intellectuals such as Anta Diop spoke of an African Renaissance, they referred to cultural and knowledge revival. Some intellectuals such as Kwame Nkrumah and Mpatele spoke of an African personality, a description that enhances the African identity. Intellectuals have explained African personality as a concept that refers to the cultural uniqueness of Africans as reflected in their behavior, values, beliefs, social and political systems. It demonstrates the common worldview that underscores collective being and intersection with all aspects of the world and other people. In opening this presentation, I would like to briefly touch on two concepts critical to the address, and these are library corrections and decolonization. The next slide, please. In a time of decolonial debates, conscious librarians have been concerned with the role that the library should play in entrenching social, social justice. Some have been absorbed with the collection that would demonstrate epistemic freedom reflected in materials or resources that support all knowledges as they underscore marginalized knowledges. The librarian's task is to identify what Wathiongo refers to as global ethics, which refers to the interconnectedness of knowledge. A response to knowledge production and global demands when it comes to knowledge. To a certain extent, Ali Mazrui talked about what he refers to as a triple heritage. And although some quibble with it, it was meant to have something to do with the interconnectedness and in Africa's heritage. Books have always been at the center of thinking and intellectualism. The, collect, the, the, the collections should underscore rethinking. Odora Hoppers, Catherine Odora Hoppers, has highlighted the need to rethink thinking. Can this be the basic function of library collections in a time of decolonization? For centuries, knowledge in higher education institutions, libraries, frequently referred to works from Europe and North America. And intellectualism was linked to the materials of Western Germany. Collections at universities reflected two aspects. On the one hand, intellectualism reflected in what the libraries had, whilst on the other, this was how the collections determined the kind of student or even academic that was created. In South Africa, the library corrections, collect, collections during the apartheid era were clearly in support of apartheid policies. A clear example here is fundamental pedagogics, a policy based on Calvinism. The collections were more biased towards apartheid pedagogy and beliefs. Colonial and apartheid knowledge was privileged, hence, in a world of transformation, archives and library corrections should reflect the diversity of society. The collections should reveal the ecological nature of institutions. Yet, coloniality pervades in several works that privilege the West as they demean the global South. The century's impact on knowledge is reflected in materials that demonstrate that modernity began with Western knowledges. We fail to talk about achievements of university in ancient Egypt or Timbuktu that we mentioned above. Collections may glorify the redeeming role of Western knowledges. Our inter intellectualism may omit civilizations that materialized long before Western modernity. 
the concept decolonization is introduced to counter the Western biases and coloniality that are still evident in texts and institutions. Next slide, please. Librarians are at the center of redressing Western epistemic violence that demeans indigenous knowledge systems and promotes silences in Africa. As more debates spread about transformation and decolonization, the more realization that universities in Africa should decolonize. Over centuries, Eurocentric knowledges have denuded African knowledges and dominated all other systems. In the process, indigenous languages, African cultures, and historical narratives have all become part of vanquished knowledges, thus perpetuating the silences. The struggle to decolonize library collections is a resistance to introducing decoloniality in the process of opposing Eurocentrism. Librarians should respond to these pressing demands. It is important to introduce books in ind indigenous languages, books that will help in intellectualizing these languages. Collections in Africa need more resources that would support the African Renaissance's idea of the revolver of culture, arts, and history. Library collections are pivotal in guiding epistemic control and form a huge part of the decolonization project. Yet, it would be difficult for librarians to embrace any thinking towards library corrections without understanding where they stand intellectually. Addressing past imbalances based on decoloniality is a complex and among the necessary strategies is to adopt a planetary intellectualism which encapsulates the need to include various types of knowledges. This is undergirded by the need for Ch Chakrabarti to refers to as a need to provincialize Europe. Ndovukacheni points out that provincializing Europe is meant to oppose the overrepresentation of European thought, which other intellectuals refer to as Europeanization of the world. Kachani adds that there is a need to de-imperialize and de-Europeanize the world, and this can be done through the provincialization of Europe. In library, corre library corrections, there must be a conscious move to center Africa as a historical unit, among other knowledges from the global north. Next slide, please. Library collections and justice. In the current times of rapidly changing society, libraries are also leading in transforming society. At least they should. Libraries ought to build inclusive collections that lead towards social justice, anti-sexism and anti-racism. Given our history in South Africa, libraries could not escape the oppressive agenda as reading material was frequently banned and censored. The library can do much to liberate society through a relevant and meaningful sel selection of collections. For example, Clark contends, libraries, quote, Libraries are, of course, also part of the dominant Eurocentric academic model, engaged in maintaining epistemic coloniality. In its structure of knowledge, acquisition, predominantly global north, management, and discoverability, all of which consciously or unconsciously are steeped in racism, prejudice and inequalities. Along with those who teach, library workers are also engaging in decolonization work, be that 
dismantling hierarchies in knowledge which use outdated classification schemes that privilege Western epistemologies or subject headings which other a, pers a, a, other, other, a person's class, gender, race, religion, and sexuality among the other facets of identity, close quote. Social justice works through institutions and is very broad with the library influencing thousands of students through its collections. When South African students stood up in 2015 and 16, they demanded higher education liberation through hashtag fees must fall, and this spread to a call for decolonizing institutions through hashtag roads must fall. The calls to deco decolonizing the institutions of higher learning could not have eschewed the calls to liberate other institutions' sections, and this includes the libraries. The students questioned the lack of the use of indigenous languages, as well as transformed research and teaching. The libraries were also at the center. Why is the students were standing up against exorbitant university fees? Their struggle included the demand for equality, social justice, social justice, the obliteration of racist symbol, and an end to epistemic violence. Not much work was done in libraries to focus on collections that examine various themes, including roads and coloniality in the curriculum. Few, if any, South African libraries openly join the student struggle. Clark writes of how Goldsmith Library and University of London conducted an exhibition under the theme, Liberate Our Degrees. The books display the library's mission clearly stated. One, we will work to diversify to, 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 to diversity to diversify our collections, to decenter whiteness, and to challenge non-inclusive structures in knowledge management and their impact on library collect collections, users, and services. Second point, we will take an intersectional approach to our liberation work to encompass for many parts of a person's identity. The third point, we are doing this work to decolonize and diversify our collections as part of an effort to ensure that the, lib the library collection, co collections speak to all voices, particularly those that are traditionally underrepresented in curricula and on reading lists we want to work collaboratively with our users in identifying the subject areas that do not address their experiences and identities and where the canon excludes them. In engendering social justice, libraries cannot avoid their role in engaging in critical librarianship that humanizes and is inclusive. Library corrections that entrench social justice help the library to play a role in a liberating mission as they become conduits of decolonization in the 21st century. The marginalized people should see their intellectuals and hear their voices. Libraries usually obscure African voices in philosophy, science, and arts. Sol Plachi, Samuel Mkai, Charlotte Makreke, Eskia Mpatele, Phyllis Ndantala, Mazisi Gunene, Noni Chamavu are amongst the giants in African writing that are not usually celebrated. Our libraries need more events to showcase the works of forgotten writers who are not featured much in the in collections because they do not necessarily represent Western intellectualism. 
Several African intellectuals have always expressed the notion of decolonization failing because many institutions try to decolonize in communities that are not transformed and communities that have not yet even started to decolonize. Libraries, whether at universities or in communities, are not likely to succeed in decolonizing if they are not part of a bigger society. Clark captures this collaborative role when she states, quote, what has become clear in the process of doing this work is that it cannot be done in isolation from the rest of the university. It will take an institution-wide approach. The struggles for decolonization are therefore internal and external. The core of a library's activity is the acquisition, organization, and dissemination of knowledge in the space both physical and intellectual of the university. So it is critical to decolonize as an institution as well." Close quote. The next slide, please. The concept of intellectual freedom is vital to library resources. For all libraries should have a written policy that spells out the selection and deselection of library corrections. Library personnel should also be conscious of these policies and understand why the selection policy has to be reviewed from time to time. Intellectual freedom is one of the core functions of decolonizing knowledge, for it speaks for epistemic freedom. Furedi argues that an intellectual is someone who is fascinated by ideas. The latter is what library corrections in a decolonial context should ignite. Library corrections should kindle what I refer to as planetary thinking, which supports ecologies of knowledge. The ALA highlights why intellectual freedom should be among the concepts cherished by decolonized libraries in the United States of America, for example. I find this relevant for the libraries around the world. I quote, intellectual freedom is the right of library users to read, seek information, and speak freely as guaranteed by the First Amendment. Intellectual freedom is one of the core values of the library profession. It promotes access to information and guides the defense against censorship. In a democratic society, individuals must be sufficiently knowledgeable to make informed decisions. Library provide their users with necessary information through a wide selection of materials from varying points of view. Close quote. In decolonial terms, Kachani uses the concept epistemic freedom, which he says is different from academic freedom. This author adds that epistemic freedom is broad and profound and is about cognitive justice and makes us conscious as to what we are free to express and on whose terms? Epistemic freedom is about democratizing knowledge from its current rendition in the singular into its plural known as knowledges. It is also ranged against overrepresentation of Eurocentric thought in knowledge. Social theory and education. Decoloniality seeks intellectuals who think beyond exclusive knowledge from the global north. Persang avers that intellectual freedom in librarianship implies freedom to think and express one's thoughts in an unrestricted manner, as well as the freedom to access information and ideas, regardless of the viewpoints of the authors or beliefs of the receiver. The next slide, please. 
at higher education institutions, university intellectuals should play the role in influencing library collections. Khan identifies the six stages for collection development. One, user needs analysis. Two, policies development. Three, selection. Four, acquisition. Five, weeding. And six, evaluation. So we are familiar with these steps, stages. Selection of the library collection is the work of library personnel, but it is worthwhile to work with academics when finalizing material at a university. The information professional knows what she does when she improves the library collection, but collaborating with other role players, such as academics, will improve her work. Next slide, please. In the 21st century library, patrons have grown to the use of digital collection or library. Communities of researchers, students, and general public have benefited from access to the digitized documents. The digital library contains manuscripts, books, journals, audio, and other forms of media. At the beginning of this presentation, we briefly discussed the destruction of the library material, about 4,203 manuscripts in Mali in 2012. Cultural heritage and manuscripts were destroyed and others were stolen. These collections included scholarly works and short letters. Many of these were restored in the 21st century as they were, because they were digitized. Several were preserved through digitization and were part of an electronic catalog. Library collectors are aware of these and should make use of these collections accessible for research. Fortunately, 90% of the manuscripts thought to have been destroyed were saved by Marians organized under an, an, an NGO. Today, libraries need to be more proactive in reconnecting communities with collections for cultural knowledge lost can be restored. And this is a critical step in reviving decolonial approaches to knowledge using technology. Although there might be challenges of connectivity in other African states, the advantage of the digital library is that it can be accessed on the internet through software. The digital collections are user-friendly and ensure that the collections will not be erased over time. Library staff should have an idea of what the digital library should look like and the collection will be informed by the kind of users who will use the digital library. If the library will be used by a few users, one may consider storing the collection on a local server connected to a few machines. But when the collection will be used by a larger number of internal users for research or education purposes, a cloud server may offer the best solution. Yet if the collection is meant to be shareable online for the world, the library may consider a website or a pre-built gallery software for easy access. The digital library is among the best in spreading the idea of decolonization because the sharing is for a limitless number of people. When libraries make the collection shareable online, they serve much larger users across the globe. The purpose of many digital libraries is to make a collection shareable online, whether it's a massive public database or a private access application av available through subscription or membership. Physical collections 
are often restricted in ways that make the contents as accessible only to those who can travel and even then puts the documents at risk of damage from being touched by many hands or other accidental harm. Rather than confining your collection to a box or behind a locked door, your custom digital library can be accessed by a potentially limitless number of people, as pointed out above. Technology has become very crucial in engendering what is referred to as a learning library. Using the idea of collaborative efforts needed for effective collections, the learning library concept revolves around four intertwined strands of communication and interaction among students, faculty, librarians, information resources, and curriculum, active program programmatic partnerships, curricular integration, sustained interactions among students, faculty, and librarians, and extensions of influence into a multiplier effect. The idea of a learning library is vital when it comes to decolonizing the library co co collections, as well as the university. Simons and others point out that librarians have discovered that when they are actively involved in promoting the idea of a learning library, they create opportunities for further influence in the university. Furthermore, Simons and others call for the visibility of the librarians as they state, quote, the visibility of, for, for librarians is, of course, only an ancillary effect of the larger goal of creating a learning library. Web partnerships, curricular integration, pervasive student, faculty, librarian interaction, and extended influence coalesce to form an integrated learning environment. This is the library as a true constructivist, constructivist space, whether physical, social, or virtual, as the place for conversation, coaching, and mentoring. As the network of association made possible through in-person and electronic communication, and as web of ideas and meanings that emerge in the minds of those who participate. Close quote. Libraries have a huge impact on communities, hence they can be a conduit of decolonization as they build knowledgeable communities. They serve as repositories of information as they provide a wide range of resources. They contribute to facilitating the dissemination and transmission of knowledge to individuals contributing to learning, research, and intellectual development. There ought to be more collaboration with other stakeholders as everyone understands that decolonization has to be embedded in operations as part of their work. All this should be informed by academic discourse and academic change. At UNISA, the Change Management Unit spoke of five pillars of transformation that would help support transformation and decolonization. And I found these pillars whilst writing this presentation very relevant to the development of the library collections. They inform the path of transforming higher education institutions, as well as section within, sections within the university. And the, 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 they are as follows. The first one, African scholarship, that is promoting African scholarship, you know, for curricular transformation that supports not only Western knowledges, but African-centered knowledges as well. So I see the library's function when really doing these uh, collections. It should form part of that looking at African scholarship. Secondly, changing the institutional culture. 
Again, the collections, the library collections can play a huge role in changing the institutional cultures of our institutions. Thirdly, governance, leadership and management. Seeing the leadership of the university working very closely with the libraries can also, can also help in advancing the work of the libraries, especially when they want to move towards decolonization and transformation. The next one is rethinking systems, you know, where the library would restate the new roles of ICTs. You know, again, looking at the collections, the collections can be very relevant in ensuring that uh, the university is moving towards the, the, that direction. The last one, promoting the discourse for change. You know, the collections themselves would be able to promote this discourse for change that is needed. In a university that seeks to decolonize library collections, it can be invaluable to use similar models with pillars as part of their strategic commitment to decolonize collections. It starts with understanding the broader goals of the university. The pillars are an example of a beacon that a team can use in an organization that wants to be driven by common goals as they decolonize. The discourses in similar models can help the libraries to understand the relevant practices as they share aims with a larger community that uses, that uses the, the library services. In conclusion, the discussion here demonstrates the mammoth task library collections play, especially in the context of decolonization. Decentering whiteness and transforming the library collections does not mean marginalizing the white Eurocentric world. Library collections should reflect various kinds of knowledge, and this means knowledge from the global south as well as global north. Decolonizing means people change the ways they view and understand library corrections. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. That is the end of my presentation. Wow. Prof, uh, thanks a lot, Prof Fungsila, for that insightful presentation. I think uh, the members of the audience, I just want to, uh, to ask you to do what I asked you earlier, let us give Prof a round of applause. Thanks a lot, Prof, for um, touching very important issues on, on important issues. I know I don't want to take a lot from you because I know the members of the audience are still digesting. Uh, the importance of a policy. I'm sure many colleagues from the academic libraries will tell you the challenges that we normally face when we're trying to convince uh, the other colleagues, from, especially from academia, when it comes to information uh, librarians as people who are specialists who know exactly what, what to buy and also importantly when to remove some of the, uh, of the collections, especially when they've reached their sell-by date. It's sometimes become very challenging when it comes to other colleagues in terms of what us as the library are doing, especially when we're saying this book, it needs to be removed and we need to create space for other uh, uh, information uh, resources. And I can promise you, after this, I'm sure many people are going to be looking for your um, contact details because what you've just said, you've hit on the nail on many some uh, areas that we as the, uh, in academic li libraries and also other libraries, we are struggling to address when it comes to, for example, letting other uh, colleagues within the, the, the communities to know uh, what our role uh, is. I can also promise you, Prof, that what you have touched on in terms of us occupying the central role and the importance of us trying to balance between the North and the collections and of, uh, from the North that tend to be uh, uh, dominating and try and also draw in from the indigenous languages. And I can also let you know that here at the University of the uh, Free State, we have got a, an Academy uh, of Multilingualism, which is also a, a center with that we, as a library we are working very closely with. We're trying by all means to address all these issues that you, you have uh, uh, addressed um, uh, in your uh, presentation. 
Prof, we really, really appreciate uh, what you've just um, uh, said, and I can promise you we're going to be re uh, revisiting this recording not once, but several times because there are so many things that you have touched that we as a, here at the university and I'm sure other li uh, libraries also have learned from this uh, uh, presentation. We really appreciate uh, um, this a lot. Thanks a lot, Prof. Thank you so much, Mr. Batiba, and thank you to the colleagues as well. Thanks, Prof. Wow. Thanks, colleagues. Uh, I think after that uh, very insightful presentation, I would like to get just a body break of a minute. Then whilst we are pre we're waiting for um, uh, Professor Songpa, I think I've seen him. Um, Prof, so can you, by indication, just indicate if you're in? Oh, yes, I see. I see you around. Um, you I'm me? going to just a minute, Prof. Uh, I'm just going to stop sharing. And uh, if you, you don't mind, then you can start maybe uh, projecting your presentation. I'm Thank handing you. over to you, uh, Namita, a session chair. Just a minute for body break, then we'll okay. be back. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, loud and clear. Yeah. How about you, Namita? Uh, morning, colleagues. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, good afternoon, Prof, because I know in your country it's the afternoon. This must fall was the eye opener, not only for South African, but to have a conversation with the decolonization of the curriculum. However, are we ready as librarians to be decolonize our collections? I'm hoping that Prof will highlight that, can we decolonize DTC? I don't know, but I will hear from him. Can we decolonize OCLC? I don't know. We will hear from him. I'm hoping that he will give us insight on that. Without wasting any time, let me introduce our professor, Professor Songfen. He's got um, MLS and PhD. He's an associate professor at the Department of Library Science, Faculty of Arts, and currently serves as an associate director at the Office of academic resources, Chulang Long Kong University in Bangkok, Thailand. He is also Associate Director of the Behavioral Research and Informatics and Social Science Research Unit, Sansen School of Management. He received his PhD in Information and Library Science from the University of North Carolina at Champel. Prof, without wasting any time, due to time constraints, I'm not going to read your whole profile. Over That's to fine. you. We are hoping as South Africans, you're going to answer some of the questions that I pose with your presentation. Please, colleagues, keep the house roll. You must be muted throughout the presentation. We can engage through the chat, so we'll answer when it's time for question and answer. Prof, you've got 30 minutes to do so. The 10 minutes is for us to engage with our users. The platform is all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Namita. So, um, well, good morning, everyone. Um, so good morning from Bangkok. So it's actually uh, 2.50 here in Bangkok. Um, but um, thank you for inviting me to um, sharing my um, experience and my perspective on uh, such an important issue. Uh, I've been working on this um, 
project and this topic for at least seven years now. And this presentation basically sort of uh, uh, respond, uh, corresponding to uh, what I've done so far. Um, so let me share my uh, screen real quick. Okay. So um, the title of the talk basically is based on my um, first paper is Thai Cataloger Use and Perceptions of Cataloging Standard um, Impact on the Managing Thai Materials Globally. Um, but in fact, um, even though we are based based on the first paper, but actually uh, we have done, as I mentioned, we have done the work for at least um, seven or eight years now. And, um, uh, the, my important colleagues, uh, Holly White is actually now in the U.S., uh, who actually also helped me. She used to base in Australia, but we work together and we are still working together on uh, such an important issues. Uh, um, the papers that, that we address, the first issue, the first paper is um, we address about um, the perceptions of of catalogers, uh, Thai catalogers in uh, various type of libraries, and also um, catalogers who work in um, non-academic, um, but um, they are supporting like library vendor. Um, uh, so they have um, a different perspective on using um, uh, um, different kind of standards. And also, but, but then um, in the second uh, study, um, instead of um, focusing on Thai libraries inside of Thailand, we were wondering if um, uh, what happened with the perceptions of Thai uh, librarians that would have impact on how um, the libraries outside of Thailand that hosting Thai materials and maintain and managing Thai collections. And we interview uh, a lot of people and basically um, a lot of libraries that outside of Thailand. Um, uh, but this study uh, was conducted during the COVID. So most of the most of the um, most of the data were collected um, online. Um, and overall, in the second study, we got about 32 um, uh, libraries um, from 51 potential libraries, which we have listed. But in fact, there are many, many more libraries outside of Thailand that, ho uh, that are holding um, Thai collections. And, and we would like to see um, in terms of, you know, how they treat the Thai collections and what the impact of uh, the issues about um, managing Thai collection inside Thailand and that has an influence on uh, on that and um, the third the third um, study would basically um, is um, impact on uh, how librarians um, perceptions towards the users how it impact the user so we conduct uh, an online survey uh, with the researcher in Thai studies so from various type of um, the scholars so there could be anthropology sociology history uh, from various disciplines and then we we have about 120 respondent and this paper were conducted in um, 2021 and the last um, study that I've conducted is um, it's I which is actually very recent the most recent one basically earlier this year uh, I did an ethnography um, of going to out to Japan and working in Japan in Japan um, in one of the academic uh, libraries in Japan um, to study about what the perception or how you know feeling like if someone who um, would have to cataloging and and describing and classifying Thai material outside of Thailand what would be the experience and and also I did an interview with some staff and, and all of these so as you can see that we all of these four study are seems to um, kind of uh, get together and responding to uh, how it started at the, from one simple um, perception of, uh, of librarians. But before I go with the result and, and all the details, I would like to start with the propositions in our study and sort of hypothesis in, in a way that uh, we consider that um, standardizations is perceived as a, one way to colon, col colonizations in the context of globalizations. And it's, it doesn't not really consider just only standardization of cataloging, but standardization in, in many other way. But especially when there's a lot of lack of inclusive process and, and the, um, the, um, democratization process during the standardization. So it, we consider that it could be perceived as a colonization. And, and um, 
The second part is the effect of the, such a colonization in, in which by failing to comply with certain standard, which in which I think um, many less dominant culture in the world, like we are non-Western, and I think um, in a way, Thai, uh, the example of Thai collection would be one, one way, um, that we say that you know, uh, the less dominant culture were struggle to disseminate their own knowledge. So because, you know, the, the cataloging were not uh, sync to the OCLC or the other global um, union cataloging platform. And, and as well, also, we have also struggled with the access to knowledge about their own culture. Basically, we um, a lot of Thai researchers may have difficulties um, getting information about Thailand outside of Thailand. And I will, tell, I will tell you later on why there is such an important on why Thai people have to go and uh, to find information outside of Thailand. Um, so let's take a look at the um, uh, the first, the beginning of everything that I've, I've been um, talking about is um, when we talk about um, uh, cataloging standard, uh, we, we interview a lot of catalog catalogers and um, one of the um, the first notion that we recognize is um, a lot of libraries using AACR2 and I think a lot of libraries academic libraries in in around the world are using AACR2 but once um, an RDA has been introduced for a century but the problem is about RDA that a lot of libraries are in Thailand that um, they when we discuss and we ask them why it's a very tough decision to move forward and, and fully implement RDA. And, and they, what they um, mentioned is um, basically is um, taking to a new, uh, adopting the RDA or a new standard um, is a big um, learning. It's take a learn a big le learning curve for them. So they need a time in order to to do that. And then also uh, they feel like in order to to um, implement it, they need to really really to understand the RDA or or any other standard. So that's why. And also they need someone to support. But uh, the, since there's no authoritative source in terms of RDA in local, like in Thailand, so at the end, it, it was like RDA was scatterly um, implemented. And, and that would be one of the things that um, we, we see. Um, and also, there's also the, the issues about um, subject access, um, basically providing um, classifications um, class and, and we and also describing some of the collections and um, we found that um, when we asked um, li the librarians and the catalogers about okay what they are what are what are the most difficult tasks a lot of them say that um, due to the um, the uh, standard that requires uh, the catalogers to translate or transliterate or romanize uh, the titles and, and the, t the name into um, English alphabet. So that would be a very hard. And and first is tr trying to understand romanization is not intuitive for Thai readers. And secondly, the way that you can romanize um, the terms uh, and use it translate or even the translations are not um, um, uh, not control. So basically, um, there are a variety of tasks and there are a variety of terms, there are a variety of versions of, of titles and, and, and authors' names that uh, become a very difficult to control. Um, and with that, uh, we can see that a lot of libraries, and I think this is also happening in other part around the world where um, a lot of libraries um, and a lot of nations, a lot of countries um, uh, are thinking about adopting a st international standard, for example, classification. But when it comes to implementation, they have to come up with, okay, the reflections of what happened and uh, how applicable they are. For example, in the Thai context, um, especially with the Dewey Decimal Classification, I think we we know the problem about Dewey this, um, Decimal Classification very well in terms of uh, how um, they are biased toward um, the Western culture. But um, when it comes to working in in, um, uh, in the local libraries, uh, a lot of libraries have to re rely on, since English is not our um, 
uh, native language. It's uh, we speak Thai, so basically we have to translate um, all the classification and standard. And by relying on the standard, basically by relying on the translation, maybe it's misinterpret, and also it doesn't uh, really corresponding to the the idea in the Western culture, which is very important. So um, I think that would be very interesting uh, finding. Also, we found that um, a lot of libraries have their own customizations of notation in terms of the cover. For example, uh, in the Dewey Decimal Classification, um, Buddhism is not one of the religions that um, it's very sub-class, uh, very sub-sub-sub-class sub in, in religious um, class, but um, but with a lot of majority of the class are Christianity. So uh, a lot of libraries in Thailand have to expand um, by using their own, but not sharing, but which is very interesting, but they develop their own um, the standard, um, sort of notations based off our Buddhism or Thai poetry and, 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 and making their own. So you can see that there are a lot of localization and customization. And when it went with, with all of those difficulties and with all of those challenges in adopting standard, when we ask about um, how, to what extent um, that libraries copy or do do uh, original cataloging the majority of a lot uh, the majority of libraries say that um, they do original catalog more than copy cataloging um, and, and which is for me very interesting because I found it's normally it's should be pretty normal that a copy catalog it, it should be sort of norm in, in these day but now original cataloging especially in the context of Thai materials are since there's no standard and anyone have their own um, known way to interpreting it. So a lot of library decide to um, original catalog them. Um, one of the reason why they have the copy uh, so the challenge mm, is well, why it's hard at, to. It's can you can you can you hear me? Can you see my slide? Hello. Yes, we can. Yes. See, Prof. Thanks. Sorry okay, for that, sorry. Prof. Uh, okay. Yeah. So the um, the challenge that we found is um, why they why they do original catalog because copying Thai catalog is not easy. First, um, we don't have the legal de legal deposit system that is very well maintained. So at the end, we cannot um, identify a unique identification number. For example, the ISBN, ISSN, um, because a lot of publisher um, sort of misuse um, the, the the system uh, of registering the ISBN, and, and so that's why. Uh, we can't rely on a unique identification. There are a lot of redundant, reprint, and, and, and there's many other issues. And, and there's a lot of their lack of copy functions in the systems and, and or the connections between libraries. And adding to another uh, very important part of the of this um, uh, the finding that we found that uh, Thai materials in general are besides you know classical book typical books we do have a very um, unique structure of of uh, of mm, sort of manuscript and, and publications culture um, for example um, a lot of publication that we have in, 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 we we have no title so it's going to be hard to cataloging stuff with no title um, uh, and which actually um, it impact how library interpret um, uh, the way that they they using cataloging record um, also uh, there are some um, title that is non-descript so there's no uh, no way to to read the script or there's um, a lot of as i mentioned a lot of reprint material but um we don't identify that or there are whether or not they are the same or they are different um there's a mixed between a lot of materials that contain multiple works so for example you see one um you know mm -hmm. the the um the book that you see on on the bottom um, right of the screen, the, both of them are the cremations, um, which actually people usually publish a book um, for for a few as a as a souvenir or or a memoir memoir um, for their losing one and, and but instead of writing something original, they compiling a lot of um, text and gathering together and did a reprint. And inside of that, there's a lot of mix. There's no um, um, sort of controlling themes or whatsoever. So the title doesn't really. Um, gives you the idea of what's inside the, the the books and it's very challenging for the catalogers to to um to do the cataloging. 
Um, there are many other stuff that I already mentioned, and, and as I say, with all that, uh, um, um, at that at that begin, beginning of uh, the issues that we found that the Thai libraries have uh, struggles um, in terms of the structure, a system, and to comply with the standards. Um, so, um, with the second study and, and basically the the fourth study that I did in ethnography research, um, we um, we want to share a little bit of the influences of when internals or domestic uh, records in, within, the, you know, like the time of Thai material inside of Thailand have an issue, then what happened to um, to outside of Thailand? So um, I would like to rest up some of the very interesting finding that um, when we talk when we talk about um, collections um, outside of Thailand, the Thai collection outside of Thailand, or um, uh, or foreign collections. Uh, we would thought that um, the collections outside of Thailand would be less superior, or maybe um, they would be less interesting comparing to the collections from the, from the Thai, from Thailand originally, but if you take a look on the circle on the right, and, and I found that there are so many um, unique collections. For example, in the context of Japan, uh, we see that a lot of Japan there are, there are some libraries in Japan collect the books that were banned in Thailand, and we do have a lot of books banned um, uh, in our system um, due to political and, and um, social um, restrictions. Uh, and also, there are some books that were not collected in Thailand because it's considered trivial. Um, and also, this is very interesting finding that um, when we, when I went to to a very, very um, a library in a very well maintained. Um, um, setting like Japan, um, they're very well. They maintain uh, Thai collections very well. That um, you can't compare the the conditions of the manuscript to um, to 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 the Japan because they are they're very well maintained. The the control of the um, the temperature, the humidity, and everything is very well. So that's why some of the collections in Japan are there, even though in Thailand we collect them, but the quality is not as good as the one in. Japan, and also we do have um, uh, some of the books of some of the collections that are very specific to Jap Jap Japanese users. For example, like manga, um, like the cartoons, and uh, that's very specific to Japanese users, but they're translated into Thai version or things like that. Um, when it comes to um, to cataloging outside of Thailand, I since there is don't have um, um, authoritative source in Thailand, a lot of libraries outside of Thailand decided they would like to copy, but um, but the problems about copying is it's, it's not easy to copy. So that's why a lot of libraries decide to use a copy and paste instead of direct copy or direct transfer records. So by copying and paste. Um, there is a it's a prone to um, to to mistake and 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 um, uh, issues in terms of cataloging records and also a lot of people who do not have backgrounds in in Thai um, language or some of them may have um, may know about Thai language but they don't know about how to cataloging because because due to um, the limitation of staff. So that's why the um, the approach that they're using it was just up to uh, the people who are doing, which could be very very. Um, there are a lot of libraries doing original cataloging also, but um, a, um, um, a lot of them say that they since they have a unique collections, um, they they do, but with so many different standards. And, and I want to I want to point out to um, one of the things that I've feel very interesting um, in the picture here on the right hand side on um, both of them are the um, uh, are the books um, the spine uh, of the books and, and normally the spine of the book that are you, you that are bound together that should be written in Thai but outside of Thailand they don't have the Thai uh, print um, so basically, um, what they do, they use the Romanized title. But the problem about Romanized title is nobody, you know, if people who read Thai, it's very hard to understand that. So um, in 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 all of what happened here is the 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 problems about um, 
uh, a lot of libraries um, now outside of Thailand um, still due to the budget concern and economy, um, a lot of libraries uh, feel like they might not have to interest to maintain the Thai collections. They also have issues about staffing issue, which could talk um, a lot longer. And, and also the funding that the influence of the donors to the collections, because we have a lot of um, people who are interested in Thailand and they travel to Thailand to collect a personal collections, but then at the end they donate it to the libraries. But um, without realizing that the bias and then all the things that you know come with the collections and the approach that they they collected uh, the, the materials also inherited to the collection that libraries receive also very concerning as well um i think since i i think um i have less time to um talk i think i'm gonna uh, skip to some of the very um uh, very uh end of the sort of a uh, idea about why um, and um, how can we proceed. Um, the, the potential impacts of, uh, of what happened in, in Thai materials, and I think it's also very important, interesting outside of, of, of the context of Thailand. I think many other minority culture or less dominant culture, I would say, are also have, uh, you know, like we may have other libraries in the Western world or in a very developed world that collect um, our collections. But the problem is um, we sort of, and they may very well mean maintain and then the collection, but it's hard for the people inside of the country to collect uh, and access to those data. And um, why? Because um, all those countries, for example, I, in, in my study, we we uh, talked to uh, the libraries in France, the libraries in Germany, in the United States, in the UK, um, in Japan, in China, in Australia, and all of these, they have their own local and national standard. So, and these are become a very complicated issue when it comes to sharing bibliographic records uh, because due to the high cost of sharing the Thai records to the bibliographic world, the number of libraries that participate in OCLC are, are smaller now, much more smaller. We have only about two or three libraries now in Thailand that participate in OCLC. Um, um, I, I think this is um, the, the influence of the that, but I think the impact of 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 what happening in and in libraries, in academic libraries, especially on the catalogers' desk, has potential has a tremendously impact how people access to the informations. Um, for example, um, in the interview, one of the per, one of the um, participant um, who is a researcher said that um, his, his research uh, is looking at um, a photograph um, alongside. But um, the problems about it is um, they couldn't find um, a, a, an authoritative source to to get the information that they want even though it's um, supposed to be a very important topic that um, that Thai people should collect and, and maintain and also the poor metadata has an impact on how people um, decide not to use the library to do research but they um, intend to um, instead of um, use the library, they tend to uh, develop their own. So they spend money on buying a new stuff, acquiring new stuff and collecting, which is another kind of um, issues about, uh, you know, the, colonisa uh, the colonizations of the materials. So at all of this, and, and I think this is the last part of the slide I'm preparing and I think um, would give a, a sort of the idea of what's next and um, and um, and uh, what's so then right so the first part that I think and we all need to think is not just only Thai collections but also um, any other less dominant culture that we need to think about is how can we empower the local culture the less dominant culture to um, own their practice own their um, culture or own the knowledge. So by by doing so, we need a great 
um, uh, effort in terms of building capacity of the cataloger to know about the standards to, uh, um, uh, and to at least to think about the standard, uh, critique the standard and, and make suggestions and make re recommendations. And also with the local people, and I think the great initiative in terms of developing their own resource and make them to be authoritative of of, of the culture and, and then become a center or a hub um, when the libraries outside of Thailand who want to hold and collect the Thai materials, the collections um, should be um, should be uh, collect or 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 um, export or import from the these authoritative source inside of Thailand to represent the real culture of Thai people, and. Um, and also, we um, we need to strengthen the resource sharing and collaboration, which I think libraries have done. Um, I'm trying to do uh, tremendously, uh, and and also partnership and collaboration is also a very important task for the libraries inside and outside of Thailand to work together through different um, uh, initiatives. For example, staff exchange, because right now the problem is um, when when I talk about Thai libraries and and Thai libraries outside of Thailand, but in fact, Thai libraries also collect. Materials uh, of Chinese, of Japanese, of um, French, of Italian as well, and we also struggling of dealing with the foreign material as well. So I think staff exchange would be a part of making um, the librarians and, and to understand each other and sh uh, and share the knowledge about what happening. And resource sharing and collaboration is also the key, and also sharing relevance uh, um, and and in what we are doing. On a global stage, um, we still need to talk about how to get local people involving in the standardization and guideline development process, which is a very critical part. Um, right now, we don't think that we have enough um, inclusive process during the standardization of many other standards that we are working with. And also, we have to think about um, technology and business solution where in which it should involve um, a lot of less dominant culture in the way, for example, the technology, the machine translation, the AI, the development of these. Um, of course, we talk about a lot of those development, but mostly the benefit, um, people who benefit from this are from the dominant culture, why people from the less dominant culture are still um, figuring out how can we um, deploy and use the best out of this technology. And the last part is um, to rethink about the standardization and as a whole. Um, um, I think um, one of the things that we have to think is um, when we think about cataloging, a lot of people would think cataloging as something that we would like people to access to. But in fact, um, when in the context of, of Thai materials uh, and we collect Thai materials and you know, especially outside of Thailand, uh, the, the metadata itself or the object itself, the manuscript itself are considered as historical, can be considered as historical objects. And the way that we describing things may um, not only um, utilize the um, discoverability or, or accessibility alone, but we have to think about um, the archival value of what we are working, especially from the part of cataloger, because cataloging is not just about describing, but it also is about preserving as well. Uh, and, and we need a better approach to be more inclusive and flexible uh, in terms of doing making the standards and, and, and diversity beyond national boundaries. Um, I'm talking about this because because I speak today here about Thai material, but in Thailand, we have so many subculture, very um, ethnic group people. And within that um, group, we ha also have a lot of issues about organizing and describing um, all of those materials inside um, Thailand. Um, so, so when we talk about Thai materials, it's not that um, very identical to every single part. It's not like formal. Uh, we also have diversity. So maybe outside of national boundary, maybe beyond, um, could be talking about disciplinary, uh, talking about political um, agenda or things like that. So. Yes, with all that, this is what I have for uh, my presentation. Thank you for listening. And now if you have any questions, please feel free. Thank you so much, Prof. Such an insightful. I did take a, a snap on your 
article. But uh, you'll excuse me if I pronounce wrong, but I will try. That's okay. Saying that Hong Smart are the heart of the any institution or organization and society at large. However, I want to find out from your side that cataloging catalogers can challenge as the standards and change it. Do we have that power? As we remember, catalogers are the main engine of mm -hmm. Hong Smart. So do they have that power or are not that liberated mm -hmm. in your terms? Yeah, uh, thank you for very good questions. I, I believe that we do have the power because um, especially think about, you know, like we not, we talk about the big dominant country like the US, China, they aren't interested in in a lot of cultures and they have they maintain a lot of cultures of materials from different cultures. The problem is about is they're trying to explain the, that culture from their own experience. But the problem is they, um, I mean, from what I talk to a lot of people in my, during my interview, they know that they don't know about it. They just describe based on what they know, you know, the ability of doing it. So um, I think if we, you know, in the less dominant come and talk, and I think the, uh, as I say, the model of standardization, it should not be centralization, but we should uh, make a, a standard, standard standardization of cataloging to be more distributed or more decentralized, where in which um, uh, different culture could have their own way of describing things, but they have to come together and have to be authoritative in a way. So that means uh, one single library cannot do that, except, you know, the national libraries, yes, maybe. But in general, even though the national library may opt to it, but if other libraries doesn't really quite get along with the national libraries, that also be an another issue as well, because, you know, one library, one national library, but academic library does not except to the, those standard, then it doesn't matter. Uh, it's still uh, the same problem. So I think within one culture, we have to um, sort of, you know, sharing all of this perspective and make people realize that um, we have, we, we should be out, we should own our culture and we should be able the one who actually describing and, and talking about our own materials. Okay, thank you, Prof. Before I go to the comment do you experience professional divide within your your thigh or is only south africa because with south africans mm -hmm. we have that uh, divide that i'm working for public library i'm working for academic library we don't mm -hmm. sometimes sit together and synchronize and be one professional Librarian, librarians. So tell me, do you also experience that? Then I will go to the questions on the chat. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Very good questions. Um, we do uh, in Thailand, and it's not just only in Thailand. Um, even in the well-developed countries, like in Japan, in the US, uh, there are some, still some DIY and, and differences on, you know, the type of different the different type of public uh, the different type of libraries um, um, uh, having uh, maintaining or developing their own standards. So I think in general, yes, we do. But at least um, all of these, you know, even though we do have different type of libraries, and you know, public library may not be really considered. But I think at certain point, um, we should have you know within within all of those differences between library between these type of libraries. At least the same type of library should come together and talk and discuss about what would be the best approach, the best guideline in terms of doing so. And then, you know, with different type of, of, of libraries, and then we come together and, and, you know, like within one culture, we don't need one standard. We don't need one guideline. We can have multiple guidelines, but at, as long as we work together and we could communicate with them. So, yes. 
All right. Thank you, Prof. Monday, I, you, I recognize you. But <laughs> before I give you a platform, can I read the comment on the comment session from Dennis, where she's saying that standardization perpetuates colonization, but also complain about the colonization approach used by countries like China and Japan that mm -hmm. um, affect knowledge sharing how do we strike a balance there after monday you will you will have the platform yes um i i think this is very important question um where in which we normally especially someone who are from less dominant culture would probably say okay um those country are um, probably are more advanced, are more powerful in terms of saying what standards should be. But in fact, in my experience, after talking to a lot of people in, in, in other countries, as I say, they are, they are not confident. They are not confident in what they are doing with foreign material still. So uh, in, that set, in that case, I still think that um, we do have a way of, um, of working with libraries um, uh, in, international. And international librarianship is one of the things that we, we should work on more and more and more. Um, but I think this is very, um, uh, it's not like there are, um, they are closing the doors. I think a lot of libraries are opening the door. Um, it's just a way that we need to um, being part of it and, and also aware of the, the opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Mr. Luata, can you switch off your camera, please? Over to you, Mr. Madiba. Thank you. And thanks, Prof. For that insightful. I'm sorry, I think I'm muted. Uh, thanks, Prof, for that insightful uh, presentation. We really enjoyed it. Uh, I think you have answered some of the, the questions that I wanted to find out. Is um, it's about the, the partnership with the with the neighboring countries. Uh, I wanted to find out how strong is the partnership you know, so that you can have one voice and that you can be able to take this into the international standardization uh, bodies, which are mostly, unfortunately, in the northern hemisphere. But I think we have already answered it in terms of your partnership with the locals because you're claiming that your country is very small. Then there's that big brother type of uh, attitude that is happening. I'm not sure if I'm, uh, you, you had me correctly. Thanks, Prof. Thank you. I, I, I agree. Yeah, that, that's the same um, 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 approach where in which um, I think partnership doesn't have to start in a big way, but in a stronger way, um, you know, like close partner could, but who also relate the same issues, also experience the same issue. Um, we, the partnering, it doesn't have to be just about signing an MOU, but also awareing about the issues about it and working together on solving those issues. And, 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 and you know, I think the colonial, uh, colonizations or decolonization, this is not one, one, um, one way or another that we have to solve, but I think it's a long way. It's, uh, it's a way that we have to work because, you know, now technology are advancing and things are, are moving uh, very fast. We we also have to keep up uh, all of those as well. Maybe other opportunity coming from technology um, uh, through the democratizations of the technology as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for your time. Um, now you can have your tea. Thank you, audience, for such a wonderful time. But due to time constraint, I have to end my session and give mic back to Mr. Madiba. Thank you so much. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Nambita. We really appreciate that. And also to Prof for that wonderful presentation. Um, we're moving on to session uh, number two, which is going to, uh, to be handled by um, Holder and I've seen um, uh, Mr. Loata, who is going to be who's representing uh, um, Mr. Antuli. Uh, over to you, Holder. Holder. Holder, are you on the line? Uh, yeah, yes, I'm here. 
Yeah. Okay. okay there you go. There you go. Sorry. Um, uh, this session of this professor was really very insightful, and there's a lot of things that we can learn from it. But I also think we have to have more staff to assist with all of the things, all of the changes that should come, all of the changes that is necessary to decolonize the different uh, collections, the Africana collections, the library collections, and everything. Now, for this session, the Fields Must Fall um, movement, which began in the mid of, of October in 2015 in South Africa, was a student process with the following objects uh, to stop increasing of student fees and um, to increase the government funding. Now, given our concerns about the library collections, we were quite apprehensive about the student led process um, because we were quite uh, afraid of what will happen to our collections if, this, if the process would come into the library. But we are currently working with some of the decolonization um, projects, especially in the uh, literature, to separate the look. We have se we created separate locations, for instance, for the um, African languages in our library. OCLC also identified a project um, with changes in the Dewey numbers for the religion, because a lot of the um, Change uh, a lot of the the Dewey 200 classification system is mostly for Christianity, and we must make space for some of the other religions also. So um, they are uh, working on that. Now we are interested in hearing from our students of the time to determine whether they can observe any changes, and um, are they witnessing any anticipated developments, and what additional changes do they? anticipate. Our first speaker for the morning is uh, Mr. Sikulu Lekili Luatla. He's a former SRC member, um, Dialogue and Associations in 2015. He's a former SRC president of the University of the Free State, a former researcher assistant, a unit for the institutional change and social justice. He's a pe people um, advocate for the Johannesburg um, Society of Advocates. He has an LLB, LLM graduate in specialization in environmental law. He's also a trustee of the Income Velile uh, Development Trust that is focusing on addressing access to education in rural areas. So we are giving over to you for the next 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I think I think as a starting point, uh, just to share some of my limitations, uh, because I'm I'm standing on behalf of uh, Mr. Nduli, who who requested that I represent him on the basis that at least we're the same generation of student leaders, and also I, I think. When I was interacting with the topic, and the topic basically asked a fundamental question, are we there yet? Uh, are we there yet? And I, I think I'll start by framing what was the demand. The demand was we demand a free, decolonized higher education. And one would begin to see some of the features it questioned the issues of gender patriarchy within the institutions of higher learning. It questions it questioned issues around the curriculum. It also questioned issues around whether we are in a foreign land. Are we in a South African university or are we in a European university? How much of us do we see when we enter the university space? So the, the demand then was centered around that to say, if you look at the symbolism in the university, what does it represent? 
if you are to look at the system, the logics of the university, which ineffectively affects its culture, does it speak to local needs? Does it center indigenous knowledge system? So the demand was around that. And it's been a couple of years ever since. So when I say I would want to start by expressing some of my limitation, I did not engage, you know, in terms of what each university has done to respond to the call. Uh, but you, what you can see, you probably see statements of decolonization. You can see projects that are also not resourced. And there are no resources that are located to some of those projects. So those are some of the uh, difficulties. So when I was thinking around the topic, uh, one of the things that really came into my mind was whether we are dealing with a real or imagined decolonization, or are we trying to look like we're decolonizing, we're doing something, and whether so many of these things we hope to achieve through these decolonization processes, are they possible within a capitalist enterprise that continue to be exclusionary in character? If we accept uh, our commission and omissions around that, then we can have a discussion uh, that says, um, what can be done now? So. I'm, I'm going to try and speak in the library context. You will realize what we wrote, I think, when we we're in the SRC, one of the things we said, where is this even archived? Um, I, we saw a lot of academic writing that came immediately uh, during FISMA's fall, be it some protests within the university, a lot of literature, academic literature came in. And we often get calls uh, to say, can I interview you? What was the thinking at the time? So uh, one of the areas I would like to challenge the library is to really archive, because it was a very pivotal moment in our education. How can we then archive that moment in history? I don't know how it can be done, but whether we can also re resource to say, what was the thinking? What were you thinking? It might be raw at the time, but I think an archival project, I think is necessary in terms of what was, what was the demand? Because often in my view, we miss, uh, we miss what the students are trying to say. Yes, we have inter interventions post facto, but we often miss. What are they trying to communicate? You will notice that in 2015, probably the library was uh, paint printed. Uh, it was called the, the Steve Biko Library or Robert Sobukwe Library, but it was not to say it must be Robert Sobukwe Library, but it was just to communicate that they are missing voices. They are missing voices that also should be taking a center stage in terms of what should be represented in the library. So that basically was some of the thought processes where buildings were sprayed. Uh, you could see, I mean, if you're at the University of the Free State, there's an area um, in front of FGG that was sprayed with all African leaders. It was not to say, we are African extre we are extremists, but it was to communicate that there is something missing. There is something missing. So that literature is very important in terms of achieving our aspiration when it comes to our decolonization uh, project. It is very broad. So I just tried now to narrow my input around the library. You know, when I was looking at the topic, uh, I looked at some uh, conceptual frameworks that have developed yeah. as well post-2015, uh, where there's been critical conversations. And that challenges us to say, what is our approach to decolonization? Is it, are we having a soft approach? Are we having a radical approach? 
or are we saying we are beyond reform? So I think I will end my uh, uh, in, uh, contribution there, but I must also apologize. When I was preparing the paper, I prepared broadly uh, without uh, necessarily looking at the library. So I decided to just deal with some aspects that are just said that around the library, library and what we were thinking. And I'm saying that there was a, a, a there was a documentary, but it was a document that was made by a student a couple of years ago. I felt uh, that that should have been professionalized. I feel like we need to really center the student voices. If it was it was student voices that also made us to have this conversation uh, today, but I think we need to capture those voices in their totality. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. We will now go to this to uh, our next speaker for the session, and then the questions. Ooh. Uh, the questions will be after the um, after Mr. Uh, Dr. Shikani's uh, presentation. I just want to pose the short. Uh, Biography of uh, Dr. Rekhut Sufetsi Shikani. He is currently a lecturer at the Public Policy at the Witt School of Governance and a research associate at the Witt Institute for Socioeconomic Research. He obtained a PhD from the Witt School of Governance and graduated from the University of Oxford, Platonic School of Government, and having completed the completed his master's in public policy degree in 2017. The research interests are um, public policy, complexity, com uh, economics, decolonity, oh, sorry, uh, digital public infrastructure and the digital governments. Uh, Dr. Shikani also consults for a variety of multinational political risk agencies. He is currently a fellow with the International Strategy Forum, which is coordinated by Schmidt Future, Features. Uh, he is an activist and deputy chairperson of Defend of Democracy and um, the author of Breaking a Rainbow, Building a Nation, The Politics Behind the Peace Must Fall Movements. He is also a Mandela Rhodes Scholar and a Mandela Washington Fellow a Shevening Scholar, a former Master's Fellow at the Public Affairs Research Institute, one of the Mail and Guardian's top 200 young people for 2016 civil society, and an Obama Africa program leader for 2019. Over to you, Dr. Shikani. So, so I usually give the bio, but I'm always told it's going to be shortened, so apologies, apologies for that. Um, so thank you so much for the the invite. Um, in fact, I've been looking forward to this since Mondi messaged me earlier this year, because when he messaged me, I was actually writing a paper um, that I thought might be quite useful for this particular symposium. Um, so I do have a presentation. I apologize. I, I usually don't use so many words <laughs> on lecture slides. Um, but, but it was because it is based on a paper that came out earlier this year that I thought it might be useful. Um, so I'm hoping I have the ability to share my screen. Um, will you just tell me if you can see it yet? It's loading currently. Still working on it. Yes, we can see. Okay, cool, perfect. So um, I, I, I do want to commend UFS um, because um, the previous speaker was talking about kind of centering student voices. And I know my book is being used as one of the set reading criteria in some of the, in some of the courses in, uh, I think, sociology and law, actually. I, I didn't expect law to happen, but <laughs> so I do want to commend you on this. And similar to the previous speaker, I'm, I'm not a scholar of libraries, um, so it's not something I can speak on. 
what the paper was writing about was really about trying to understand what is the relationship between acts of decolonizing within a university. Um, and a critique that I have about the utilization of decolonization within university sp spaces, not because it's particularly bad, but because academic freedom in its liberal sense limits the ability to achieve the decolonial project in, in very simple terms. That's pretty much the argument that I was making throughout the paper. Um, and, and I thought it was very important to highlight that point because we often embark on these exercising, hoping to get to some sort of end outcome, not realizing that the rules of the game of the university stop us from getting there in the first place. So I, so I sought out to try and really understand what this dynamic really entailed. Um, and it drew out of the context of there's been a lot of talk about kind of decolonization in both the global north and the global majority. Um, there's been numerous papers written on this, whether it is movements such as Rhodes Must Fall in Oxford, um, Rhodes or White at the university currently known as Rhodes or Rhodes Must Fall UCT, um, or the different initiatives happening across the United States and universities in the UK. We've, what we've seen is that at a global level, there's been increased questions about you know, the nature of the university. Um, and the applicability of the of the neoliberal or kind of liberal notion of academic freedom within these universities. But there's also been a question about whether these movements have been effective, right? So asking this question of, are we there yet, right? Um, the number one thing for me is like, what do you mean by there, <laughs> right? Like, what, what does the ideal outlook of a university look like? And as soon as you use the word, like the ideal situation, of anything, then you're definitely not talking about decolonization at that point, because these should be no one ideal or universal ideal of the university going forward. But that's something that I try and argue in this paper. And I am not sure if my slides are moving. They are, okay. Just gonna go one back. So, the, the main crux of the paper, um, after this, you can stop listening to me because this is pretty much the argument, is that I try and distill the notion of decolonizing universities into two different categories, right? One is what we would call kind of decolonial thought, and the other one is what I would call kind of or what we call decolonial action. And I create these two categories by es essentially asking the question of, if we viewed the university as a public sphere, and I'll talk about that just now, what would decolonization do within the public sphere of the university, right? And decolonial thought allows us to understand the activities of decolonizing the collection, curriculum reform, transformation within the university as a form within the logic of the university, as what one would call a sub-public of the university. Right. So you can create these decolonial options right within the current logic of the universal not system of knowledge production kind of dominated by modernism, as the keynote speaker was telling us quite well earlier today. But then it, it, it creates issues that I explain a bit later on about does that really change the nature of the university? Does that open up the university to different ways of being, to pluriversal forms of knowledge, right? And I, and I argue that it doesn't. I, I think it functions, but it doesn't get us to the end goal. And I view decolonial action as something different, um, as a counter public to the university, right? Where here the strategies of the movements, the strategies that you would undertake as a university are used not to just shift decolonial options from these kind of epistemological or ontological peripheries, right? But you move them into the center. You're actively trying to remove others, <laughs> right? And, and that doesn't happen through easy processes or nice dialogue, right? It happens through conflict and violence. We have to use kind of violence and through like a phenomenon lens, right? And it's something that we need to take quite seriously about what that activity entails, 
right? Without what we do know is that without some form of conflict or Fanonian violence, right? So I'm really going to emphasize kind of Fanonian violence. Then are we really achieving this kind of end goal of decolonizing? So I split up the public sphere just, just so we are all on the same page. I, I try and equate universities with the public sphere. These two things are not the same, but they do share strong similarities from a conceptual perspective, right? They, they both mediate rational debate um, and they both create hierarchies of inequalities informed by what's considered an ideal form of discourse and a rational form of discourse. Think of it as within academia, everyone has an equal say, but a professor has more of an equal say than someone else. You know what I mean? <laughs> right? Yeah. Universities create these hierarchies and that makes it slightly different from the public sphere, where as long as you're using rational discussions or rational debate, everyone's views are equal, right? So these are important differences, but I do kind of highlight this in my work, right? And I'm just going to skip over that because of time. What we do know is that universities in the country, whether they exist as a public sphere or a public sphere of a special kind, are generally underpinned by the notion of liberal academic freedom. And this is broadly kind of understood as like, allow people to research what they want to research, <laughs> which is why I often argue that like discussions of decolonization is oddly like a very kind of liberal argument, more than you would expect, right? But they, it isn't, liberal academic freedom insists that there is a contestation of ideas and opinions through some form of rational inquiry that creates or produces knowledge, right? And this knowledge can be then categorized into particular academic fields and these rules and processes you have to follow in order to produce this knowledge. So writing journal articles, book chapters, et cetera, et cetera, right? And generally when we look at academic freedom, we conceive it in a particular way through two particular lenses. And, and one is as an internal threat, Right. So we conceive academic freedom as a way of, you know, protecting the intellectual and professional autonomy of academia. Right. That we need to be good at what we do. And the second one is through like an external threat that we don't want the state to intervene in what the university is trying to do. That's generally kind of what academic freedom is trying to do and what I guess universities are trying to do through the library collections. But like the keynote speaker, I also use the work of Missouri, who looks at academic freedom from like a very different lens. And he uses like a, a, the, the African experience of academic freedom and what it means. And he says the same principled logic exists, but its conception through threats is not through the internal or external threat, but through what he would call kind of internal tyranny and external tyranny. And the internal tyranny was like the regime, like the African regimes that would stop intellectual freedom within universities. And I don't talk about it here, but I talk about it in the paper about like the three different African regimes that influenced universities. But the one that's of particular interest for me is that external tyranny. And this kind of refers to the almost homogenizing influence that Eurocentric academic norms have on a university, that it, it, it pushes universities to create some sort of ideal universal scholar, right? And this ideal universal scholar then functions as the vanguard for the civilization mission of knowledge and countries or societies or communities, right? And he views this as a tyranny and in a manner that I think is quite quite important in my mind. Um, it's going to go again, hopefully not, right? Because I think distinguishing between a threat, so the internal external threat that liberal academic freedom conceives of versus the tyranny is quite important because a threat is simply like the possibility to harm or influence, but you can kind of fight back against it in one way or another, right? But tyranny entails like this arbitrary and unreasonable use of power to control, right? This, this kind of like, um, what's the phrase I want here? Like the, before you can even think it's influencing you, <laughs> right? And because of that, it, and it's really hard to pinpoint exactly where like Eurocentric modernism finds its stimulus within a university. There's no like smoke filled room 
of individuals sitting and saying, we're plotting to make the university Eurocentric across the board, right? I don't believe in smoke-filled rooms, but, but they hinder the university in transforming or adopting kind of decolonial approaches. But instead, it opens up the window to say, well, you can diversify so long as you fall within the rules of Eurocentric liberal academic freedom or Eurocentric academic inquiry. So you can find your decolonization in particular activities. So you diversify the academic staff and students. You, you create particular fields of knowledge that can cr critique Eurocentrism, but you must still speak to Eurocentrism, right? right? You can create curriculum reforms. But in the face of external tyranny, these interventions are rather limited. And they function, if, if you haven't read this paper before, it's by uh, two authors, Tuck and Yang, written back in 2012. It's quite an influential paper in my mind. But if you don't take the exercise seriously, if you don't fully confront Eurocentrism, right, the impact is that decolonization becomes a metaphor rather than action. And it was something that I then highlighted, and I'm acutely aware of time. So I went off and I did like an example of this. I thought, let me go look at two particular exercises of practicing decoloniality within the university's public sphere. And I analyzed two particular debates and I compared two different versions of Rhodes Must Fall. Because people often argue that Rhodes Must Fall in Oxford and Rhodes Must Fall at UCT are one and the same. They have strong similarities, but some huge differences that I thought would really become indicative of the difference between decolonial thought and decolonial action. So I looked at these two debates. The one in Oxford was kind of an Oxford Union style debate. Uh, it's like three speakers, opposition, proposition. And the topic was must roads fall. So it was about the road statue at Oriel, um, at Oriel College. And then I use a different type of debate. Um, it was the University of Cape Town's University Assembly on the road statue as well. This was less structured. It had two chairpersons and it was a facilitated discussion debate were open up to the entire university. Both of these represent the uh, almost like the arch typical or the pinnacle of like public sphere debate in both universities. Right. So I thought it would quite it'd be like a really nice proxy for the university's public sphere. And so when I looked at these debates, I analyzed, you know, through kind of thematic and content coding, um, a narrative analysis. And I picked out kind of three narratives that came out that really elicited, like elicited these, the differences between the two. And the first was, you know, how people expressed academic freedom. Um, the other one was the notions of decolonial action and reclamation in particular. And the third one is around decolonial thought and ac as academic freedom, right? And both debates approach this very, very differently, right? At the University of Oxford, for the first debate around kind of conscientizing, the entire debate focused around both sides trying to conscientize the speakers to their form of knowledge, right? This argumentation of, I will give you my arguments, you give me your arguments, and then we'll find a middle ground of some sort. But it works within the broader logic of the university. And the debate for narrative two maintained like its general adherence to like the rules of the university. It didn't choose to like disrupt in any particular way. It functioned with the, as a sub public of the university according to the rules about how the university debates, right? And when it came to decolonial thought, again, similar to the first thing, it was all about all views that are pushed have equal merit in this discussion, right? No one view is better than the other. You just view them on the merit of the argument that's being made. And this was in stark contrast to the University of Cape Town, where for narrative one, around this kind of notion of conscientization, it was, we can't have a conversation of conscientization as so long as that statue is there, <laughs> right? Because it, it, it imposes that tyrannical kind of view of Eurocentric knowledge systems, that you're trying to shoehorn our experiences into a university, but the structure of the university doesn't allow that, so we're not going to participate in that exercise. And that led to activities that sought to, so if you look at narrative two, break away from it. So commandeering the platform, right? Uh, taking over the meeting, they, they kicked off the chair and replaced them with with someone else, <laughs> I'll leave it at that, right? 
And, and the students really reiterated this argument that if you use rational, academic, Eurocentric focused debates to decolonization, it often functions inadvertently to silence the experience of those considered the other. It's, a, it's an odd conundrum, but it's one the students were kind of acutely aware of, and a lot of this was kind of seen during the debates. And so I'm going to skip over this, but I'm happy to share my slides. What, what you see is that there's this need to think differently and, and I think it's important for this discussion between when we talk about decolonization within the university, are we talking about decolonial thought or are we talking about decolonial action, right? And what's our focus in this discussion? Is it simply to create increased individual autonomy for me to be able to read and study whatever I want to study? Or is it engaging in combating against the external tyranny of Eurocentric knowledge systems? Because tyranny, you can't, have a nice chat with tyranny you know what i mean <laughs> you can't you can't do that right and the strategies that you take and there's no better either or right i think you can do both i think it's quite interesting but are you engaging in strategies and tactics that are focused on conscientization and the creation of new sub publics or are you engaging in actions that focus on the immediate reconfiguration and reclamation through the creation of counter publics and i thought it would be interesting to kind of pose these questions within this space, um, because I think a discussion about the archive and the collective more often than not seems to kind of fall into the argument of decolonial thought rather than action. Um, and it would be curious to know like what decolonial action would look like in the university space. And I'll end off there. So I went two minutes over and I apologize for that. Uh Thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Shikani. I think because of time limits, um, I'm going to give over to the next person, then we can do the questions at the end. Um, I can just say from my side, I, I would like to know if you think the library is moving in the right direction, at least we are not with moving with tyranny. I think we are moving more in, in the thought direction and um, try to accommodate all the different views of the different students. But um, I'm giving over to uh, Mr. Madiba. Thanks, Nundi. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Hulda, and also to, to Dr. Maybe for a minute, I don't know, Dr., if you can be able to address what the, uh, Hulda was uh, raising. In terms yeah. of moving in the direction, are we in the moving in the right direction? Yeah, I mean, I'll be quite brief about it. it it's I, I really want to emphasize this. It's not to disparage anyone's work. I think universities in South Africa are fundamentally moving in the right direction. It, it's hard to explain, but if you were in universities before 2015 versus post 2015, it's chalk and cheese. <laughs> like the experiences, the approaches, the discussions around decolonization are vastly different. I think libraries in particular, because they function as a wing of the university, as a process of the university, as an institution within the university, they naturally fall within the liberal academic framework, which is decolonial thought, the creation of subpublics. Embasing, embarking upon decolonial thought is not a bad thing. It's a brilliant thing. It's something everyone needs to do, and I think all the universities should be doing it. The question is just about when you're confronted with decolonial action, what do you do? And I think that's just an interesting question to pose. Thanks, thanks, Doc. Uh, if, uh, you, Fatisha, I'm not sure if you don't mind, you can share the, your presentation. Uh, Mundi, I just want to ask uh, Fatisha to uh, uh, close the camera, please. Okay. Fatisha, please. Thank you. Um, hand, oh, thanks, Hulda. Can I hand over now to um, a colleague, uh, uh, Kejo, for session uh, number three. Kejo, are you on the line? I see Prof is, uh, is on the line. Uh, Kejo, 
I'm here. Oh, okay. I'm heading over to you. Thanks. Thank you very much, colleagues. Um, our session, we are now on session three. And um, I have three um, speakers for this session. And I would like to introduce our first um, a speaker, who is Professor Dennis Ochola. I hope I'm pronouncing your surname properly, Prof. And before we carry on, I just want to welcome those who came on board and just to keep your mics muted, please. And then our question and answer session will be at the end of the, the session. And but you are welcome to use the chat chat um, bar to pose your conversations and, and questions. And I would like to introduce Professor Dennis Ochalla. Uh, Prof's uh, uh, bio is very, very um, rich, so I try to summarize the highlights, Prof. I hope I'm not doing injustice to it, but I try to capture everything. Uh, Prof uh, Ochala is a distinguished scholar and research fellow at the University of Zululand with a notable career in library and information science. His academic journey includes roles um, at MOI University, the University of Botswana, and the University of Zululand, where he served as a professor, senior professor, and he and held various leadership positions. His research focuses on information seeking, indigenous knowledge systems, ICT for development and data science. As editor in, uh, in chief, also he was uh, ed is an editor in chief in uh, in prominent journals. He is a recipient of multiple research awards. Professor Ochala has significantly contributed to decolonizing information practices. His work aligns with the symposium theme by promoting integration of indigenous knowledge into academic and information systems. Thank you, Prof. You are welcome, and I will hand over to you. Thank you very much, um, organizers of this uh, important symposium for uh, inviting me to the event. Uh, I'm going to talk about decolonizing higher education in Africa. Uh, implications and uh, possibilities for university libraries. Uh, the talk is based on, um, and I'll cover those uh, three uh, areas, give some background and uh, the role of academic libraries, and then probably I'll do some conclusions. Now, the talk I'm going to hold today is uh, based on uh, an invitation I got from uh, college and research libraries a few years ago to talk about decolonizing higher education in Africa. Uh, in which I produced uh, an article that uh, is in the public domain and uh, is available for you to read. Uh, it's on open access and you can read it. So what I'm going to talk about is going to be informed by this, uh, is going to be based like, actually on this on this paper. Uh, I also have got some, um, I'll also uh, uh, dig into my um, knowledge on uh, indigenous knowledge. Uh, where we recently also produced uh, uh, a chapters in a, in a book called Problematizing Local Indigenous Community Research. And I had a chapter there on indigenous knowledge, education in library and information studies or science in Africa, which was also coming as, uh, from the complexity of understanding decolonization and the indigenization of uh, higher education or research in the higher education institutions. So uh, I I've done some little bit more work there, which I've shared with you in the in the citations. Um, uh, we uh, argue that uh, the colonization of education should be viewed uh, as an emancipatory for transformative education that is uh, anchored by critical theory, critical theory of education, dependency theory, and apicology epistemology. We also recently talk about Afrocentrism, uh, which was uh, mooted by Asante some years ago. Now, what the two, the, the, the four theoretical uh, uh, approaches are linked uh, by 
uh, emancipation, transformation, liberation, empowerment, and social justice that was also mentioned earlier by the keynote speakers, an important part of uh, this uh, conversation. And they are largely rooted in the neo-Marxist uh, radical paradigms, which constitute the radical lenses for analyzing uh, decolonization of education and uh, the role of academic library in this case. Uh, on the left-hand side, I try to explain what, to give you a brief uh, um, understanding of what you mean by those uh, theories. Like, uh, for instance, critical theory of education is about democratizing and reconstructing education to meet the challenges of global uh, technological society. Uh, the dependency theory major concern is with the impact of imperialism and colonialism, and that ecology seeks to restress the evolution of knowledge uh, from its origin to the present time. Um, we, there is a tendency to neglect, uh, there is, uh, what I'm trying to argue with is that uh, research on decolonization uh, has got a lot of uh, different type of epistemological, pedagogical, theoretical, and practical challenges. These are challenges, uh, I summarize sometimes back, that there is a tendency to neglect national in favor of international collaboration and to use colonial langu languages that perpetuate the bond with our colonists at the expense of developing and using our teachers languages. We tend to revel in Western or Eurocentric epistemology and pedagogy rather than developing our own driven by participatory research, teaching, and learning with communities. We seem reluctant to replace or harmonize modern values with traditional knowledge, easily falling into the trap of dependency instead of exchange and engaging in rhetoric and in action, the expense of action. And I think there's a lot of rhetoric that has been going on around decolonization, imperialism, new colonialism uh, since uh, before and after uh, African countries received their independence. And this rhetoric has been going on until today with very little action, which is uh, which has been very, very surprising. And th this brings me to quote what Leopold Xingo once said of African Magnamid Day, 1960, as many countries gained independence from colonialists. He argued that uh, the African does not assimilate, he is assimilated, he lives a common life with the other, he lives in symbiosis. Uh, this is quite derogatory and was written some years back and it seems to some extent to prevail uh, even as we talk. Now, what is the role of the, of the library in all this? And what are the implications? Um, I do see that um, libraries are poised to respond to the colonization of higher education in many ways, mostly in the area of access and success of their collection. And I've tried to identify some of the enablers here for that particular uh, for intervention. Uh, and the most important part that we talked about several times is collection development or uh, local collection. For instance, uh, uh, institutional repositories, indigenous knowledge, for instance, uh, we have some kind of special collection or rare collections that we have in our libraries. And, and many more, and which I'm going to highlight a little bit later on as we, as we go along. Uh, the other one is information services, uh, anytime. Of course, it must be in a, right, in a variety, anytime, everywhere, what we call, what we call 20, uh, 24 by 7. Uh, by taking cognizance of the fourth industrial revolution technologies, or uh, it must be future oriented. Uh, information and digital literacy has uh, been talked about several times. Uh, is becoming more crucial because uh, we have to ensure that uh, the users are competent enough to use uh, uh, the, those resources that we, we provide. And uh, one thing, another area that has been of great interest is publicity and promotion of, this, of uh, library services. Uh, at what the web presence of, uh, of, of uh, university libraries, for instance, all the social media presence of the university libraries. Um, again, when you go to several university library websites, you'll see that they're not, uh, they're not the same. Some are, uh, are fairly developed and some are not as well developed. And uh, that is the area where a promotion publicity of uh, 
uh, uh, the, uh, of the idea of um, decolonization and indigenization can always occur. Um, then the research and publication. Uh, there, there's a concept of libraries published that was mooted by the University of uh, University of Cape Town. Uh, it's still going on there. I don't know how far it has spread to other universities. And that is another platform where we can, to a large extent, um, develop what we call um, our own uh, uh, local collection. I think the issue of local collection will be coming several times. Uh, we, we, as people, somebody who has been academic for, for a number of years, we also need metrics, uh, metrics of usage, of uh, access, uh, of interaction with that, uh, with the that the literature or the collection that we have, the libraries, that matrix uh, should be provided by libraries on a more regular basis. The platform like uh, uh, when we're discussing uh, their participation in institutional policy and in decision making of the institution. For instance, uh, we university librarians, I would say directors of lab libraries or executive directors of libraries, I always had the privilege to, not privilege, but uh, they are to, to be in the top management positions where they sit in uh, committees within universities where policy are made on different uh, issues, including uh, on uh, uh, on what they call uh, on decolonization, um, more particularly issues related to curriculum development, where, as you know, a university library is uh, collection is very much determined by the curriculum of the university. And if decolonization issues do not emerge or come strongly at that level, and uh, then it is very difficult for you, for the university library, to, to implement them uh, properly. So that's an area that is, uh, I feel, is quite critical. Now, access refers to enabling environment with resources, services, and literacy that makes access to the library resources anytime, and anywhere, and everywhere possible. And uh, this, uh, as we mentioned, enables, enables the library users to access the information resources without any cognitive, physical, and psychological barriers. Uh, this is a very important thing, and I think if you look at the enabling factors that I mentioned here, it comes under the digital or information literacy campaign that the libraries do, as I know, on a very regular basis. Um, another important thing is uh, in, in institutional repositories, uh, we, we didn't seem to talk about it in the previous uh, conversation. Uh, I think uh, institutional repositories are a critical gateway to decolonization of library collection. Uh, there are some data on uh, how well South Africa is, and Africa is, I think, for 401 percent of uh, all uh, international well, so global repositories were coming from Africa. Africa's contribution obviously, obviously is insignificant. But still, if I look at it from by looking at the data for the last 10 or 20 years, this is a significant improvement uh, in the number of institutional repositories that are there in Africa. Now, South African libraries have been doing very well in terms of developing the, the institutional repositories. And uh, um, I, on the, on the, on, I'm just trying to, this is information that's not new. Uh, don't bother about the data, but just to look at the variety of content that can be found in, in institutional repositories. And think so far, in South Africa, University of Pretoria is leading in Africa and has got best practice that um, other universities within the country can always emulate or at least uh, 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 develop partnership. So that one is uh, there. Now, another document which is uh, very interesting is uh, the Protection, Promotion, Development of Indigenous Knowledge uh, Act that was uh, promulgated by the government in 2019. Um, for a long time, we were uh, relying on the the policy document that was uh, developed in 2004. <clears throat> and now, if, again, again, here you see the library comes in. I've just uh, shared it in red. For instance, to provide for access and condition of access to knowledge of indigenous communities. And if you look at B downstairs, down, not downstairs, down, promote public awareness and understanding of indigenous knowledge for the wider application and development and provide for registration, cataloging, documentation, recording of indigenous knowledge held by indigenous communities. Now you'll notice that in this uh, legislation, there are areas where the universities come in and where the libraries come in. And the uh, libraries should uh, pay attention to uh, these kind of uh, uh, policies, which is good that uh, we have a, a national policy, a national legislation on, on, on ICARE, which, which actually fits into decolonization. Some document that I think 
we need to be aware of and uh, see how the library can uh, use it to, to improve its um, uh, decolonization agenda. Uh, then, um, libraries should, should be involved in research. Um, recently, I had um, a research on strategies for documenting and disseminating digital knowledge at the, at the South African universities, where one of the uh, my students participated and got a master's degree. I, the embassy says that this is a person from the library and uh, uh, fo focus on this particular aspect of research. And so we libraries will be involved in research and the librarians can actually take uh, an active role in uh, identifying and uh, conducting research in areas that uh, are important for the colonization, like for instance, the digital solar system that was done by this uh, uh, this student or a colleague of, colleague of mine who, uh, whose work is the also the public domain. I've just given you an example of the paper. You can always look at it at your own time and be able to read and see uh, where where we can come in. Uh, now, then, the, the role of library services uh, is very interesting to see uh, how much uh, uh, what libraries can do on already doing. Uh, this is based on um, another paper that we wrote recently on the readiness of academic libraries to the third or fourth industrial revolution. And uh, we identified several areas uh, where the libraries participate. Uh, you see, once you have that uh, knowledge, you have to deliver it to, to, to somebody, to the users, or we have to provide services. And these are lists of services. These lists of services do not have, have can be used. They're already being used in some libraries. You notice, I mean, library you're really using, uh, uh, using them uh, or providing them. And I think uh, uh, the like robotics library as a publisher, user experiences, social media, can list them, ask a librarian, those things are already there. Or off campus uh, access, or Wi Fi, or 24 by 7 access to libraries already in place. So we have these things already in place and they can be used effectively to disseminate. Um, uh, indigenous knowledge um, information to to the wider community. Uh, uh, there, are, you are, there are libraries doing well in these particular areas. Uh, this is not only targeting uh, 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 what we call uh, decolonized literature, but uh, this is uh, services that are being provided as at large. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, that capability is there at the libraries. The services are there at the libraries and they can be used effectively to, to, to provide services to the users relating, relating to, to uh, uh, indigenous knowledge and, uh, and uh, decolonized uh, literature. And uh, universal literature, you can see here, in this uh, research done in 2020, uh, was coming. I mean, these figures are, you know, are like, they're not like 100%, but um, they give some idea on how uh, the libraries are provide these services. Uh, this document also in public domain can be accessed. And uh, then also uh, we came to the conclusion that uh, academic, library, academic library of the future would uh, we, we are calling academic library 2440 uh, will have uh, some smart technologies. Uh, these, these components that are put here are, are used to are necessary for the whole library functioning, but they will make they will make the, the dissemination of uh, indigenous knowledge even more uh, more effective. These uh, factors are also there. You can always be able to access them. I think I don't have a lot of time for that, so I'll also run to, to my conclusions. Uh, I think we should acknowledge the understand the paradox of colonialism, colonialism decolonization, and uh, globalization within critical dependency and ecology theories alongside the reality that should shape the response by academic libraries to the complexity complexity of uh, decolonization and digitization of uh, information access and services. I think the, the coloniality and decolonization is complex. I think from the conversion you've had since the beginning of the presentation, you've noticed that it's not something that you just handle that way. It's been going on for years at a rhetoric level and uh, not so much at action level. Because of the complexities involved, we are becoming more globalized, and the more we become globalized, the more we lose track of decolonization. Uh, the process and challenges of decolonization and digitization can be accommodated within the existing and evolving library, uh, library academic and services framework. 
but more so when supported by policy, research, community engagement, and teaching and learning agenda of the affiliate or corresponding higher education institution. This is possible and desirable. Uh, third, I'm putting that uh, library agenda for decolonizing collections will focus on enabling access and success using its information resources. This will require participation in the development of relevant policies. For instance, collection development policies, open access policies, institutional, institutional repository policies, regional knowledge policies, teaching and learning, research, and uh, community engagement. And we also need structures, e.g. management or units, management or responsible, responsible persons within the libraries to, to spearhead or coordinate these activities. It will require facilities, uh, which we can use. We have them in our libraries, as well as South Africa, know. Processes, uh, stakeholders and partnerships, as mentioned here, is very important to need, to need collaborators and partners. Uh, we need awareness, planning, marketing and publicity, uh, visibility, we need competency and skills development for those who are in the library, and we also need research, e.g. metrics will be very helpful. Uh, what is interesting that uh, we need to identify and learn from best practice locally. There's already best practice locally, I've mentioned a few examples, and globally, uh, I think uh, from the speakers before you also realize, you realize that there are some countries already doing very well in, uh, in decolonization, and uh, we need to uh, uh, um, learn from them, or at least um, it may need sometimes even getting a sabbatical and going to work, staff exchange, going to work with some of those libraries that we identify within the country or outside the country where they already best practice and see how we can be able to put them home. But within the country, there are some in, uh, libraries, institutions that are doing fairly, fairly, fairly good in that direction. Um, I think I, I think I should be ending there. I've got some recent thoughts uh, on this uh, uh, on, on, on indigenization and uh, decolonization which I I'll, uh, can be accessed. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks. You're muted. Uh, it Apologies. <laughs> it's fine. It's OK. <laughs> it's thank fine. you, Prof. <laughs> Technology. Um, thank you for that insightful presentation. As I was um, mentioning earlier, we will have questions at the end. Uh, I saw a hand there. I don't know. On the, um, and there's nothing yet on the chat. We'll do that at the end. Oh, I see there is something. Um, I, what I wanted to say, Prof, thank you. I, I hear you mentioned some something that uh, you said that if um, higher education libraries, because they are in a position of um, of you know uh, bringing change in the curriculum or influence in the curriculum in terms of decolonization. If they don't, it will be unfortunate. So um, it's something for us to think about. Thank you very much. And uh, we will, um, as you stay on, we will pose the questions at the end. And then um, my next speaker is Professor Nampombe Sarombe. Um, an interesting fact about uh, Prof Sarombe, we know each other. We work together in the province of of Northwest, and I used to call her Nams. I don't know if she still calls herself Nams. <laughs> yes, um, I do. I, <laughs> I was very excited when I saw your name there. Um, uh, just a brief um, uh, bio of Prof Nams. Uh, she is a professor in the Department of Information Science at the University of South Africa with over 15 years of experience teaching library and information science courses, uh, as a uh, C2 NRF rated researcher. Her research covers uh, public programming of archives, records management, archival advocacy, information for development and decolonizing archives. Besides teaching, 
research and supervising postgraduate students. She co-chairs the expert group of research services and outreach, which is EXO, at the International Council on Archives, um, contributing to global discourse in her field. Uh, Prof. Rombe has presented and published widely on this in, on both topics, both locally and on these topics, both locally and internationally. And she will be talking about decolonizing higher education curricula in South Africa, factoring in archives through public programming initiatives. Over to you, Prof. Thank you very much, uh, Madam. Yes, Madam Kerogo used to be my boss. <laughs> it's so nice to see you. And thank you very much for the warm welcome today um, to this symposia. And um, I've learned so much already, starting from the morning up to this very minute when we just uh, got off with Professor Ochola. And I think um, I'm very grateful that I got the opportunity to speak about something slightly different, but we all deal with information here. And this is with regard to archives, which sometimes remain um, forgotten, yet are very, very important when it comes to um, matters such as decolonization and transformation. And, and the paper that I'm, or the discussion that I'm going to have today is based on a paper that I wrote in 2018 with the same title. And this was when we were really excited seeing what was happening around us. And I just had to reflect and, and investigate and see how do archives feature in all of this? What is happening? What research is available? What are we going to do? And what I'm going to discuss today is some of the findings and um, some of the projects that we are currently involved in, in trying to contribute to this um, great cause. Um, that is the outline of my, my talk today. I'll just give the concern, speak about decolonizing curricula and um, how archives can make a difference and the projects that we are involved in as a way of um, social investment or community engagement as we try to make a difference in the higher education curriculum and even speaking a little bit about the basic, uh, basic education because it all starts there and they come to us. And it would be great if they could be prepared at the level of basic education. And when they come to university, they are ready to tackle and deal with that, which we are already involved in and contribute towards that um, cause as well. So as an introduction, I think we have heard a lot about the fees must fall um, movement and what it led to. And I'm very grateful that we had student voices included here today and the keynote speaker also touched on this. And you will agree with me that transformation and decolonization has been an essential part of the South African education system before and after the 1990s. If we look at the Council on Higher Education reports starting back then up to now, um, it, they always give us kind of an update of what is going on in the higher education curricula and the changes that are required, where are we lagging behind, what do we still have to do? And we see some significant change with regard to um, access to higher education and all that. But again, when you go on the other side, you, you read of dropout rates. Um, you heard one of the concerns of um, the fees must fall movement was funding, and we still still hear those debates and what is going on. But the discussion for me today is really around the transformation of the curriculum. And if we look at the CHA reports, we see that um, we are not there yet. We are not there yet. And we really need to continue finding ways of working towards that. So the fees must fall student movement brought about renewed interest in the necessity to transform um, and decolonize higher education. And this, we've already heard an overview of this happening between 2015 and 2016. Something else that was happening on the other side, which I don't know if all of you are aware of, was concerned that South African youth did not fully understand the history of the country and what it went through and what is, and relating that with what is happening now. And with that, we see that the Department of Basic Education decided that history should be 
a compulsory subject in high schools. And in 2018, the minister then um, tasked a task team to, to investigate how could history be included in the curriculum as far back as high school. I think it was at standard 10, grade 10 making it compulsory so that it can help South African youth have a better understanding of what the country has been through and what is it that still needs to be done. And, and this brought about the urgency to decolonize the curriculum at tertiary institutions as well at school level. Because when you speak of a history curriculum, what is in that curriculum? Is it representative? Is it inclusive? And we're, there were also discussions about the, the teachers who have to teach that particular module. You can even speak of the lecturers who are supposed to prepare to, to transform the curricula. It was It is not an easy task. There is a lot that had to go into it and we're still continuing to improve ourselves in that regard. Academics are under pressure to contribute to change, but it is also crucial to also recognize the pivotal role of information professionals. And I think that is the reason why we have gathered today to look at how academic libraries and other information institutions can make a difference. And now we have been speaking a lot about the librarians and the academic libraries. And I know that within our academic libraries, we have special collections. We also have um, archival archives. For instance, at my institution at UNISA, we have an archives. And um, what role do they play or do archives play when it comes to teaching, um, learning and research? What is our role in this process? And these are discussions that we need to have and reflections that we need to think of. And I really commend UFS Library Service for having this discussion today. Um, so I've been involved in some research with some of my colleagues. As I said, it started way back in 2018, looking at um, what kind of role does ARCAS play in this debate around transformation and decolonization. And if you... I looked at this and I looked at the literature and all that was going on at the moment, at that time, and it seemed that it was vague. It wasn't really clear on what is it, what is it that they are going, their archives are responsible for when it comes to decolonizing higher education. Um, further on, um, at our university, I think we are the only university in the African continent that offers a Bachelor of Arts in Archives and Records Management. And um, it's a fairly new program. It was launched, I think, in 2019. And myself and my colleague, Professor Mwepe, in 2021, um, looked at the curriculum that we had developed for this very new degree program and said, have we met the standards of Africanization and decolonization and transformation that we are discussing about in this institution? And after um, looking at the content and having discussions with colleagues and colleagues, we came to the realization that there is still a lot more that we need to do to fully come to a point where we can say, indeed, the curriculum is inclusive of um, African ways of knowing and languages and other issues. Further on in this year, myself and my colleague, Professor Shelna Kelly, um, this is a study we did in over the past few years, but it was published this year. We looking at the debate of history in the curriculum of high school students and it being a compulsory module. And we really wanted to find out the involvement of archivists. These are public archives. We looked at the we we um, had interviews with the provincial archivists as well as the archivists at the National Archives and Records Service of South Africa, and and tried to investigate what kind of role were they involved in this process? Did they contribute anything with regard to the the this initiative that the Department of Basic of Education was getting involved in. And sadly, they reported that they were not consulted. And as the task team was going from province to province and different places, they were did not participate in that discussion. And they also did not send any submissions to influence that process. So that is really a concern to say, we do claim that archives are important. They are Yet, archivists and the archives were not are not really visible in these processes, and that was a concern to me and my colleagues. So, speaking of decolonizing curricula, what does it really mean? Um, I'd like to refer to Glover Gasheni, 2017, where he simply puts it as a process of 
rehumanizing curriculum. And simply put, he says, this is a way of reintroducing the African human identity that was largely ignored by colonialism. And what would this involve? This would involve reviewing our disciplines and content. We could even, in, in this map, we would even have to review what is in our academic library collections. And this is something that we have been talking about all morning. Changing the consciousness of acknowledging African ways of knowing. Um, and looking at issues such as language, indigenous knowledge systems, and many other things that were highlighted by Professor Ochola and, and others today. So the whole point is that after 1994, higher education was expected to play a critical role in the reconceptualization of human rights, empowerment, and other social related configurations eroded by colonialism and apartheid, but sadly, Higher education did not turn out to be the champion it was supposed to be. And hence, we had such a movement as Fees Must Fall in 2015 and 2016, where students had to remind us that there is something that needs to change. So the concern here is that um, content and ways of teaching exclude indigenous knowledge, indigenous languages, uh, and inclusive history, culture, and heritage. Obviously, things have changed since 2016. We are slowly getting there, but there is still a lot of work that needs to be done. An inclusive curriculum will acknowledge and meet the needs of all South African communities. It is crucial to understand the history of South Africa from diverse cultural and heritage perspectives. And as I said earlier, archives are records of enduring value. They serve as memory aids that help us to learn about the past, understand the present, and decide our future. I was really um, impressed when the uh, Prof, we seem to be losing you a little bit in and out on the mic. Okay, can you still, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. All right, thank you for that. Um, so I'll just repeat that point to say um, archives are records of enduring value and they serve as memory aids and they help us to learn about the past, understand the present and decide all our future, which is important in uh, the decolonization of higher education and the transformation of curriculum. So it involves the interrogation of history, but how do we interrogate history if we do not understand the value of archives and engage with the archives in this process? Um, so it is important to understand the history of the country. It is important to understand the history of the South African education landscape, looking at Education under apartheid, what did what happened? Education post-1994 and education post-2015 after the fees must fall movement. And all these processes um, are very important with regards to um, archives. And I as I said earlier, it was good to hear from the student leader, former student leader, speaking of the importance of the archiving process because. All this helps us in discovering um, truths, perspectives, and understanding what that which needs to be ch to change. So factoring now public archives in South Africa, we have a national archive service as well as provincial archives. We would have loved to see that we also have community archives, which have heritage, cultural and identity issues or artifacts, records, memories of local communities. But in South Africa, we are not there yet. We also have legislation. We have the Constitution, the National Archives Act and other acts which speak of the importance of information in education and the importance of people having access to that information. And if you look at the Archives Acts at national and provincial level, it speaks of the necessity of collecting memories and preserving them for posterity and to promote access to this information. 
But there are several challenges that archival institutions, even if you look at some private archives, are facing. And this is the fact that there are missing accounts in these collections. We do not know that the, those in power at the time decided what would be recorded, what would be kept, what would be preserved. Um, we also know that after 1994, there were many new establishments which were put in place, but they do not have the collections or the archival holdings yet. Archives are also complaining of dwindling resources, and there is still a shortage of staff, a shortage of expertise, and some outdated infrastructure. Uh, when it comes to contributions to curriculum, um, puzzle pieces, I mean, archives are puzzle pieces of memory, so they should not be disregarded because to contribute for you to arrive at that bigger picture of the full picture of what truly happened and what needs to change, what is it that I do not know that is important. It is important that you have these different fragments and you put it together and solve a particular problem or query or issue. And that is why I put truth with those quotation marks to say, knowing that there is not one single truth, everyone arrives at that depending on the access, on the information that you or me had access to. Perceptions, lived experiences, all these things matter, particularly when it comes to decolonization of curricula. Um, you might argue, can we decolonize the curriculum with colonized archives? Is it doable? Well, indeed, it is true that there are historical biases of colonialism and apartheid in the archives. And we do know that in South Africa, ever since 1994, there have been uh, measures in place to transform the archives, which are slowly ongoing. Um, but we need to understand this bias. And I think um, universities and academic libraries have the expertise that will help us to investigate these biases, research about them and record them and, and document how they contribute to how things were and what is it that needs to be known and what was excluded. And as I say here, that this can help us to understand the thinking behind certain actions, affirm what was portrayed negatively, such as African beliefs, languages, ownership of land, and many other issues, and correct wrongs where possible. And this could lead to action transformation. For instance, if we go and try to fill gaps through oral history projects and many other measures, um, it could lead to closing gaps and generation of new knowledge, which is necessary in our society. Speaking of public programming and advocacy initiatives, this is all about um, marketing, promoting archives. And advocacy is reaching out to those um, influential bodies, influential governing authorities to help um, archives actually contribute to this process in terms of resources, staffing, and otherwise. Um, archives are widely unknown, are not widely known in, or used in South Africa. And the decolonization drive at higher education and school levels is an opportunity for archivists to raise awareness about archives. Currently, they still kind of remain vague in this entire process. Um, Public programming and, and advocacy actually, uh, what it does is to make, uh, to be intentional about use and actively encourage people or those people such as academia in this case, students, um, the public to engage with the archives and teach them what is it, why are they important, what can they con contribute to societal development and the likes. So knowledge of information needs in academia and linking these needs with archival content is very, very important. Archivists should not wait to be called upon, but rather should um, proactively insert themselves into the process, demonstrating the value of archives and their expertise. Kind of like what UFS Library Service is doing now, is to be actively present and to see what is it that they can contribute, what is it that we need to learn so that we can improve our practices. So how can archivists contribute towards decolonization, the decolonization process in higher education and schools? First of all, it is very important to have a understanding of decolonization. It can be a complicated topic, but it is something that we need to investigate. It is something that we need to learn. Um, we need to investigate the needs of academia, students, teachers, and learners so that we know how is it that we can support them. Contextualize these 
promotion campaigns and outreach and advocacy programs so that you can meet these people at their point of need. Collaboration becomes very, very important. Uh, I was just talking about the public archival institutions. They, they often complain of lack of resources, but I do know that academic libraries like yourselves and others, imagine if you could be involved in a community engaged project or engaged scholarship project and partner with these bodies. What is it that you could achieve together in making a difference in South Africa? Um, other initiatives that could be uh, could come about would be closing gaps, raising awareness about brainstorm, networking about best practices, webinars like this, seminars, conference, and so on. And all that can make a difference. I work at the University of South Africa, as you know, we just, the institution turned 150 years last year, and it's a comprehensive university with eight faculties, 370,000 students, mode of teaching is open distance learning, and our department is one of the 19 departments in the College of Information Science and of Human Sciences. And we are actively encouraged to engage in community projects, which will lead to transformation. And I just wanted to report on two projects that we are involved in, which we contribute towards um, decolonizing HEIs and, and at community level. One of them is led by Professor Patrick Ngulube, and this one looks at uh, taking archives to the people, and it is focused on empowering archivists. As we said, archivists have been shying away, remaining in the dim light, not actively uh, promoting and and speaking out there what the value of archives is and what the expertise they have to make a change in these various processes going on around them. So we empower them through training. We have others doing PhDs, masters, we go on projects countrywide and help them to market um, these archival services. And this has led to improved project management, um, projects, um, research outputs, workshops, and many, many other um, successes. The second project is a project that I lead. I lead, this is a provincial project. It's happening in Gauteng and it started in 2020. And I started off this project with a National Research Foundation grant. And this is a project on building inclusive archives at the Gauteng Provincial Archives. This is one of the latest archival institutions to be built in the country. Beautiful uh, building, everything, state of the art, but it is empty. It does not have collections on the local communities of Gauteng. So myself and my colleagues, we embarked on a project and we started off with trying to build a sports heritage collection, knowing that sports is something that um, communities, everyone in the community can relate to sports. And we were aiming at developing on an unsung sporting heroes and sheroes collection at the Gauteng Provincial Archives. And it is a, a project that uses participatory action research and oral history research. It involved training or it's still, cause it's still ongoing. We train archivists, we have masters and PhD students looking at particular sporting codes. And we have a collection right now of over 80 um, sporting accounts from unsung sports women and sports men, which are about people from Gauteng. The results of this project have led to a sports heritage collection. Um, it is a project that really focuses on oral history techniques, so oral history skills with regards to the community and the archivists. We have developed training content, which we have posted for free on the UNISA Institutional Repository for archivists around the country to use and beyond. Um, curriculum development, the content from this project is used in our third year modules in this Bachelor of Arts and Archives program. We have postgraduate research, completed master's and almost finished PhD and other research inputs. So by academics, students, the archives. So it is a collective effort. In conclusion, I just want to say that the wheels of change are turning very slowly, but we should not give up and remain committed to the cause. Archival holdings and collections, despite their biases, are useful sources of information. And I do know that 
uh, institutions of higher learning have the expertise to tackle such issues and to make this uh, readily available. Um, information professionals such as you in the library, when we speak of context such as decolonization and transformation, it can be very complicated, but you are the experts who can package this information in such a way that others can understand. Um, we institutions have the resources and the expertise to investigate such biases. South African public archivists and private archivists, if willing, should be assertive and strive to participate in these decolonization uh, initiatives. And lastly, networking is crucial, collaboration. Let's tap into our information related expertise and see what is it that we can do in this decolonization process and an inclusive collection to support an inclusive education. Thank you, Prof. Um, I just want to thank you so much. As Monday has said earlier, can you please give a, a round of applause? Uh, sometimes these things we forget <laughs> because we're listening intensely. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, it was quite insightful and the practical ideas that you also brought forward. Um, so actually, in a nutshell, I, archive should be actually at the forefront of decolonization. However, it is a bit questionable at the moment. Like you say, the biases must be addressed, you know, the wrongs must be uh, corrected. So it's something really to, to chew on, but um, we, are, we are getting there. I hope in the, in the discussion and in questions, uh, there will be... Um, something around us to to discuss thank you so much for for gracing us with your presence and you yes much. i didn't want to i was humble they not to mention that uh, I, I used to be your boss but you said it <laughs> thank you um going to our next speaker um colleagues i would like to welcome kevin wilson uh kevin are you there yeah, I'm Thank here. you very nice, much. Nice to meet you. Uh, welcome. Um, so uh, I, I'm just going to read your, your bio. Thank you for mm -hmm. gracing us with your presence. Uh, Kevin Wilson is um, the library's academic liaison and collection development manager at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Um, he oversees collections in of for economics and uh, uh, at the language the language center mathematics and statistics. Since joining in 2017, he has focused on making library uh, collection more diverse and inclusive. He has presented his work at conferences and contributed a a, a chapter to the 2021 book called narrative expansions, interpreting decolonization in academic libraries. It is available in their um, LSE, London School of Economics um, repository, if you want to go and have a look at it. So um, Kevin is going to talk about decolonizing the curricula and research and research library. Over to you, Kevin. Um, do you want me to share my presentation from my yes, side? Yes, please. Thank okay, you so much. Super. Okay, ignore that. Um, can somebody just confirm that they can see the presentation? Should say decolonizing library collections. Oh, yep. Y yes, you can, you can see. Talk. Okay, super. Okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> So thanks for inviting me uh, today. Um, very happy to attend, and hmm? it's great to hear uh, the experience uh, of, of South Africa. Me, uh, oh, sorry. Kevin, sorry for interrupting you. Uh, colleagues, may I please request that you mute your mics so that we'll be able to hear Kevin. Thank you very much. 
Okay, thanks. No, just again, thanks for inviting me, and it's it's really great to hear uh, presentations by the other speakers. Uh, yes, I'm joining you from uh, an unseasonably warm London. It's 30 degrees today. Um, so in this presentation, I will talk about some of the work that we've done uh, at LSE over the last six or seven years. Um, some of the ideas I talk about in this presentation have been discussed uh, elsewhere. So there was a Research Libraries UK uh, Inclusive Collections, Inclusive Libraries event that I participated in in February 2023, which is online. I mean, that's, that will be a much longer version of this presentation. But also, uh, yes, the book that was mentioned, which is uh, Jess Crilly's and Regina Everett's edited volume on narrative expansions. And that talks about <clears throat> various issues related to decolonization in academic libraries. So not just collections, but you know, across the field of librarianship. Um, and I think this is one of the first titles that really uh, kind of tackled this subject. And it takes an international scope as well. So it isn't just focusing on UK libraries, but it does take an international uh, flavor as well. The chapter that I've written, which some of this work, it, some of this presentation is based on, is available in our institutional repository. The link is there, and if the slides are shared, then you can access it from there as well. So in terms of what I'm going to talk about today is um, a bit of history about the LSC and its collections and why kind of the founding principles of the school and the library over 125 years ago still resonate today. I'll talk a bit about some uh, the collection evaluation work we did a few years ago, which identified our collection strengths, but also give, gave us ideas for how to address our collection weaknesses. Talk a bit about some of the quantitative data analysis that we've done of our collections using our library management system, Alma. And then I'll talk a bit about some of the practical recommendations for libraries, some of which we've made stronger progress than others. And that really is the conclusion of the, the book chapter. So some of the ideas that I may not flesh out in, in huge detail, I talk about more uh, in the book chapter. So just in terms of the history of the, the London School of Economics, so we were founded in 1895 by four prominent members of the Fabian Society. So they were a left-wing organization who were one of the founders of the, the British Labour Party, which is one of the two major political parties in the UK. And the LSE was open to encourage original investigation and research into the economic and social sciences. So really we were kind of spearheading the social sciences as a discipline in the UK. And the original prospectus from 1895, it was obviously a much smaller institution then, focused on the nine subjects that you see in the second bullet point. Uh, we are teaching variations on most of those subjects even now. Um, so we've had a really good consistency in the curriculum over the years, and that's allowed us to develop our library collections consistently in alignment with that curricula. Um, LSE's motto is to know the causes of things, uh, and our purpose, uh, our founding purpose is for the betterment of society. And that, that motto and that purpose has kind of underpinned all of our teaching and research activities since. Uh, and the Fabian in particular saw the potential in the social sciences to transform society in the bet for the better. So they were, uh, you know, this was a period in, in kind of late Victorian England where there was no kind of social infrastructure or welfare or safety nets. Uh, and they saw the social sciences as a way of transforming society. This is the original uh, prospectus from 1896. Uh, it's available on our digital library. So these files are, are viewable by anyone, but and you'll have to squint, apologies, to see this, but it shows that the subjects that I showed uh, on here are part of that curriculum. And it showed exactly what was taught, what was on the reading list at the time, what the basis of the lectures were. Um, and as I said, these still form the core part of the LSE curricula now. Uh, we're 26 departments, not nine, um, but things like statistics, economics, geography, history uh, are still very much part of the curriculum here. And then the library was founded one year later um, to support the goals of the institution. So uh, again, you won't be able to read this trust in a huge amount of detail, but what it said is that there was a need for a library to support the serious study of political science and public administration. Uh, because the founders of LSE thought um, basically we were, we were well behind uh, universities in the US and the Western Europe. So the trust deed that was written to found the library a year later uh, really increased the urgency for a library and a library that would support the development of the social sciences in the UK. Uh, and as a starting point for the library, you know, we had no collections and we had to think about how to kind of accelerate the development of those collections uh, really fast. Um, 
so said LSE, LSE library was formed the year after the LSE was founded. And we had really kind of lofty ambitions to be the world's greatest social sciences library. Um, and we have two roles. So we are a working university to support the activities of the London School of Economics in education and research, but we're also a national library for the social sciences. So we receive funding and we have uh, you know, designated and acclaimed collections that are there to support researchers nationally and internationally. Um, so we have that kind of dual role. Um, the collections that we've developed over 120 years, as I said, they, they align with the curriculum uh, and the research activities across the school so that we can support the growth of the social sciences as a discipline, not just within the LSE, but, but nationally and internationally as well. Um, but the way our collections have developed over time has been a, a mixture of design and serendipity. So kind of good luck, good fortune. We were lucky that we were founded by as I said, prominent Fabian, so such as Sydney and Beach, Beatrice Webb, who just had really good connections. Um, so they reached out to people they knew, and because of the generosity of individuals and organizations across the world, our collections developed rap rapidly. And the good thing about being a reasonably young institution is that we have all those kind of archival records of how the institution and how the library developed. So basically, we, we, we have examples of letters of our founders going out to people across the world and just saying, send us stuff. Um, so that good luck of having founders who were well connected was really useful. And that allowed us to develop collections. But at the same time, we've really tried to align things with the with the institution's education and research goals as well. Um, LSE as a social sciences institution means there's a lot of interdisciplinary kind of education and research. Um, so that means that we've, we've kind of got a relatively narrow focus. Um, so that makes it easier as well. Um, if you are interested in a, an overview of the LSE's uh, library's collections, uh, as they've kind of historically progressed since 1895, uh, my predecessor uh, has written a, a short book, which is available in the LSE Institutional Repository, but I can send a link through to that. But that will talk about how our collections have developed over those 125 years. So we were just building these collections for 120 or so years without, without kind of much oversight or without any the steer was to support the education and the research goals of the institution, but there was no kind of quality control over it. Um, so in 2016 to 18, we undertook a collection evaluation and I joined the LSE midway through this project. But what the point was to look at our collections and really review them by significance, quality and value of those collections. The idea is that we would look at how they could support teaching, research and public engagement activities going forward. And what we did, we classified our collections according to a four part criteria, but the, the collection that is really the main, uh, the criteria that, that is the main one to focus on is the flagship. So these are the collection strengths. These are the, the items where we are possibly the only holder in the UK. They're of such uh, kind of research value to people researching in particular disciplines or subjects um, that it is vital that we kind of look after them and as custodians of those collections, we make sure that you know they're accessible and potentially for digitization purposes as well. So we looked at those strengths, but also it would give us ideas about how we might address uh, the weaknesses once we've identified those strengths. So the flagship collections that we, we have, uh, that we identified are really across 19th and 20th century British political and economic history in these specific subjects. So uh, women's equality and rights, LGBT plus equality and rights, peace and internationalism, uh, Britain's complicated relationship with the European Union, uh, the development of left wing uh, thought, poverty and welfare, and in a more broad sense, just the, the history and development of social science in Britain. So now that we know what those collection strengths are, and we obviously build on those, we understand that we now have big gaps in our collections, particularly in terms of a uh, more international uh, kind of uh, view of the social sciences. So subsequent to that, we've done a lot of data work trying to kind of find out more about our collections. Um, and this section here talks about some of the quantitative data analysis that we've done. Um, so we've used our library management system, which is Ex Libris's Alma, but I would imagine that most library systems would allow you to do the things that I'm about to talk about. What we wanted to look at was the, the geographical diversity of our collections. Uh, we're aware that quantitative data 
about your collections only tells you so much. It just gives you headline figures, but at least it's something to build on. So we built a data set of uh, our two main collections, the course collection, which is the teaching collection, and the main collection, which is the broader research collection. <clears throat> and what we did, we wanted to show basically what was the geographical composition of each of those collections. Um, and we've used the UN trade and development uh, criteria or definitions of developed and developing economies. Um, that is not necessarily me endorsing those definitions. And I know that terminology is, you know, such as developed or developing or global north and global south or global majority and global minority are debated and challenged. Um, other measures that we might have used might have been the, the, the IMF World Economic Outlook, which looks at, at uh, advanced economies and emerging and developing economies, even though there isn't necessarily a consensus between any of these measures. For us, it's really just a starting point to get uh, a bit of a sense of where our collections uh, kind of break down. Um, so the headline figures of this, and I'll, I'll show some graphs that, that kind of go into a bit more detail in a second is that almost 98.5% of our course collection. So uh, these are the books that are essential readings on reading lists. These are the ones that comprise what students understand about the curricula that they're being taught. They would be the books or articles that they read the most. 98.5% um, of those are from developed economies and primarily from the UK and the US publishers. Um, it doesn't matter if they're, if they're studying international history or international relations and they're focusing on you know, uh, studies about Latin America. Those books are going to be published in the UK and the US primarily. In the main collection, and you'll see a graph in a minute that, that shows a bit more diversity, but still not massively high, but, but almost 93% of our main collection, which is getting off for about half a million titles, uh, are published in uh, what we would call, what the UN trade and development would call uh, developed economies. So our collections broadly are dominated by titles from the UK, the US and Western Europe. So that would be a range of countries, including the Netherlands, Germany, France, Italy, and so on. In terms of the largest developing economies in our collections, it's, it's India, South Africa, and China. I think India and South Africa, particularly with perhaps kind of one eye on Britain's colonial relationship with those. Um, so what we've done with that, we've, we've uh, in, in Alba, what we've done is developed um, a set of criteria to build a data set. Um, again, I wouldn't expect you to, to really squint in and see this, but what we've done is we've picked out bibliographic data about our collections. We put location filters on so that we can specify which collection that we're looking at, which is the course collection or the main collection. But what we're picking out is the place in publication field in particular is the one that's kind of has the black box around it here. And that is the, that is the field that we will be looking at. That will show us which country it's published in, whether it's the United States, United Kingdom, or anywhere. Um, and this is what kind of the output of the the uh, the job looks like. So it tells us the location code, all the bibliographic data, which is useful for us. But it really is that last that last field, that place of publication that we're looking at. And then what we'll do is use things like pivot tables to kind of build a a kind of pictorial sense of where those collections are. So for instance, this is from the course collection. Uh, this is a report I ran fresh yesterday. Um, and then what we just do is kind of order it in descending scale from where it's published. Um, now some of our catalog records uh, don't have country data in, so I tend to exclude those from the data set. But what you can see here, and you'll see it on the next slide, uh, next slide in a moment, is that our course collection is dominated by the UK and the US, and then it is a huge drop till we get to another country. I do all this in Excel. I am not particularly proficient in Excel. I know how to do pivot tables. Um, so there is nothing here that requires a huge amount of technical expertise, uh, and it's perfectly doable and replicable as long as you have a library management system that allows you to do it. Um, so just in terms of headline figures, in terms of our uh, course collection, as I said, it is dominated by the UK and the US, and then there is a significant drop. And then the countries you see below, this is the top 20 countries in each area. So you will see the Netherlands. I think that just happens that a lot of academic publishers are based in the Netherlands. Um, 
and then you can see countries like India and South Africa and China appear, but otherwise it is primarily uh, dominated by Western Europe, but the numbers each time are very, very small. If we change that to the main collection, you see, I mean, hopefully you can see the difference, at least the, the kind of slope of the graph is a slightly flatter, um, but with the main collection, it is still predominantly uh, dominated by the US and the UK, but other countries in uh, Western Europe are still very prevalent in our collections. So as I said, the main collection is about half a million titles. We've got 50,000 titles from Germany. So one in 10 titles in the, the, the main collection is, is in the German language, or at least published in Germany. But again, the same countries you see across the bottom are primarily Western European countries. And you'll see India, and you'll see, uh, you might be surprised to see a lot of Latin American countries in here. Again, when I talked about you know, the good fortune of having connections and you know, just targeting specific areas. I think there was a period where we made a specific focus on Latin America. Uh, we often don't have large collections of kind of Asia and Africa because we've had an informal agreement with the School of Oriental and African Studies to not necessarily duplicate each other's collections. I'm not sure how that's kind of formalized or codified, um, but that may explain um, why Asian and African countries don't appear so high. Uh, but Latin America was an area that historically, I think maybe in the 60s or 70s, that we, we did try to target. So with the main collection, it looks a bit better, but with both collections, they are still dominated by the UK and US um, and to some extent, Western Europe. And we are teaching you know, a global curricular LSE uh, our history and politics departments uh, are named international history um, and international relations. There isn't much focus on UK history or UK politics. It's very much global. But the resources that we are then asking students to use on those courses are not kind of more local based research. It's all based on uh, you know, major academic publishers in the, uh, in the UK, US and Western Europe. So, if you have a library management system that allows you to um, kind of use fields like these and develop criteria like these, these kind of reports are easily, easily replicable. And once you've kind of got them set, all you do is just kind of change filters. Uh, as I said, it doesn't require too much in a way of Excel skills. Basically, as long as you can create a pivot table, um, you know, you're good to go with that. So just towards the end, so that's that's kind of the basis of what we've done on the uh, quantitative data analysis. But it tells us now that there are some kind of issues that we need to address, particularly in terms of adding books to our collections from African, Asian, and Latin American publishers to a much greater extent. So the last bit here is just some of the ideas that, that I mentioned in the conclusion of, of the book chapter. And it's really thinking about what are the things that libraries can do. Some of these are not particularly like big ideas. Some might be quite quick and simple. Some might be more complex and require time and resources, but there are certainly some quick wins that can be done here. Um, so the first one here is just actively committing to EDI and collection development. So some of the debates about collection development are about things like neutrality and bias and whether neutrality is even like the optimal kind of goal here because does neutrality just kind of reinforce the status quo to some extent? Uh, and does it just reinforce in existing inequalities? So sometimes we probably need to go beyond this and just be more assertive in addressing inequalities in our collection. So some of the things that we've worked, we've done is worked with colleagues in our equity, diversity and inclusion unit. Uh, and we've worked across the university to speak to academic departments and try to align with uh, projects that they're doing locally. But for us, it isn't just about, you know, being that we have collection weaknesses and just shrugging our shoulders and saying there's not much we can do. I think what we have on our collections policy is a more assertive statement to, to addressing some of that. And talking about collections policies, um, collections policies are the strategic kind of guidance and directions for libraries, but they tend to be something that I always think of as you write once every 10 years, stuff it in a metaphorical drawer these days, and you don't look at it until the next 10 years. I think for us, we want our collections policy to be responsive, to be dynamic, and to respond to changing teaching and research needs. Um, so we, our collections policy effectively is live. We update it as and when we need to, um, but we make more assertive 
kind of statements in it towards supporting EDI and particularly to addressing our collections um, inequalities. So we're very kind of open and transparent about the work that we're trying to do, and we want to be held accountable for that. Um, we support staff to diversify their reading lists at LSC. Reviewing curriculum reading lists tends to happen at the bottom up. There is no top down mandate as there might be in some UK institutions, but individual academic staff or de departments will undertake this work themselves. We've looked at how we can partner with academic staff and uh, departments and use our collections and reading list data like you've seen before. So we also have the reading list system Leganto by Ex Libris. And what we can find out from that is the items that are included on reading lists, you know, where are they published as well? Um, so we can provide quantitative data to people who are reviewing their curricula uh, and they can use that as a starting point. Obviously, quantitative data has its limits because you can find out who the author on your reading list is, but you don't know if that author is automatically um, you know, a man or a woman or where they're based. Um, so that requires a bit more kind of uh, getting your hands dirty doing some bit more qualitative analysis on that but certainly we can give them data as a starting point but knowing that the limitations of that data we've looked at how we can seek out uh, new publishers and suppliers so in the UK we tend to uh, acquire materials based on uh, kind of consortia purchasing networks which focuses on using certain suppliers um, who the, themselves in turn focus on the main Western academic uh, publishers. What this does, this squeezes out smaller publishers and major academic publishers in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. What that then does is encourage libraries to then kind of almost do bespoke agreements with individual suppliers out there, which um, can be slightly more time and labor intensive, but these might be things that we just have to accept. Although what I will say is that um, some of the public, some of the suppliers that we use, like Coots, um, are trying to be trying to work more closely um, with international publishers and academic presses. So, for instance, if we kind of go to Coots, uh, which is owned by ProQuest now, they will have ingested catalogue records or uh, information from major academic presses across the world. So we hope that they will be able to provide those books for us, which means that we don't have to really change too many of our practices. Uh, we do have a plan in place to be more assertive in the next year to acquire books uh, from uh, those international academic presses. So I think we've put around £10,000. It's only a small starting point, but these are books that will be actively selected by librarians in our key uh, collection areas, such as kind of economics and political science. Uh, We've worked in collect, uh, collaborative collection development. So we've worked with colleagues who are, who are doing kind of EDI work or decolonizing. There was a decon, there's a decolonizing the LSE um, collective, uh, which brings together researchers and academics and students. And we've worked with them before to, to think about ways that, you know, they might have insights that they can bring to us so that we can think about how we diversify our collections. Um, we've looked at discoverability and addressing bias in our collections. There's, there's, there's a lot anyone could say about you know, bias in library systems or bias in subject headings, which is probably far too much that I can go into today. Um, but also we know about kind of bias in you know, uh, search engine search results and so on. Um, one of the, 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 the issues that I kind of touched upon in the book is uh, in terms of the classification of collections and the bias in those, we use the Library of Congress classification system, uh, which is basically run by Congress in the United States. So there was a big uh, controversy about six or seven years ago when Donald Trump was in president or was president and the Congress was run by the Republican Party, uh, where the term illegal aliens um, was um, something that libraries did not want to use in their subject headings, but then it caused a big political controversy. And there was a really good documentary called Changing the Subject, which was published by Dartmouth College in the US, which kind of explains that situation. But I think one of the things that's frustrating for us in libraries, particularly if we use Library of Congress, is just the whole way that things don't change, the intransigence, um, because it is a politicized, effectively a politicized classification system now. Um, but we can't make the changes that we want to. Um, 
We're doing things such as you know, local changes where possible or lobbying for changes to international cataloging standards, but we also use things like cultural sensitivity messages on our library catalog, particularly in terms of some of the archives that LSE has access to. So we have archives that will have, um, you know, cover difficult topics or will have offensive languages, and we need to contextualize those for our users. I think it, it would be pretty remiss of us just to say, well, we don't want to get involved, you know, I think we have a responsibility to our users as custodians of those archives to be responsible and to curate them properly. So we will contextualize those and we do that in things like exhibitions as well. We also want to ring fence collections for retention. So often uh, most libraries are squeezed for space and most academic libraries will have some degree of off-site storage. The risk is that when books get sent to off-site storage, they just stay there and nothing ever happens and nobody ever accesses them again. So retention of books becomes basically a popularity contest where it is based on usage only. Um, but the problem is that LSE has you know, international collections and once you move those off site, you remove the ability for anyone to reasonably access for those or, or at least accessing them would have boundaries that would put people off. So what we want to do with retention is just to make sure that the kind of the more niche international publications are actually held on site. You know, and the books that we have loads of copies of or that other libraries have loads of copies of, they don't necessarily need to be on site because somebody could access them if they needed to. Um, we've obviously done collection evaluations and assessments, but we see this as an ongoing process. So we want to see what the progress we're making. Uh, and because we're using, you know, our library management system and we have these reports set up periodically, we can just go in and check and see if those numbers have changed. So I think it's vital for every library, if possible, to do some kind of if not the scale that we did that took two years, but then like a small scale assessment of their collections. But it's something that's very doable with their LMS. Just finally, I mean, this is kind of what your symposium is all about, but it's working with each other. So on a national level or even an international level, you know, it's about collaborating, sharing experiences. And in the UK, you know, a lot of libraries have done work in this area. You know, we may have focused on particular things than others, but there's a really good sense of kind of solidarity in this work and that we're working with each other, sharing experiences and best practice and learning from each other. Um, so it means if somebody has a really good idea, you know, we can all replicate it at our, at our libraries. And obviously, sounds like the basis of the symposium, there's a lot of libraries in South Africa who are interested in this topic. And also, you know, you can share ideas and best practices. And then, you know, rather than one institution doing something and it, you know, making an impact there, but, you know, if 20, 50 of us are doing something, it causes a much bigger ripple. Um, so that's the end of the presentation. Happy to stop. Oh no, I've got I've got some references at the end. These are things that you can follow up if you want to in the slides, but I will stop sharing now. He's going to read all his... Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, okay. Kevin, uh, for insightful uh, presentation. Can we give him a round of applause, please? And thank you so much. You know, you came at the right time. We are in the process of migrating to Alma, so we will definitely make use of the data analysis uh, for our library collection. Thank you for that. Uh, colleagues, um, because of the time that we are so pressed off, um, I don't think we'll take questions uh, unless Monday thinks otherwise so that we can go to the next um, presentation. However, if we have questions for the presenters, can you please put them on the chat and they will respond to your questions directly, if that's fine with everybody. Over to you, Monde. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thanks a lot, uh, Kiko. Thanks a lot, Kevin. We really appreciate it. Uh, Kiko took the words out of my mouth. I was also going to say that that we are just on the migrating to, to to Alma. And as I was seeing your presentation, I was just wanted to make you aware that it's not the first time that we're contacting you. <laughs> we will we, we'll, we'll make some uh, uh, contacts later uh, just to get more about the about Alma, especially what you presented. It was really insightful. And uh, as you indicated, uh, Kiko, we still are request the, the, the attendees if they've got questions to, to put them on the chat and if um, uh, Kevin is still around you will be able to answer them. We're really really uh, thankful for the presentation uh, Kevin. We're now moving on to um, uh, session number four and we um, will keep it uh, uh, 
20, 20 minutes late. We apologize for that. And uh, Mr. Mastile, are you on, on the line? Hey, Mr. Madiba, yes, I am. Thanks. I'm handing over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Madiba. Uh, good day once again, colleagues. Uh, now we're going to be introducing uh, Ms. Marlene Clark, who's going to be presenting on the libraries as liberatory spaces, knowledge justice, sites of memory, and acts of resistance. So let me just touch base on her bio, which is uh, she has an MC, MSc in race and ethnic relations, Rick Berg, and is currently the head of library at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, School and School of Advanced Studies, University of London. She has led on many equity, diversity, and inclusion initiatives, and in a previous role, led the Liberate Our Library Working Group at Goldsmiths, University of London, a decolonization initiative. Uh, let me take this opportunity to introduce our first uh, speaker for the fourth session, and once again, a congratulation on your appointment as a director last month. Um, Ms. Clare, the stage is yours. Thank you, Mr. Metzile. I'm just going to share my slides with you. Can you hear me? Yes, Can we somebody... do. Yes, good. Thank you so much. Thank you for your kind introduction. Um, OK, so it's really wonderful to be invited here to speak with you all today and to share share the stage of such an important symposium. I'm deeply grateful for everything I've learned from South Africa, South African libraries, South African liberation movements uh, through the last decades. And I'm eternally grateful for all the student activism as well, which has inspired a lot of my work in this area particularly roads must fall, fees must fall. So it was a real honor to, to hear one of the former students speaking uh, earlier. And yeah, good to hear also from my, a former colleague at Goldsmith who was there with me for a while, Kevin, just now on the, the work he's continuing to do at, at um, the LSC. And thank you to all the uh, speakers so far. It's been a really insightful, inspiring session. So my title of my session is Libraries as Liberatory Spaces, Knowledge Justice, Sites of Memory and Acts of Resistance. So this is just a, a picture of the library that I currently work in. Uh, I joined the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies Library in September 2022 as the leader, library leader, director and I've been there yeah, just under two years now. And previous to that, I worked at Goldsmiths University of London, where I think most of my work in this area, kind of social justice work began when I was at Goldsmiths and I'm continuing to do that work at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies. So just a little bit about what we call IELTS for short, instead of saying the, the, whole, the whole name, we call it IELTS. So the Isles Library opened its doors in a Georgian terrace house at 25 Russell Square in 1947. So we've been around for over 75 years and moved to the brutalist building that I just showed you. It's called Charles Claw House and that is on at 17 Russell Square. So it hasn't moved, haven't moved far. We're still in the same area. And Isles is a postgraduate institute and is part of the School of Advanced Study studies University of London and the de facto National Research Library and we are given national funding to provide a free national legal research library for postgraduate students researchers and academics based at any UK university and we're also open to all PhD students from around the world as well. We have an annual library membership of around 5,000 members and we also are 
the key library for students who are studying for their masters, so their LLM in law, uh, from five of the University of London Federate, federal partners, the K King's, KCL, London School of Economics, Queen Mary, so as a School of Oriental and African Studies and University College London. And we also have our own students as part of this School of Advanced Study of around 200 across various institutes as well as the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies. So the agenda for today, uh, I kind of focus a lot of my work and my talks when I'm invited to speak on the R's. There are many R's, but I've, I've focused on the, the, these four, recognition, reparation, restitution, representation. And those are some of the words that I use to kind of focus my work uh, in libraries when it comes to decolonization, decoloniality, reparation, um, liberation. And those kind of keep me grounded. And I try to ensure that I'm always answerable to those particular R's. So the agenda for my talk will be on firstly on positionality and knowledge justice, pedagogies of love. I've repeated knowledge justice, it's important. Decoloniality, memory, and this is going to focus on what was once on the site of the current Isles Library building. There was a, a centre called the Colonial Centre, and I will discuss that more. And also resistance, so what acts of resistance that I am I engaged in and my what are my team engaged in currently at the Isles Library? just wanted to start with a couple of quotes, which again, I like to focus on, you know, the the, 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 read, the reading and writings of others, and particularly those who are in zones of conflict currently. Um, this is a uh, Palestinian poet called Mahmoud Darwish, and the quote is, in silences we become accomplices. And this resonates with me given the work that I'm currently engaged in and that the library sector is engaged in as well uh, across across the world and you know it's it's something that libraries have engaged in silence and do engage in silence so it's important that we disengage from that silence and are active in our in our work to, to change that and also the black american author and activist uh, James Baldwin, the place in which I'll fit will not exist until I make it. Again, something that I tend to use as a quote to keep keep me grounded, to keep my work focused uh, in the areas so that I am ensuring that change is happening for the communities that the library serves. So my first uh, slide, or my first item is on positionality. What is it? So this is just uh, something I found online, um, gives a nice kind of overview, like in a sh really kind of punchy way as to what I, what positionality is. It's a social and political context that creates and cre creates your identity and how your identity influences and biases your perception of the outlook of your outlook on the world. And it focuses on, as you can see, race, ethnicity, gender, socioeconomic status, ability status, age, citizenship, sexuality and religious beliefs. And I think with with all things, when you're when you're doing this type of work and you're doing any work, I think, you know, you do need to consider where you're coming from, what what perspectives, what biases are you bringing based on who you are and what your experience of the world is, where you're positioned. You're in. Are you in Europe? Are you in Africa? Are you in South America? Are you in the Caribbean? All these things will have a, you know, an effect, and it will influence the ways in which you do your work and carry your work, and also what you are able to do. So positionality, position that personal is political, and I see the professional is political also. Um, for me, I cannot divorce those two things they are hand in hand and I arrive at work with my values and my, my politics as well and those things you know there is no separation for me so from my point of view um, my position, positionality 
a black mixed race woman. I am German, Hungarian, Jamaican. Um, I'm an LGBTQ plus. I'm new neurodivergent, working class, stay school educated, first in my family to go to university. I have visibility and I have privilege. I have a privilege given my position as a library leader. I have pr privilege in the fact that I can speak at such you know, events as this symposium. So it's never escaped me that even though I'm minoritized in many ways based on my identity, I'm also someone who has a voice and a person who can use that voice in, in certain um, surroundings and op given certain opportunities to share share my findings and share my share my work. So my time at Goldsmiths was really when I started to really focus on social justice and what that meant for libraries and library workers. And I wrote a piece in a publication called UKSG E News in 2019. And that really sort of, I guess, was, you know, more or less the beginning of some of the work that I've, you know, would started to be engaged with. And a lot of it was influenced by what was happening in the UK higher education sector. And a lot of it was highly influenced by what was happening in South Africa with the Rose Must Fall and Fees Must Fall. Uh, campaigns and protests and being inspired by those student-led protests and I think that's for me it's always really important to acknowledge the what students did you know what students are doing what is important to them they are the people that we are are serving here and we need to ensure that they we are listening to their voices and hearing their voices so a lot of the work that I did at Goldsmiths was influenced by student the student union and student voices um, so I wrote a, a short piece uh, in UKSG um, about this and focused a lot of my work and thinking on Bell Hooks and some of her writings and particularly a uh, publication called Teaching to Transgress, which I think was published in 1970, if I remember rightly. And I used a quote in this particular piece and to quote, to teach in a manner that respects and cares for the souls of our students is essential as we are to provide the necessary conditions where learning can most deeply and intimately begin. Oh, sorry, it says published in 1994. My mistake, it wasn't 1970. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's you know, I think these words are, you know, really important. And this way of seeing students as, you know, co co participants in the educate in their education and not and not to be spoken to, but to be spoken with. And I think this, this might have been highlighted earlier by the first keynote speaker, um, looking at some of the work that we did at Goldsmiths as part of the Liberate Our Library uh, initiative, which is still ongoing. And this began in around 2017. And as I, as I indicated, it was a lot of it was off the back of what students were protesting about and asking for in terms of change within the university. And one of the things that the students were able to do is have an influence on the then learning, teaching and assessment strategy at Goldsmiths. And they ensured that liberate our degrees was the first objective. And so that was a, commi a commitment from the library to engage with that particular objective. And that's how the work of liberate our library initiative uh, came about and how we started to do things like dive, you know, started to look at our collections, what was missing, what were the gaps, and in order to do that, there was an in, there was a conversation and involvement with students, and we were able to develop a specific collection called the Liberate Our Library Collection, where we asked students to let us know, give us suggestions, what's missing from the library, what's missing from your reading list what's missing from the curriculum. So this was one way of involving students and getting that student voice because yes, we as li library workers can, you know, can contribute to that, to those gaps, to making sure that voices are represented in the collection. But we're also going to be, if we don't engage students, we're going to be missing out on a large kind of body of, of knowledge if we don't ask them to in partnership uh, what's missing, you know, what do we need to add to our collections? And that was a, a large part 
of the Liberate Our Library work at Goldsmiths. And some other areas that were the work that I worked on were things like um, Library of Congress subject headings, biases in classification, which I think has already been picked up in one of the earlier talks. This, you know, how are, how are people classified? How are you know by by race, by sexuality, by religion, language? There are so many, you know, the structures of classification systems are, you know, inherently biased and based on these colonial, you know, colonial ways of thinking and imposing the, you know, this Eurocentric view of the world. And I think some of the classification, some of the work on classification was based on that. And also some um, offensive subject headings were dealt with, things like illegal aliens, which was, um, I think, reviewed by the Library of Congress. And I think it, no, it does no longer, I think it has been changed to something like undocumented migrants. But for a long time, you know, there was a huge campaign to change that particular Library of Congress subject heading due to its uh, offensive nature. So that's just a highlight of a few of the things that were going on when I was at uh, Goldsmiths. So moving to knowledge justice, some of the and pedagogies of love, I think the writings and, and thinkings of um, scholars like Paolo Freire and Bell Hooks really talk to how we need to be more cognizant and of the care you know we we show to students and the care we show to them and as 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 they co co-participants in the learning process, in the research process. And Freire highlighted the banking concept. So where students are talked to, they're given information, they are, they, you know, they're given this, they're filled up, they're filled with information like, you know, as, as though they're containers with no, with no identity, with no uh, coming, coming from back, you know, no acknowledgement of where they're coming from, what their experience of, of the world has been. So again, it's a very much about that um, partnership, a partnership relationship when it comes to um, education. And then some of the other speakers have already touched on the coloniality. You know, whose knowledge is whose knowledge is are we are we studying? Whose knowledge is are highlighted? Whose knowledge is come first? Who are seen as most superior? Um, and it's this work that needs to needs to happen with curricula and diversifying curriculum and having those conversations with those who convene in courses, convene degrees, and ensuring that voices, you know, are are heard, certain voices are heard, the missing voices, the hidden voices, the silenced voices. So again, it's knowledge is. Somebody said that earlier. I think it's not, not knowledge, it's the pluriversity, not the university. And another area that um, I'm currently focused on is critical race theory. Uh, to use that as a critical lens in which to conduct some of some of my work and I'll go into that a bit more in a minute. So I just want to focus a bit now on critical theory and critical librarianship. I mean critical librarianship has its origins in critical theory which is seen as liberationist and transformative and supports the inclusion and social justice of people of colour, women and LGBTQIA communities and more. And some of those thinkings and thinkers are being uh, used in some of the things that you know librarians are doing around critical, uh, critical lit, critical literacy uh, information, and in, the, in their teachings to students. And the concepts like black feminist thought, critical race theory, as I touched on knowledge justice, decolonial, decolonial theory, critical indigenous theory and cognitive justice can all be incorporated when we are delivering information literacy, critical information literacy sessions to uh, to students. And just there's a I've got a short quote by a, a library worker from the US, Melissa Gustafsson, around on critical pedagogy and to quote, to move move beyond research skill acquisition and tool experience to a transformative discussion with students about political, social, historical and economic forces in which information is created, framed and revised.
critical race theory. Um, I don't know if this is obvious. This is happening also in 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 South Africa, but there's a real a real backlash against critical race theory (CRT), particularly in the United States, where this uh, was formulated and pioneered by legal scholars such as Derek Bell, Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, who also um, coined the term intersectionality, and it is seen it is is being as I said there is a backlash against it because it is look it's used by you know it's, it's used by scholars to look at systemic injustices and it came about because civil rights law even though there were you know civil rights law which was supposed to advance um black people and their their contributions and their their lives within u.s society they didn't really get rid of the systemic injustices and so as we if you look at, I'm sure we're all aware that there's been very little change when it comes to the status of a black person in the United States. They're more prone to be imprisoned, to be killed by, you know, by police officers, by law enforcement um, personnel. So there's no, and that, you know, in terms of poverty, et cetera, and representation, there's still a lot to do. So civil rights law didn't, you know, change that. There might have been something in law, but the systemic um inequities still existed as in you know the system still existed which were you know which was still enabling those inequities so crt sought sought to challenge that um to make structural changes and this is a quote from a, a black american library worker called gloria ladston billings from 1998 so you know with crt is nothing new i think sometimes when people bandy it about, they don't really understand where it's come from and how long it's been with us. CRT in praxis, CRT scholars see it as a tool that helps educators to situate any discussed theory or notion within a classroom into its societal, legal, regional and historical context through invoking real accounts from the margins and stories that counter mainstream narrative or that bring to the light the omitted, erased part of the story. Again, I just use that quote to reiterate what I was talking about um, earlier. And then I've just done a lot of work with my with the team at Goldsmiths and with my current team at Isles on what is, you know, what is decoloniality? How do we use this? How do we use this in our in praxis? And I just like to quote something from a book called On Decoloniality, Concepts, Analytics and Praxis, which was published in 2018 by uh, Catherine E. Walsh. She was one of the editors and she wrote one of the chapters, Catherine E. Walsh, to quote, with colonialism and coloniality came resistance and refusal. Decoloniality necessarily follows the rise from and a response to coloniality and the ongoing colonial process and condition. Decoloniality denotes ways of thinking, knowing, being and doing that begin with, but also precede the colonial enterprise and invasion. It implies a recognition and an undoing of the hierarchical structures of race, gender, heteropatriarchy and class that continue to control life, knowledge, spirituality. Decoloniality seeks to make visible, open up and advance radically distinct perspectives and positionalities that displace Western rationality as the only framework and possibly and possibility of existence, analysis and thought. And I think that also reiterates some of the um, the talks that we've heard earlier today. One of the one of the things I also focused on at my in my position at Goldsmiths was reading lists, how to decolonize reading lists. And again, very much a conversation to be had with both academics and students. So it's not it's not a question. I mean, I've just got a few points here. There, there are constraints of a curriculum and pedagogy based upon a privileged canon of literature. You know, as you know, it's been demonstrated, um, particularly just now by, you know, Kevin's analysis of what libraries hold and where where things are published, where in the world are they published, UK, US, Europe dominate. So it's a question of where where are where are academics, where are, you know, where is the pedagogy coming from? Where are we focusing um, the content of reading lists? Not about swapping white men for black women in the curriculum not as simple as that. It's focused on challenging historical bias, which limits how we understand learning, politics, society and our world. 
If reading lists are not a reflective of the world, the community, then students are presented with a skewed perspective on who's an intellectual authority and who gets recognition. It ensures that students see themselves reflected in the curriculum and be able to identify with scholars regardless of their background and from all backgrounds. The next uh, se section is on memory. Um, and I, I really I just wanted to focus on this because when I when I joined the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, it was in September of 2022. And in October every year in the UK, we celebrate Black History Month. And so I asked my team what we were going to focus on for Black History Month for that October. And I heard a couple of people mention something called the Colonial Centre. And I said, well, what's that? What is the Colonial Centre? And they said it was formerly on the site. There was a building formerly on the site of the current um, Institute of Advanced Legal Studies building. And I became very interested um, about this. And I'm like, what? well, what was this centre? What did it? Who, who, who was here? And I really wanted to um, ensure that we acknowledged things around memory. I think memory is hugely important when we're doing social justice work because a lot does get forgotten, a lot gets hidden, a lot gets ignored. And I really wanted to highlight the people who had been on the site, you know, physically on the site of the building before the, the Institute. So we did some research and we found out that the Colonial Centre was uh, a building which housed African and Caribbean um, peoples who had come to the UK as some of were civilian war workers and some were students and there were a lot of students who were law students and they lived here at the they lived at the colonial center because of you know racism and you know discrimination in the UK uh, in trying to find accommodation I mean you know I'm I'm the daughter of a, a Jamaican man who came in the 60s and he had many problems trying to find accommodation as a black man then so you can imagine it was even worse you know in the sort of dirt in the 40s in the early 40s so this was an assigned accommodation assigned by the by the government and so we began to look at some of the students who lived in this accommodation and one of them was Stella Thomas and she was the first um the first African woman to be called to the bar in the UK at the, the Middle Temple, the Honorary Society of Middle Temple in 1929. And when I when we discovered this, I'm like, well, we need to share this, you know, we need to share this history. We need to do, we need to acknowledge this history. And, you know, she's a seminal, seminal person, a seminal presence in in legal, in legal, in the legal history of um in legal history per se and so what we did was put together a visual present presentation and use this as a black history month so you know to celebrate black history month to acknowledge black history month and created a powerpoint visual presentation which is now on the um the institute's website which you can access and i'll i'll try and post that in the chat afterwards and it gives you uh, an overview of that particular history and some of the residents who were present here. And in the following year for Black History Month 2023, the theme was supporting, uh, sorry, saluting our sisters. And we had a display, um, again, saluting many black black uh, and brown women from legal, legal history. And one of those was um, obviously Stella Thomas. And just a picture of, a couple of pictures of Stella Thomas and yeah, she was clearly a, a trailblazer. My next se session is resistance. This will be my my you know my um, concluding session. So some of the work that I'm currently engaged in in the Institute of Advanced Legal uh, Library is studies library is to look at position what's what's where and why and this is you probably can't see it very well, but this is a photograph of the lo you know some uh, location signage in the library, just giving it gives you an overview of what's where. And as the white part is like the fourth floor, which is the high the top floor in the library, 
and I was trying to, you know, look, get a better sense of what, what, you know, what's where, which jurisdictions are, you know, which which floors, where where are particular jurisdictions uh, represented in the collection, and the British Isles, European countries are on the top floor, and just not to go into too much detail because you know it will take too long but the the third and fourth floors of the library are where the main collections are <clears throat> a lot of these are focused on you know european collections and then there is also a lower 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 floors so the library um is on floors two three and four but there's also a lower two so in the sort of bowels of basement of the building underneath you know floors one and, and the ground floor which the library doesn't occupy there is a lower two and surprise surprise what do we find there Africa Asia the Caribbean Commonwealth and I was like well why why is the arrangement this way and it was very much reflective of um the British Empire and it was like, well, I need to do something about this. I don't want this kind of representation. I don't want the, you know, everything that's um, representative of, you know, part of who I am and part of the identities of many of the students and users of the library to be in, you know, one particular area in the bowels of the building and in a space which has no natural light, has a, you know, really low ceiling and is, you know, not the most conducive place to to study and research. So what I'm working on at the moment is to bring some of those collections up to the fourth floor. We've identified some space. So some of the Commonwealth collections will be moved up to the fourth floor and sit alongside the European collections and bring those collections into the line. And we are also currently working with a practitioner in residence on a film of the decolonizing process, which is happening in the library and it's called changes in light it's not yet available but it, i'm hoping it will get completed by the end of september this year and that will be documenting some of the work that we are undertaking as part of our decolonization again i touched on um, classification so the classification scheme has been revised as well in the library and you know highlighting the countries which weren't represented in the library and um, part of that classification scheme and also changing some terminologies as you can see from this slide British West Indies is still in existence <laughs> in 2024 that that is not you know that it no Brit, there is no British West Indies yes there are British you know there's still British territories in the Caribbean but you know most of the Caribbean are now independent independent um countries they decolonized. They are no longer part of the a part of the British Empire. Yet, you know, such terminology still exists in the collection. And again, this is something else that um, we are working on to change to represent the realities of our current world. But we're very, very much aware that you know colonialism is still is with is still with us, given that the legal systems around the world are you know heavily influenced by the presence of of the British Empire across three fifths of the world at one point and that this is reflecting reflect, reflective in the in the legal systems within these within these particular countries you know which is something you know that cannot probably be um, dismantled really but we have to find ways in which that has it can be addressed and, and that we can make the changes that need to be made and so some of the work as i said uh, is going on within my particular library and it would be interesting to see what sort of work is going on in other law libraries um, around the world as well to acknowledge these you know these things that need to, need to be changed and to acknowledge the fact that law doctrine is you know it's obviously deeply deeply um embedded you know racism and uh, is deeply embedded within it and laws you know which are are in existence you know do discriminate there there is inequity within the law 
um, and this is something that we know we also have to acknowledge as well. And finally, I just ending on uh, a quote by Tracy D. Hall um, as a representative, a black representative, a, the first black woman to lead the American Library Association from 1920 to 2023. And Tracy, to quote, has said, as a librarian and advocate committed to widening access points to critical information, and as an educator preparing students for that work, curiosity and humility are core values, as is a commitment to social justice. I was born and raised during the second and third waves of key civil rights movements centered on race, gender, and economic and political access. Thus, for it to be truly a value, to be truly impactful, I believe that all knowledge must have some liberatory aim or lead to some kind of real and positive change, whether personal or institutional, material or immaterial. Thank you very much. You, you are muted, Mr. Mestil. Oh, colleagues, uh, that's we have come to an end of our presentation, which was uh, thought provoking as far as the decolonization is concerned. And then I just uh, hope uh, Steve Bigo, whatever he is, is actually a uh, enjoying this because it was one of it resonate with his uh, black consciousness not being political colleagues okay thank you very much marine Plake. let's give you a, a you. round of applause colleagues please thank you and then now we are going to have our second uh, speaker for this uh, fourth session uh, noami smith uh, she's an uh, activist the colonial influencer and subject librarian in fashion and global black studies, University of West London. And then a title that she's going to be presenting on its uh, theme, the to colonize, decolonizing academia, balancing uh, personal narratives and emotional labor within systematic change by decolonization. Take on, madam. Thank you very much for gracing our great institution. Good luck with the presentation. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Can yes, you? Yes, we, we can. can. Yes, we oh, can. Oh, thank you. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, oh, sorry, I'm having a bit of problems. Um, I may have to quit and reopen, so I may have to log off and log back on because my computer is being funny, but I will be back on. Sorry about this. On a lighter note, colleagues, uh, our presenter has just shared uh, a video, which is uh, TikTok that is actually demonstrating the race, uh, racial capitalism in the UK. And then you can look at it uh, via our, our LinkedIn page where she's actually trying to, 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 to unpack the issue of black and brown people, how they are perceived. So when we have time, we can just go and log into LinkedIn and then type here, Name Noami Smith, you'll see that uh, very interesting video that she posted from TikTok to link it. Okay.
Hi, can you hear me? Yes, do welcome back. Perfect. We okay, I'm, I apologize for this. Um, so I'm going to try and share my screen now. Um, can you see this PowerPoint? Can everybody see this? Yes, we yes. can. Yes, we can. Yes, oh, perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, um, good morning, everyone. My name is Naomi. I am talking from sunny London. However, I do wish I was in South Africa. And I say that just because for many of us who belong to the African diaspora, but who live in the West, we face some unique stresses some unique challenges we're not necessarily recognized as british so for some context on my positionality my dad was born in jamaica my mom was born in nigeria she's half yoruba mixed with indigenous american white and african american i believe from a south african context she may be racialized as colored i was born in the uk but Despite that, I have faced, um, like many people here, have faced questions of, am I really British? Marilyn highlighted um, the different privileges that are present within our identities. So I do want to acknowledge that I have, quote unquote, light skin privilege due to the mixture of my mum. And also, unfortunately, in Jamaica because of enslavement and because of the rape that took place. I have um, my maternal grandmother was very, very fair skinned, lighter than me, hazel eyes. So those, I took my color in from my two grandmothers, which made me have fairer skin than both my mom and my dad, uh, slightly less Afrocentric features. So although I do experience racism, I do want to acknowledge that is not to the same extent as if I was darker skinned with more Afrocentric features. But it is still tough to, to be here, to live here, to be in a colonial institution. So this is why my presentation today is actually quite unique. I'm not going to actually be focusing on decolonial decolonial projects i'm actually going to be focusing on the emotional labor which takes place when we are involved in decolonial work and this is really actually a message for everybody here who is doing decolonial work but especially to the black women who are present today because i will be sharing um intersectional reasons why i feel and argue that black women don't necessarily look after themselves the way we need to. This work is grounded in black feminism. It's grounded in the praxis of Audre Lorde, who stated that self-care is actually political warfare. It's necessary for self-preservation. I will be discussing why we, I would say collectively, many of us have issues with adopting self-care, why we see it as indulgent. But really the message of this session is going to be how decolonial work is necessary to challenge oppression. We know this. However, to thrive in the face of oppression is through the practice of radical self-care. So an introduction to me, I have worked in academic libraries for over six years now. This is something that I wrote. Um, I wrote this for uh, an article that is coming out later this year that is on the subject of microaggressions experienced by black librarians in UK academic librarians, specifically looking at hair microaggressions. And I wrote how as a black librarian in an overwhelming white sector, I often feel I cannot escape race, even when emotionally I want to. 
I regularly find myself in a psychoanalytical fanon like state of existence where I am regularly acutely aware of my blackness and at times fearful of the stereotypes and unconscious bias that my white colleagues have towards me. Such anxiety, isolation and lack of support have already been noted as a key reason why there's an underrepresentation of minority library staff in London. So, in other words, because of the overwhelmingly whiteness of libraries, you know, librarians, I would argue, they are predominantly white, middle class, cisgender women. That's actually kind of the stereotype of a librarian. I personally am the only black person in my team um, and within the whole library teams within my library, um, there's only one other black woman. There was another black woman, but I haven't seen her for a while. Um, I think, unfortunately, she's off, she's off work due to stress. And this is a reason why I feel this presentation is very important today and why I wanted to share this with you, how if we don't take care of ourselves, we will burn out. Decolonial work is extremely, I would argue, taxing. Being and working in these colonial institutions is very harmful. And I just wanted to highlight how, you know, in, within libraries, the current discourse is that OK, maybe minority librarians don't experience racism. They experience, quote unquote, microaggressions. That's the new kind of buzzword. But I would argue that the word microaggressions is actually quite problematic terminology. The micro really minimizes the severity of the racial trauma that these aggressions can cause. And I just put from personal experiences, the impact of microaggressions experienced from working in British academic librarians is similar to the feeling of being bullied at secondary school because it's the same familiar emotions of feeling unsafe, isolated, hyper visible, yet invisible at the same time. So taking into account an example of a microaggression, I regularly have unfortunately experience. And like I said, I am writing an article about that will be published in an open access decolonial journal called um, Stolen Tools. Sorry, my mind <laughs> went blank then. It's a, the nature of hair microaggressions. So white colleagues touching my hair, making comments about my hair, I'm somebody who I like to change my hairstyle a lot. So today I'm in braids, but actually after this presentation, well, after this afternoon, I do need to take my braids out and I'll have my natural hairstyle. And this is something that change of hairstyle is regularly commented on. In fact, for the article that I'm writing, I actually interviewed different black librarians, those who identified as black, those who identified as women. And we did qualitative um, data. So I got them to discuss experiences in the library and experiences. A lot of them were saying how if they come in with a change of hairstyle. Comments, unnecessary comments and you know, just really feeling very hyper visible. And I don't really have the time to get into the data, but, you know, it's really just this idea of how emotionally and mentally taxing it is to be black in the white academic libra library. One thing that I also want to stress, you know, we're hearing about all this amazing decolonial work to consider how often, you know, when we are leading and facilitating this decolonial work, we can't just leave it at our desk at 5 p.m. and just go home and forget about our work, unlike white colleagues here, because systematic racism affects us, it affects our families, inside and outside the library and you know often and it'd be interesting to hear from um, colleagues here often when it does come to decolonial projects within the library if you are the 
marginalized librarian, you are expected to be leading this work. And of course, we do understand that, you know, we need to avoid white saviors and that often it is inappropriate for white people to be leading this work and talking on behalf of marginalized identities. However, we also need to reflect on how triggering it can actually be to be reflecting on racism. Because like I said, this is not something we can just forget about at the end of work. I actually have this quote. Um, this was um, somebody who was talking about 2020 when George Floyd was very much in the news and just say, saying how they just felt tired because they kept seeing and reliving racial trauma and how it brought on ex ex exhaustion, fatigue, reading the countless headlines, hearing all a lot of the time white people ask them, what can I do? And this is why I would like to highlight a very um, famous book written by um, a black British um, author called Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race, because really often having to explain and justify your racial experiences is very triggering, is very traumatizing, having to relive the pain and the suffering that not only you, but family members before you and unfortunately if things don't change those who are coming afterwards our children our grandchildren are unfortunately going to have to experience and all this mental emotional pain is actually why audrey lord very famously said caring for myself is not self-indulgence it is self-preservation and that is an act of political warfare However, I would argue just from generally talking to people, but also due to living in a capitalist society, a lot of us really struggle with looking after ourselves. A lot of us really actually struggle to say, actually, I need a break. I need to look after myself. And some key reasons that actually link back to colonialism, link back to these very factors that we're fighting against in our projects in the library and within academia. You know, colonialism, capitalism, consumerism has unfortunately really co-opted this idea of self-care. This idea of self-care, which Audrey Lord was talking about, is radical and that is necessary for self-justice, but capitalism has made it to be quote unquote, kind of Buddhist meditation without the Buddhism. It's very de-radical. It's inherently selfish and disconnected and the opposite of decoloniality. If I look at kind of conversations that I'm seeing now around self-care, as unfortunately we know we're living in genocide, genocide in Sudan, Congo, Palestine and other places. And increasingly on social media, especially by influencers and you know I am somebody who is a content creator I am seeing this message of you know disconnect be about the good vibes high vibrations look away and I'm somebody who believes that yes we do need to look after ourselves but we look after ourselves in the sense of we fuel ourselves we get ourselves to a place of strength so that we can go back into our communities and push and fight and create the change that we know is necessary. And I just again wanted to really look into some more intersectional factors for why, you know, productivity really is the priority in our workplaces and in our society. Self-care is seen as a treat. And again, I really want to encourage the black women here to really just take a moment to ask yourselves, to check in with yourselves. Are you actually OK? Do you need time off? Do you need to take a minute for yourself? Because unfortunately, misogynoir has told black women that we cannot sit down and rest because we must work twice as hard to be respected and rewarded. A lot of the time we face those messages at school. I know I was the only black person in my primary school and during secondary school, I was only one of three black students. And there definitely was this message, this, this almost 
this message that sometimes wasn't even explicitly said, but was understood that I'm at a disadvantage, so I have to work twice as hard to be on an equal playing field, which again is quite problematic thinking because it places the onus on the individual. We have to work twice as hard rather than recognising that the system we're in really needs to change. And I'm somebody who I'm very much connected to African, West African cosmologies. I'm quarter to Yoruba, like I said. So I'm definitely somebody who believes in ancestors and, and almost that I'm walking with my ancestors. And I'm very much, you know, you're, you're looking at me, but actually you're looking at all my ancestors. You can't, you just can't see them. And taking into account how on my Jamaican side of the family, the ancestors, those family members were forced to take care of land, children and families that did not belong to them. It has, I would argue for me especially, it has created this, um, this guilt at times to say that I want to rest. You know, we're living in a society, if you look at this picture of this kind of scary um, white lady, but we're living in a society where as soon as we're born, we have the message of all you need is more money and everything will be fine. Don't worry about the planet. Don't worry about others. Just focus on you and focus on building your wealth. Take care of yourself. You can have anything you want, but you have to earn it. You need money to make it happen. And that's just the way it is. So find ways to make money, work harder, climb the ladder, give your life for money because you need money to survive. And yes, unfortunately, we are living in a capitalist society, but that is why I'd argue decolonial work is so important because this society is not right. It's not right for our well-being, you know? So some concluding reflections, how radical self-care and Radical self-care, taking this definition of self-care from Audre Lorde, how it's necessary for social justice, it's necessary for preservation, to remember that it has always been a tool for social justice. For example, in America, the Black Panther Party launched initiatives promoting community health, such as free breakfast programs, organizing community clinics for medical care. It's really recognizing that the decolonial work that we're hearing about today, it is actually holistic in the sense of it does require giving up a lot of ourselves, giving up a lot of a sense of peace in order to create the change, which is why I would argue that practicing self-care regularly is actually an integral part of a decolonial lifestyle. And I just thought I would share how, you know, self-care for me, yes, of course, I do like, you know, the, the spa treatments, the facials. However, we really need to get to a place of defining self-care, especially from an Afrocentric perspective. So I just wanted to highlight, for me, it's part of what brings me joy and what replenishes me in order to go out into the community is I've been... Um, since this year creating events um, that I would argue are rooted in critical librarianship because they're very much rooted in bringing decolonial education to communities and making that education very accessible, very inclusive, taking into account that many marginalised people are excluded from academia traditionally. So, I have created an event called Communion with um, another um, activist and educator called Kaya. And um, I don't know if it will let me play, but I just wanted to share um, just a 30 second snippet of what this event looks like, because it very much is about replenishing and about empowering ourselves so that we can then empower others. So hopefully it will play okay.
Hi, Noami. We are not seeing anything. I'm not sure if we are still trying. We haven't seen anything that tried the project. Oh, could you not see anything? Precisely. Uh, Sorry. So if you don't mind, Naomi, you can put the link on the chat. I don't know. We can't see anything. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I will definitely, I'll definitely put it in the chat. Can you still see my presentation? Yes. Okay, perfect. No, I'll definitely put the link in the chat. Um, we really appreciate that. Okay, so this is my last um, slide. And um, I really would just like us to close our eyes. Remember, you're not on camera. And if you are, you know, feel free to turn your camera off. And I really just want us to just do, um, this is an activity just to check in with ourselves. It's an activity that I regularly do when I'm feeling very overwhelmed, whether it's at work, looking at social media and seeing all the atrocities. So I'd really just like us to breathe in for five seconds, hold our breath for five seconds, and then breathe out for five seconds. So I'm just going to, um, I don't know if you can still see me on the screen, but I'm just going to close my eyes, count for five, hold for five and breathe out for five. And I would encourage everyone, if they feel comfortable, to also do the same. So I'm just going to start now. And I'm just going to do that one more time. And again, I just encourage you to do it as well, because for many people here, this actually may be the first time they've actually just paused for a moment and just checked in with themselves. So we're just going to breathe in again for five, hold that breath for five and breathe out slowly for five. So we're going to go again. So I really hope that, you know, many of us here can take away even just that little activity and throughout the day or maybe at the weekend when you have some free time to begin to reflect on what would self-care look like for you and how do you, how can we give ourselves permission to actively Sorry, no, I'm, I think you are muted. You just muted yourself. Can you just kind of unmute so that we can hear you? There is no audio. We're not audible. Thank you. Sorry, can, can you hear me now? Yes, we do now. We can carry on, please. Perfect. Um, so I was just saying this is my last slide and how I just hope that you can still see that presentation, that slide where I was saying to check in, to breathe in for five seconds, hold that breath for five seconds and breathe out. And how I do that little breathing exercise every time I feel overwhelmed at work, so at my desk, or if I'm scrolling on social media, seeing, you know, atrocities, genocide. And I would just really encourage everyone, even if there's nothing that you want to take from today's presentation, to really take that time to check in with yourselves, to really give yourself permission to prioritise self-care. And I was saying how to be mindful that self-care is not this singular definition. It 
is plural because we need to remember our identities are made up of very multiple intersecting identities. So what is advertised as self-care, especially in our capitalist consumerist world, can look very different. So I really would invite you all to make time for yourselves, either today or hopefully this weekend at least. And that is the end of my presentation. And these are some resources and references. I would really encourage anybody who is interested in this. I would actually really recommend um, number 10 and number 23 on the screen. Slowness is resistance and decolonizing well-being, intersectionality, context and the collective. The, um, it's a podcast on Spotify, um, actually by my life mentor. And she has definitely been somebody who has been instrumental in recognizing how conditioned I myself am in regards to self-care and feeling guilt when I don't work. The capitalist conditioning that we, like I said, we pick up from society, also maybe from our parents, you know, my mum is half Yoruba, and if for anybody who knows Yoruba culture, um, very strict, very blunt. And I remember growing up when I was a child, how she wouldn't really let me watch television because she'd always say, oh, you're, you're watching people who have already achieved your goals, but what have you achieved? And even now, there, there's still, I still feel guilty when I want to, you know, just, just, to just watch Netflix for a few hours. And actually, while since this is South Africa, a lot of my favorite Netflix shows are actually South African shows. Very trashy TV, um, The Ultimatum South Africa, Fatal Seduction. But these are shows that allow me to just, you know, to just to just leave the world, the present world for for a little while so i would really encourage you to you know reflect on whose messages are you carrying in regards to allowing yourself to prioritize self-care and putting yourself first and as i've shown in you know this presentation especially for black women there are a lot of intersectional reasons that are maybe preventing some of us from being our most authentic self and being our most authentic self requires us to say when we need to have a break so thank you for listening thank you very much I think you have muted, Mr. Mestil. Oh, Can no. You... Is... No, Mr. Mestil. Have I muted him? Uh, thought... um... Also, in agreement that, yes, self-awareness, oh. self-reflect, and especially for black women, so that they have to prove themselves doubly, so as you said. And then also, I think we are, we are our adopted, uh, what called sister, here in South Africa, I, I, I could see that we are so fond of South Africa. Thank you very much once again for this um, uh, session, which ended up with some kind of therapy. Thank you very much. Sorry, Mr. Mestile. Mr. Yes. Mestile, I think yes. I'm not sure if from your side there is one item missing, uh, which is from Dr. Lucien de Koch. I'm not sure if you saw it, and Dr. Rashid. Yes, uh, Mr. Madiba, yes, I, I see that both uh, from uh, what called uh, co presenting is. Yes. So, should I carry on? or are Yes, they yes, that's the last, the, the la last co presenters in this session. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're muted, uh, uh, Mr. Messi. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, it's fine, it's fine.
Okay, thank you very much. Is uh, wasted too much uh, time, colleagues? So I think I'll just go to the short bio of our two co-presenting um, speakers from both uh, the University of South Africa. I mean, if you, I mean, I'm so fond with the University of South Africa, so I'm a student there. From UJ, University of Johannesburg. Uh, let's welcome Mr. Lucian Tikoka, who is a lecturer for information and knowledge management at the UJ a researcher and an independent consultant with more than 12 years experience in the information knowledge management field. His areas of interest include artificial intelligence, competitive intelligence, complexity, theory, digital transformation, information uh, and then knowledge management, mat maturity models and strategic intelligence. And as well to the other speaker who is uh, Dr. Naefa Rashid, is also a lecturer in the economics at School of Economics at uh, UG. A lecturer since 2009, uh, Dr. Nayefa has extensive lecturing experience in undergraduate and postgraduate research methodology, master's level political economics, and first year economics in person and online delivery. She has also We're missing you a little bit, Mr. Mestile. I suspect he's cut off. Mr. Mestile, can you hear me? I can continue. Uh, Dr. Uh, Rashid, uh, Mr. Mestile, you were cut off when you after talking about local economic development. Okay, let me carry on. Let me carry on. Let me see. Oh, uh, she's see a research and development economic, focusing on health economics, local economic development, political economics, decolonial economics, and the scholarship of teaching and learning. Dr. Naif has published in, in and peer reviewed for several accredited and indexed journals. She currently chairs decolonization in the College of Business and Economics and is substantively involved in various forms of academic citizenry, including general editorial editorship. She's also the recipient of numerous funding awards and university colleagues. Yeah, she has published in Digital Knowledge and Home Brewed Alcohol in Sukhune, which I think is in Kombodi. Uh, <laughs> Let's colleagues welcome uh, uh, our presenters and uh, Mr. Dikoka, who's interested in the uh, fourth industrial uh, revolution, which we know UJ is, is a pace a setter in that uh, element. Thank you very much, colleagues. You are welcome. Good day, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, we really do appreciate this opportunity. Uh, Mr. Monde, when you first contacted us to be part of the symposium, we were very delighted. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you to my co-presenter, Dr. Naifa Rashid, who is, as you've mentioned, the co-chair, or rather the chair for our college decolonization committee, uh, on which I am a member. So I'm going to share my screen from uh, my side. Uh, we do not have a lot of slides. In total, it's basically just four slides. Um, kindly let me know once you can see my screen. Yes, we can see it, Mr. Tukoka. It disappeared. It appeared for a minute. Mr. Duku, can you try it again? Let's see now. Yes. OK, so I'm going into presentation mode. I think I'll just do it like this because presentation mode is taking it to another screen. OK, so yes, we are from the University of Johannesburg. Um, specifically within the College of Business and Economics. Um, and 
Dr. Naifa and myself, as I've said, are members of the Decolonization Committee within the College of Business and Economics, or CBE for short, um, where she is the chair. And I have been on the CDC um, for over a year now, more than a year. Um, and um, so within terms of decolonization, um, when I started out last year, uh, it has been really a learning curve for me um, individually. So in terms of a historical context where we stem from is that we basically originated from, um, as alluded to many of the presentations, the feast must fall and the roast ma roads must fall um, campaigns that was seen in the country in South Africa during 2015, 2016. Uh, and this was when um, the College of Business and Economics was still um, the Faculty of Economic and Financial Sciences and the Faculty of Management. So these two faculties then merged and became what is known today as the College of Business and Economics within the University of Johannesburg. So the Faculty Decolonization Committee then became the College Decolonization Committee uh, on which we serve currently. So when we look at basically just uh, decolonization, and I looked at uh, Shepard Mpofu in 2017, he wrote um, his article, uh, in terms of the Feast Must Fall project, um, it was an attempt to decolonize knowledge, to decolonize curriculum, and to also decolonize faculties amongst others through the teaching of material from black thinkers where available, and also a fight for the employment of black academ academics in previously white universities. So this is where it all stemmed from. And we have been fortunate in the College of Business and Economics as the CDC uh, in our endeavors um, towards decolonization. So with phase one in 2017 to 2020, it was basically the conceptualization. And during this time, um, Dr. Naifa Rashid and myself, we weren't part of that. So that was during conceptualization, charter development. I know that Dr. Naifa came in towards the end when the charter was being developed. Um, rigorous internal debate happened within the College of uh, Business and Economics and calls for in information pamphlet was, you know, circulated to be created to assist with understanding decolonization conceptually. Because when it started out, and even today, we still find that when we speak about decolonization, many of our colleagues do not understand what it is. Uh, or when we speak about decolonization, they tend to shy away from it. Then in phase two, 2023, um, decolonization implementation took place. So we really kicked off in terms of implementation with many activities that we did within the college. So our college is made up of various departments um, that sits in different schools. And so we had um, roadshows um, that my co-presenter will also speak about uh, shortly. We had more seminars in terms of decolonization and obviously increased consciousness and comfort around decolonization. So we really wanted our colleagues within the college to be more comfortable in terms of decolonization and when we speak about it uh, and not for them to, to, to shy away from it. So... We are focusing today only on the College of Business and Economics in um, the University of Johannesburg, but it must be noted that the University of Johannesburg has various decolonization efforts that runs in other faculties, uh, but obviously we can't speak for the other faculties um, at this point. With also, as we know, with our country, South Africa, celebrating um, 30 years of dom democracy, the university has been running multiple events to mark the 30 years of democracy in SA. And these are some of our attempts in having projects in terms of decolonization. Um, I know that we've had 
the deputy president of South Africa and also the president of South Africa um, at uh, um, seminars at the university. So these were some of the events that took place uh, to mark the years of democracy in South Africa. I can just move on to some of the setbacks, uh, and these are just a couple that we have listed here. Uh, to support for decolonization was obviously never unanimous, which created insecurity among some. And therefore, we had at some times um, experienced hostility. We some, some, somehow still experience hostility, um, but not at a at, at the same extent as it was in the beginning. Um, problems around censors, censorship, bureaucracy, scrutiny, isolation, peer pressure, uh, bel belittlement of the cause of decolonization, accusations of decolonization being anti-white and being anti-Afrikaner, accusations of unsound research and unacademic focus, and then obviously lack of committee experience, because when it all started out, uh, it's true that the committee didn't have the experience, but throughout um, we learn and we continue to work on our efforts for decolonization. But I must mention that within the College of Business and Economics, uh, the Vice Dean for Teaching and Learning at the time uh, within the College of Business and Economics mandated that each department within the college must have a representative. So a representative from each department um, was selected to serve on the decolonization committee. Um, and so our committee is really made up of um, various individuals from various departments with various roles to ensure that we are um, successful in our endeavor. And so the CDC works on projects towards decolonizing knowledge, uh, decolonizing the curriculum and the college as a whole. And what we do on, on a regular basis or at the beginning of each semester is that we encourage colleagues within our departments to make decolonization part of the curriculum. Um, because at the end, we are requested upon or required by the vice dean um, and uh, the executive of the university to report on decolonization efforts and uh, decolonization within our curriculum. So I'm going to stop um, over here and then I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Naifa Rashid, to continue then. Thank you. Thanks, Lucian. Um, I think, is it okay if I could just share on your slides? Yes, it's fine. I'll just move oh. to, to the slides for you. Perfect. Thank you so much. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lucian's colleague on the Decolonization Committee. And um, as he's mentioned, things have been very, um, even though we started off, there was momentum between 2015 and 2016 with the merger that took place in our faculty and or, or with our faculty and another faculty, um, there came lots of um, challenges in terms of conflict, you know, there was a lot of uh, uncertainty between um, all the different faculties. So the approach that we took um, at, at, as we transitioned into this new committee was all the those points that Lucian mentioned on the previous slide, all of those points that colleagues were using to discredit the committee, to dismantle the committee, we basically took those points and we started using those points to build ourselves up, to build our charter, to build our workflow, to build our strategy, so that if people come forward with such accusations or, or character assassinations, again, at least we'd have you know, concrete answers and, and, and concrete ways to be able to challenge. Because it, it it's a very, um, and I'm sure Lucian, you can confirm as well, it's a very um, sticky, uncomfortable environment. So even yeah. in in big college board meetings, when we have to report on what we've done, you know, there's this there's this awkward silence. Um, you know, some 
you know, senior people will sort of rush you through your presentation so you can, mm. you know, get out the way and they can move on to other things. So we also have to be patient in a lot of those circumstances because it can be demoralizing. But I think um, the 18 of us that make up the committee, we have become a lot uh, stronger together in that we break away, we do smaller projects together, we we keep decolonization alive, you know, not, not, not in a bureaucratic sense where it's like, even though we do comply with the bureaucratic requirements, but that's not it. You know, we just do that so that we can meet the university's requirement. But on a deeper level, we make sure that we really keep decolonization alive in teaching and learning and in research. And the slide that Lucian is projecting now basically shows you the kinds of different things that we've been doing for the past, I'd say, three years. Hmm. Um, and I think the first big thing was developing our frequently asked questions document. And, and we'd be happy to share it as well if anyone would be interested, because that frequently asked questions document is basically a tool that one would use to start um, engaging with the environment, to think about their environment on their own. What does the environment look like? What what are the colonial tendencies that exist in the environment? So the reason we, we established these frequently asked questions was because um, it's very, very important for us to understand what exactly decolonization means, but at a practical, at a practical level, because you know, we we spend some time reading and we spend some time um, engaging with the material, but many colleagues didn't quite know what exactly this would mean, practically speaking. How would one see this materialize in the workplace? So the frequently asked questions document was critical. That's why we started with the development of that. It's roughly about a four page document and it really, it has made some people uncomfortable, but for those people who want to reflect uh, meaningfully and honestly with themselves, um, they, you know, they found benefit in the document. So, and and Lucian, I'm sure you'll agree, we, we, it motivated us then to keep going because people actually found use in the work that we did. And then o over and above that, that frequently asked questions document, Having visibility in the university is important. Um, so we do aim for three to four seminars per year and high profile speakers, you know, PhD students, whoever. We, we don't restrict. We don't say we must have one high profile speaker and three junior speakers. We, we don't distinguish in that way at all. All are welcome. And we make sure that um, we get a nice representative mix. That's the only thing we ensure is representation, that everyone is adequately represented in the seminar series. Interestingly, I mean, the committee in the past, depending on how controversial the the topic is, um, we have received um, instructions from management structures to cancel our seminars. You know, they've tried to... to um, even cancel seminars at the last minute. So it's been quite quite a challenge. So sometimes we have to balance the act between controversial topics and, you know, sort of safer, you know, decolonization topics. So we try to find, you know, that balance and we try to make sure that, um, you know, we, we, we at least have our foot in the door um, and we can make sure that we, allow everyone to expose to be exposed to all the different kinds of of decolonization that is taking place because we also acknowledge that decolonization is not doesn't mean the same thing for everyone it depends on your context it depends on your background it depends on who you are as a person who you are in the academic space so we are very open minded and you know free in that sense i think the next major project that we were busy with and are busy with is the annual newsletter so Colleagues are very shy to talk about their experiences. That's why platforms like this, like the one we are at today, the symposium today is so important because people are shy. They don't really want to talk about um, their thoughts on decolonization. They don't really want to share anything they might be, you know, that might be bothering them. So, you know, they can write for the newsletter anonymously so they can, you know, go ahead and share what it is they are thinking or they can write, you know, in their academic capacity, professional capacity. And that has been a very useful outlet for colleagues because it gives them an opportunity to express themselves. 
Now, we all know in the academic space, it's all about publish or perish. And so lots of colleagues don't want to write for publication. They actually just want to get their thoughts down on a piece of paper and conceptualize everything first before they rush ahead and write an article. So the newsletters is useful in that way because it helps p- people write in a more creative and free way. And then from there, a lot of articles emerge for people, or even if people don't want to write articles from it, even if it's just a personal reflection, that's also perfectly acceptable because decolonization is also a very personal journey for many people. Um, so so we, um, the, the annual newsletter is one of those safe spaces that we do provide staff with, and it's not restricted to our college or our departments. It's open to everyone at the university. We've even had um, writers from outside of the university. So if any of you here would like to join us and write, I mean, it's then there's no um, strict word count. It's not a journal, uh, you know, with strict requirements. The only requirement is that, you know, we edit it at the end and, and you know, send it to graphics. That's about the most formal part of it. But everything else is fairly standard and people have written, you know, po- poetic pieces, um, reflective pieces, basically whatever they feel they need to do in that moment. Um, then the third thing to to basically address what Lucian mentioned about the hostility and all of the discomfort and the, you know, us being accused of being anti-white and anti-Africans and, you know, all sorts of other things. We engaged in lots of roadshows where we visited all the different departments in our college. We spoke to people, you know, we got to know people so that everyone understands who we are, what we do, and so that they don't see us as this, you know, secret force that's working actively to get them fired. You know, it's, it, 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 I know it sounds silly when you say it like that, but people take it very seriously. They get very offended whenever the decolonization committee is there. Like genuinely, I've had people in the corridors like avoid me. They see me and they literally take a turn because, you know, they, I mean, I've never said anything controversial to anyone, but it's just, there's this stigma associated with the word decolonization. And to the point where we were actually also asked to change our name, um, which we discussed as a committee on two occasions. And we actually decided against because we think, you know, then it's, it's just a name. It's just a concept. Um, regardless of what you call it, it's the same thing. So why go through all the trouble of this? Why don't we, why don't we address the real issue? which is the discomfort that people are feeling. So the roadshow visits were part of that discomfort that we addressed. And I think we, even though we didn't, there were some environments where we weren't permitted to speak to staff. We, we were only allowed to talk to their managers and leadership. Uh, we were restricted, but you know, we took whatever we got because we're trying to get our foot in the door. We're trying to um, you know, allow people to express themselves and also you know, try and make people feel safe to express themselves. So the road shows, even though we've done one round, it's still ongoing. And we've also gotten lots of feedback from different people where they want to see certain things implemented. So we're working on that at the moment, in addition to the seminars and the newsletter. Then, of course, we have our traditional um, research contributing to the literature that's out there in the form of journal articles, um, book chapters, conference proceedings. So we we are deeply interested in implementation, but we're also interested in the scholarly project and getting our experiences out there, you know, for other academics and other people in the global south to, to be able to see, you know, what we're doing and, and our experiences and maybe, you know, have it resonate with them to some extent. So we have two, so, so we have that, the newsletter where you can write informally. And then we have lots of colleagues who are pursuing the formal route because they're academics and they also need publications and things, but they're turning their decolonization interests into, you know, publications in books or or book chapters or journals so that they can also meet their research requirements. So they're turning their decolonization into yeah, research output, basically. And I have nothing against that because I feel like if you want to contribute to the body of knowledge out there, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But of course, you know, we do discourage people from, you know, just churning out um, publications for the sake of churning them out. You know, we do advise that they it needs to be meaningful and, you know, take your time. Um, you don't have to rush 
you know, to meet units and things, make sure it's a meaningful piece um, of work. We also, from the teaching and learning perspective, talk to a lot of colleagues in um, the different fields. So because we're a commerce faculty, we've got economics, we've got accountants, business managers, um, knowledge managers, um, people managers. So we talk to all the different departments and try and help them with glossary building. And I know um, industrial psychology and people management, as well as accountancy, already have glossaries in place where they've taken key terminology, translated it into two or three indigenous African languages so that the, the terminology is more accessible um, to indigenous language speakers. So it, actually in one of our newsletters, um, we write about that and the whole process that the colleagues went through to formulate that. So if anyone would be interested, please you know drop me an email and I'll be happy to share those newsletters with you. It's a such a um, encouraging um, and uplifting environment to be in, especially not, not just from the lecturer perspective, but the students and the tutors also enjoyed it. They loved the fact that they could integrate their language into this field of accounting. They could use, you know, their words that they use at home to talk about psycho and to talk about auditing standards and to, you know, even create new terminology because a lot of the, the standard um, accountancy jargon doesn't always have an equivalent word in an indigenous language. So there was also a lot of glossary development that went on there. So and, and that was very useful. A colleague, a few colleagues and I have written a book chapter about it, which is forthcoming. And it, and it was so beautiful to see because someone taking an indigenous African language, you know, drawing on the roots of the language, you know, using um, um, sayings and African proverbs to come up with new terms to describe business, accounting, economics, terminology. It was really fascinating. And because African glossaries and, and um, you know, AI systems have very underdeveloped um, um, repositories for indigenous languages, this sort of activity is extremely important, we felt. So we really enjoyed that activity. And then, of course, we've got um, essay writing activities where students are allowed to express their views. You know, it's it's a very um, non-judgmental space as well for students to just get their ideas out there. They're very shy. So to also to encourage them because we need to have a strong student voice um, in our committee. So that is one way that we do that. We encourage students to express themselves. And then we also have um, taking all of the material in the different disciplines and trying to figure out how exactly we'd go about decolonizing it. What does it mean? What, what would decolonized accounting look like? What would decolonized economics look like? And it would mean different things for different disciplines. So we understand all of those nuances. So our next workshop takes place in July, where we're going to take, you know, the people attending are going to take their own basic content, and we're going to start um, reflecting on what aspects of that need to be decolonized and if so, how. So we're trying to um, basically make it a lot more um, practical. So we want to see the decolonization come alive in our environment at our university. And then workshops and adaptive learning tools are also used. So those of you who are not too familiar with adaptive learning, it's basically uh, getting students to learn at their own pace, but meeting the same outcomes. So there are lots of adaptive learning um, technologies that are out there. And what is nice about those systems is that they give students the freedom to learn at their own space. Whereas the way it stands now, students are, you know, surviving from one test to the next or one exam to the next. And so the purpose of adaptive learning is to just, you know, let students stop and learn in a more organic, comfortable, authentic way and to allow them to actually start challenging whatever it is they are learning. So that, that has also been something that we've been working with for a while. Um, and then Rethinking Economics for Africa and other similar festivals are also ongoing each year where colleagues get together and talk about which aspects of economics, you know, are make unfair assumptions in the African context, which aspects of, of um, economics are just um, unrealistic, outdated, what should they be replaced with? So those workshops usually help 
reflection and usually help us to make headway in our discipline and even with improving our content and our own um, economic resources and library collections, because that is really lacking um, in the discipline that I am from, which is um, economics. Um, next slide, please, Lucian. Thank you so much. So after all of those um, activities, most of which are ongoing, we, we need to take the committee to the next level. And one way for us to do that would be to start building um, funding so that we can travel a little bit more, um, send colleagues to workshops. Um, there are lots of workshops and training opportunities overseas, but funding is always an issue for us. So we are trying to, you know, um, speak to our deanery, um, see if there are any external funding instruments that we can apply for, because it's very important for us to network. We can't forever be operational just in our university and in our college. We need to move out a little bit and, and expand our footprint, not just in South Africa, but, you know, in Africa and the global South as well. Um, we are busy with lots of the next round of seminars, the next round of events. A few colleagues are interested in book proposals as well. So there is a lot of um, there is a lot of um, new projects in the work and new areas that need to be worked on. Co-researching, um, speaking out more openly about social justice issues. So, for example, the Palestine issue um, has been quite a difficult one because, you know, it's seen as quite contentious and everyone is, I think, even more sensitive um, about talking about Palestine than they would anything else. So, so so we are trying to explore that a little bit more and, and see what can be done about that. Um, and then information sharing, looking into more indigenous language development, but but more so from a sustainable perspective, not just from designing glossaries and then that's it. How do we bring um, the glossaries into subject matter? How do we um, expand um, all of the different vocabularies that exist? And then the last major goal, which is one that we'll be discussing at our next meeting, is um, transformation. So we do have, um, we're, we're trying to increase the number of black female professors that we have at the university, and we'd like to propose a few ideas. We're not sure, you know, as yet, um, who we're going to um, present it to, because it, it also is quite a sensitive issue, and in the past, um, there have been some some sore spots for a few colleagues. So we're going to brainstorm, and that is also a priority for us because we do feel like there are, you know, nationally as well, there are too few black female professors. So we are definitely going to make that one of our key goals for the rest of the year. Um, so I've put, um, Lucian and I put our details on the last slide. It's not projecting at the moment. But if anyone would like to get in touch with us, we really need to start collaborating um, with colleagues, like-minded colleagues, you know, colleagues who are sympathetic to decolonization, colleagues who care about this. So please do, uh, thanks, Lucian. Please do get in contact with us. So Lucian um, is in information and knowledge management and I'm in economics, but please do email us. Please get in touch. We really need to work together and, and it can't be, like a once-off thing, you know, where we meet once a year. It, decolonization is so ongoing for us, so we'd really love to hear from you. So please, please join us, colleagues. Um, it would be such an honor to work with all of you. Lucian, anything else from your side? I think you've covered everything, Naifa. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. I think there's just one little... Um, success I want to share um, that I think links in nicely with decolonization um, and it's a, one of our third year students who applied for the global entrepreneurship summer school um, and so it's he was one of um, I think about 400 students who applied just in South Africa um, and it was also open to to PhD students, master students, etc., and um, he actually won the scholarship. So he will be in September going to Germany uh, to share his ideas and his views uh, in terms of 
you know, what he's learning, what he would like to do as an as a black entrepreneur in South Africa. Um, and so I think it ties in nicely in terms of decolonization um, of how Daniel, basically, who is the student, overcame whatever setbacks and um adversities he was facing as a black student in South Africa and also currently still facing. So it's a wonderful, wonderful initiative and we are very glad that he's going to represent us there. Yeah. That's amazing. Congrats to your department, Lucian. It's an amazing achievement. Yes, and, yeah. And thank you, colleagues, for the time and the space. We, we really appreciate the platform and, and we hope to connect with all of you very soon. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks to our speakers. Uh, you are more than welcome. And uh, thank you very much for sharing this uh, monitoring uh, presentation with us. And we look forward to working with you in the near future. Uh, colleagues, just give them a round of applause. And then that's, I think that's the uh, end of uh, presenters for our fourth session. Um, well done, well done, colleagues from UJ. Thank you very much for gracing us with your presence. Bye. And Mr. Madiba, I think uh, Mr. Madiba, I think that's my yes. last uh, yes part of the day, so I can relax yes. now. Thank you very much uh, <laughs> to yourself yes. as well for the opportunity to grow. Thanks a lot, Mr. Mestile, and thanks again to the colleagues from AJ, uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Dr. Rashid and Mr. Dikokel for the wonderful uh, uh, presentation. The only thing I can say to you is just not to give up. We are just inspiring us. We will uh, looking forward to engaging you and learning a lot from you and you. And as you've indicated, you'll share the presentation. We really would like to have them because this is an ongoing process, but this is a uh, uh, the, 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 there is a project that we should keep, keep on uh, pushing and uh, until uh, we win. We, please do not give up. We are really inspired by what you, you are doing. Thanks a lot. And moving on Ms., uh, to the colleagues, I would like us to, uh, have, because of time, uh, and we, we missed when it comes to uh, lunch, and I've seen the colleagues who are going to uh, log in from at 1500 are not uh, in uh, yet and uh, I would suggest that uh, maybe if we take a break until 1500 then we will take it from there. I I can see Dr. Um, uh, in, in the Lam Mushonga, I can't see also Dr. Uh, Ndidi, I'm not sure if they can hear me. Yes sir, I can hear you. Oh, okay, 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 so, okay. And Mentabi, uh, for uh, for your session, are you ready? If we can just uh, move on now. Mentabi. Yes, I am ah, here. Yes. Okay, yes, yes. I okay, yes. Right. Okay, I'm handing over to you. I see uh, Dr. Mushonga is here. Uh, I'm just trying to check if Dr. Nida is also here, but it's fine. You can go on. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. Um, thank you, Dr. Munyarazi Mushonga, for being here. Um, I'm just, because we are running out of time, I'm just going to summarize the, uh, your bio. But yours is very interesting, so it's very difficult to summarize. Do, uh, Dr. M M Munyarazi Mushonga is our colleague from the UFS. A historian working with the Decolonial Archive is a program director for African Studies in the Center for Gender and African Studies at the University of uh, Free State, a member of the Decolonization Engagement Group of Senate. He previously taught in, Zim in Zimbabwe and in the National Library of Lesotho. Um, his fieldwork includes uh, history, decolonization, and decolonial theory, and others. And he, he, he says he enjoys operating at the margin in an undisciplinary approach. Hmm, interesting. He, worked, <laughs> he did <clears throat> research in Lesotho, South Africa, Botswana, and Zimbabwe 
He serves on the editorial board of OHASA and is a global academic director for Decolonial International Network. His decolonial uh, scholarship and activ activism is informed and driven by the question, wait for it, what are the things that we cannot know because of what we know? I have to say it again. What are the things that we cannot know because of what we know? He strongly believes that another knowledge, another world civilization is possible. There was no way I could summarize that. <laughs> Dr. Mushonga, <laughs> uh, Dr. Minyaraz Mushonga, a colleague from the UFS, please uh, hand over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm just trying to make sure there is enough light for you to see me. We can see you. Okay. Yes, we can see you. Don't worry, I'll. <clears throat> <clears throat> And Tabi, the doctor has sent an email. She wants us to project. Will you be able to from your side? Um, no, I think someone can do it. From OK, me. I've got it from my side. I just wanted to confirm. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm really excited to be on this platform. And uh, how much do I have, by the way? Uh, 30, 30 Th minutes. 30 minutes. Okay, no, thank you. Yeah, you just you just have to stop me if I exceed because sometimes I love listening to myself. <laughs> I, I, unfortunately, me and you are in the same boat. So our <laughs> colleagues from the Free State are worried. It's me, you, and Atemonde. We like to hear ourselves. So <laughs> let, let's, uh, let, let's just be nice to them and be a bit shorter. <laughs> can you oh, see it? Uh, can yes, you see I can. Colleagues? Yeah, yeah. Thank okay. you. you just let me know, uh, Doc, when you want me to move to the next slide. I, I think put it in, in presentation yeah. mode. In presentation <laughs> mode. Yes, please. I think you will just have to guess where I am because, uh, you know, sometimes I, I may not be able to synchronize, you know, what I'm saying with the slide. <laughs> so, so please help. Thank you. I know I know you will be able to, to make it. As you can see on the screen, the title this kind of you know changed over over time and uh, th th thank you thank you uh, monde for inviting me to 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 this platform and to a very important a very important platform and um, I, I i wanted to to decline but uh, i kept on pushing myself to say but i, I need to 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 be there and to 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 digress and to 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 actually, you know, uh, bring a different kind of you know thinking about decolonizing you know library collections. So as you can see from the screen, the title is decolonizing being slash board equal to decolonizing the mind and equal to decolonizing knowledge. And uh, this is a very problematic probably title. Given that I am a historian who is very allergic to figures, but uh, this is how I have tried to configure it. So, 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 so my entry, my entry point into 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 this uh, subject is to say that um, um, uh, um, uh, you know to decolonize uh, library collections, we need to decolonize the body. That is the human body as a prelude to the decolonization of knowledge and obviously uh, the mind as well as well and as i have already said i actually have zero zero knowledge about you know uh, 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 library collections and how we should go about decolonizing it all, all i know and all i think it should be done is that uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, library collections, you know, were consciously built and structured for a specific purpose and a purpose of power 
and the purpose of coloniality of power. And that these collections are simply an enclave of one hegemonic knowledge that pretends to be the knowledge of the whole world and the wisdom of the whole humanity. So, so for, for, for that reason, for that reason, I want to propose and to suggest that Cecil John Rhodes, Hitler, Mussolini, and all other representations of you know evil, you know, are still with us today. And especially Cecil John Rhodes, the arch imperialist, you know, who was at the center of the 2015, 2016 uh, uh, Rhodes must fall and fees must fall. He has not fallen. He is alive and kicking, and his abode is our 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 libraries. And when the why do I say this? I say this precisely because. According to Ramon Grossfugel and Boa Ventura de Souza Sandos, you know, Sandos, who is among us today, and I'm grateful to be part of this uh, group together with him, you know, simply indicates to us that the canon of thought in all the disciplines of the social sciences and the humanities in the westernized universities is based on the knowledge produced by a few men from five Western countries, namely France, England, Germany, the USA, and Italy. And that is how provincial, and that is how racist, and that is how sexist, you know, this knowledge is. Yet, such kind of knowledge has been made universal. Why is it provincial? It is provincial because it is based on the experiences of white people in Europe and North America. It is racist because it excludes knowledge from the rest of humanity. It is sexist because it excludes knowledge produced by women, including even the knowledge of, of, of white women. I think we can arrive at some of these conclusions when we scan this kind of archive and this kind of canon. So you may want to, 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 to listen to a 19th century British administrator, Lord McClure, who actually deemed you know, that the entire history of Indian civilization was less important in the lessons it had to offer than a single, and I quote, than a single shelf of good European library. This is according to, to writer in 2018. And sadly, most Indians and most of us, you know, in this global, uh, global majority, I was happy to hear that technology from one of the guys who were involved in the in the in the in the in the student movements for roads and fees must fall, you know, is is to simply say that you know they Sorry. 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 Colleagues please mute. Sorry, Prof. Just continue. Oh, and sadly I I was saying that most Indians had actually accepted this premise and therefore sought to imitate to imitate Europe. And actually because uh, the Beninese, the Beninese, you know, a, a philosopher, Paul Wundodge, actually distilled for us what he calls 13 indices of, 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 of scientific, scientific dependence uh, uh, that point to this provincialism. And those relevant, I think, for our colloquium include roughly three. Now, one of them is the first one, which talks about our dependence on apparatuses and uh, which which are made in Europe and in America. And the second uh, index is, is the second index is that of dependence on foreign libraries and documentation centers and digital data for up to date scientific information. And the other one is number eleven, which is serious linguistic dependence on European languages, 
and six European languages for that matter, English, French, Portuguese, Spanish, Italian, German. And this list actually makes it clear the nature of scientific uh, extractivism. And so, so this is quite important to, to understand how provincial this library is. That is why Ngugi Wationgo writes in 1993 in his book, Moving the Center, The Struggle for Cultural Freedoms, that, and I quote, the library in the larger sense of a storehouse of printed images and materials, whether located in schools, bookshops, public places, or in our homes, can become the temple of racism. And literature is often the softest of all the bread and wine served in it. This is very important. Yet I want to caution, you know, that uh, when we talk about decolonizing library collections and knowledge in general, it does not equate to kicking out or to banning Shakespeare. It does not mean that we remove works by white fingers from our libraries. My understanding is simply that we are simply calling for what Boaventura de Souza Santos calls ecologies of knowledge, where all knowledges can coexist and converse with each other, where Credo Mutua and René Descartes can coexist and share the same library space. We need to add on as Monde Madiba said in his opening address. So it is about diversity and it is about plurality. So, so this is what I really wanted to caution about. So my sense of decolonized, of a decolonized and liberated library collection is also that it can be a place of uniformity and sameness and that it must be diverse and plural in its collections. It must be an intellectual Pentecostal place where knowledges are different together. So the collections need to be locally rooted and globally relevant. So having said this in my introductory or opening remarks, now I want to move on to the point of departure, which is the human body, which is about the colonization of being and the colonization of the body as a precursor actually to the colonization of knowledge. And so I would like to start with a few reflections. Say that in 2006, I was working at the National University of Lesotho and I took my students of history to Cape Town on an educational tour. And for a bird's eye view of the history of the Southern African region, I had booked a retired professor of history who, re, who was at the University of Cape Town. And this is how he began his lecture to about 60 students in attendance, held at the Rhodes Memorial Square in the foot of Table Mountain, just overlooking the University of Cape Town. Four, hundred years ago, all this was empty land pointing to the north. Really, the land was empty? This thesis of empty land fits very well into what James Blout and Savelo Jane of Gancheni calls the colonizer's model of the world in a book titled by the, in a book by the same title. So the whole idea of Terranalias was to simply justify colonization and aggrandizement. If we rewind to 1942, we will see how this paradigm of discovery unfolded, starting, starting with Christopher Columbus's voyage to Abiyala, what is known as Latin America, but the local indigenous name is Abiyala, and the consequent division we may say, but the real terminology there is colonization of the world by Spain and Portugal, where they simply parceled 
the world between the two of themselves. As you can see in that image, the lands to the east were given to Spain and the lands to the west were given to, to, to Portugal, divided by that those two lines, the Treaty of 1493, the Papal Division, the Catholic Pope who divided the land for them and followed by the Treaty of 19, uh, 1494, after Portugal protested and it had to be moved slightly to the west to accommodate Portugal to have you know, a piece of the cake in the west. And so what we see here is simply means that by colonizing the rest of the world, as Spain and Portugal did, and subsequently Britain, France, and the rest, that simply meant that they had colonized everything in it, including animals, and human beings. And that is a fact of life. So what does that then mean? What that simply means is that by colonizing everything in it, it meant that it colonized all the knowledges, it colonized all the languages, it colonized all the bodies, it colonized all the pools, the forests, and what have you, which were contained therein. And this paradigm of discovery was or went together with a paradigm of difference. And I think it's in the next slide. And the first question that Columbus asked him when uh, 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 those people who came to greet him, when he landed in Abiyala, when he thought he was actually in India, the first question that he asked them was, are you human beings? Do you have a soul? He then wrote in his diary, and I quote, all I saw were youth, none more than 30 years of age. They are very well made. Their hair is short and coarse, almost like the hairs of a horse stalk's tail. They should be good servants. And I believe they would easily be made Christians, as it appeared to me that they had no religion. Close quote. What did this mean? This simply meant that the paradigm of difference had to consign some people or class some people into two major zones, the zone of being and the zone of non-being, which is clearly portrayed in Salad Lojane of Swag in that colonial cartography of power, where those who were put in the zone of being enjoyed emancipation, regulation, privilege, ethics, security, progress, industry, you name it. And those below the human line simply enjoy the violence, war, dispossession, rape, murder, genocides, repression, and you name it. And this is exactly how the world was configured and what it still is to, to, to this day. So it is this zone of none being, where and what Fanon simply calls it is an extraordinary, sterile and arid region, where black is not a man or is not human being. So this is very important to, 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 to understand. And so this was the beginning of this whole idea of superiority and inferiority, when we have the paradigm of difference where black people were simply pushed out of the human family and into a zone of, of non-being, as uh, Fanon, uh, uh, Maldonado Torres, uh, Savelo James of Gachen, Kihano, and many others simply demonstrate in their, in their work. So the colonization of being, which is actually coloniality of being, simply denied humanity to those who had been targeted for enslavement and colonization. And according to the racial classification, those in the zone of being were consigned to people who cannot think, listen to you and can't in their submission about Africans. Africans cannot think. And Zizek holds the same view and does not take anything seriously by non-Europeans, by non what non-Europeans say. So that is serious paradigm of difference, which translates into the colonization 
of, of knowledge. I think you can move on to the next few slides, I can't read, where we want to talk about theological racism, biological racism, and scientific racism in order to understand how being and the body were colonized, which translated to mean that knowledge became colonized. The moment the body and being were colonized, it meant knowledge was colonized. So my thesis here, ladies and gentlemen, is simply to say that what we need to target and what we need to decolonize is the idea of being, that is being human, and the idea of the body before we can even start thinking about decolonizing our library collections. That is the kind of physics I'm putting if, because it may not come out clearly. Okay, so if you look at it, you know, the colonization of being was justified on three fronts through biological racism. So, so here what it simply meant is that the intellectual justification for colonialism began with Christian theology. And theology developed into an ideology that produced concepts of superiority and inferiority. And this was debated at the Valladolid debates in southern Spain at the University of Salamanca between 1550 and 1551, where the question of whether the rest of the other people in other parts of the world were human beings. And here in this in this case, it was whether it was lawful for the king of Spain to wage war on Indians and whether the indigenous peoples of Abiyala should be should be should be Christianized by by force. And, and for answers to this question, they relied heavily on the Bible, the laws and regulations of, of the Catholic Church. And sadly, the victims of Spanish colonialism had no say in the questions that were posed and at the Valladolid debates. And so we can clearly see even at the, uh, at the Berlin Colonial Conference of 1884 to 1885, Africans were not represented, they were not even invited, and we all understand what would have happened if they were there. So how did this debate go? Two powerful theologians, Jean Juan Jean de Stuveda simply argued that Native Americans were not human beings. That is how I can summarize it. But if you can read that thesis about his idea of the superiority and inferiority of human beings, when he says, the man rules over the woman, the adult over the child, the father over his children, that is to say, the most powerful and most perfect rule over the weakest and most imperfect. The same relationship exists uh, uh, among men. There are being some who are by nature masters and others who are by nature slaves. Those who surpass the rest in prudence and intelligence are by nature masters. On the other hand, those who are dim-witted and mentally lazy are by nature slaves. Theological racism for you. And still on the idea of theological racism, I think is the next slide, the other theologian simply tried to argue that Native Americans were human beings who, however, were worshiping a wrong god. So in other words, he proposed and suggested that they need to be given our God, that is the Christian white God. And the Valladolid debate simply laid the foundation of basic racist concepts and structures for the next five centuries. And we are still living with them today. And this is what the Catholic Church simply confirmed that white people were superior beings and black people were simply inferior beings who should be condemned and consigned to enslavement. So, so, so Sandu Hira, in his work, actually shows how leading fingers of the European Enlightenment held the most horrific views about 
uh, uh, black people and how these views are still in circulation today. And I think it is on the next slide. You can listen to some of these thinkers. You know, for instance, uh, Charles Mondesco writes about black people. Those concerned are black from head to toe. And they have such a flat noses that it is almost impossible to feel sorry for them. One cannot understand why God, who is a very wise being, should have put a soul in a body that was entirely black. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you can see where we are coming from. Voltaire also described Africans this way. They are, ra they are round eyes, they are flattened nose, they are large lips, the wool on their head, they are not men, except in stature, with their intelligence far from us. They are not capable of paying attention, argues Sanduhira in his classic publication, Decolonizing the Mind, a guide to theory and practice. You can move to the next slide. Scientific racism is the same thing. And I just wanted to draw, and I don't have enough time to love this, but I would like to recommend this book by uh, Krisha Kojan, who wrote a book titled Darwin's Hand, Science, Race, and the Search for Human Origins, based on her experiences and the work at the University of Wits, where a one Raymond Dutt and I think a one Tobias were actually, you know, mm -hmm. leading the whole crusade on scientific racism. At, at, at Wits University, and, and where they held, obviously, horrific ideas about black. For instance, Raymond Dutt simply saw blacks as living, living fossil, and that is how he, he described them. So here we see biology, or the field of biology and anatomy, being deployed to build racist science. So scientists simply viewed black people as specimens not as human beings, and black natives were described as the most interesting, you know, uh, species. You know, a one broom, you know, wrote in his work, and I cut, I cut their heads off and boiled them in a pan on the kitchen stoves and sent them overseas. This was during the period when there was a booming, you know, international uh, trade you know, for skeletons in the world and skeleton, uh, skeletons or heads of black people or people of color, if, if you want. Right. Let me move on. So once you can move on to the next slide, I think. So I think once, once the European and American anthropological and philosophical machine had condemned the rest of humanity and consigned it to nanny beings or to lesser beings, its genocidal wheels started rolling, crushing all who stood in its way. Ramon Rosfugo illustrates this better in his classic piece titled The Structure of Knowledge in Westernized Universities, Epistemic Racism Slash Sexism and four genocides slash epistemicides of the long 16th century. And he writes, these four genocides slash epistemicides in the long 16th century are one, against Muslims and Jews in the conquest of Al Andalus in the name of purity of blood, two, against indigenous peoples, first in the Americas and then in Asia, against African people with the captive trade. And ladies and gentlemen, captive trade, slave trade, the Atlantic Ocean never enslaved people. It was the European captive trade where they developed this industry to capture people and sell them to the Americas. And for against women who practiced, you know, and transmitted into European knowledge in Europe, they were burned alive, accused of being witches. So this was the will of the European anthropological 
any philosophical machine in motion. Okay. And Ramon Bruce go also goes further now to add that in addition to this genocide of peoples and their knowledge and what have you, the conquest of our Andalas was also accompanied by epistemicides where libraries were banned. For instance, the library of Cordoba in southern Spain, which contained about 500,000 books, was <clears> banned <throat> even by the library of our Andalus in so Granada, which had about 250,000 books, they were also banned. I think our first speaker talked about, you know, the banning of the Timbuktu Library and many, many, many others. So these are genocides, genocides that speak to how knowledge and to how the body and the mind is colonized and that we need to decolonize in order to have a decolonial archive. So, so, Ramon Rosfugo also goes on to add that, on addition, in addition to these, you know, uh, uh, epistemicides, the indigenous peoples of, you know, southern Spain, especially Granada and our Andalus, you know, and especially Muslims, thousands of them were also banned alive because they were accused, especially the women, of being witches. So again, this is how the body, this is how the mind got colonized. You can move on to the next slide. Ngubi uh, Wathiongo, I think, illustrates clearly, you know, how the colonization of the body as a site of knowledge was very important. And he writes, this is what he gave in 2012 in a memorial lecture at the University of the Free State. And he writes, this negative perception and self-perception about black people as roots in the history of enslavement and colonization. The real battleground of the colonial process was the body. The body, black, white, brown, is the site of production and knowledge. In the auction block, the prime hit of the black board was advertised to emphasize that the merchandise was ready to be put into production line. Africa as a whole has gone through, through, major, through three major stages of the enslaved board as producer. That is the plantation, the colonial, and today, dead slavery. The colonization of the body as the site of production was integral to its colonization as a site of knowledge and vice versa. I, I don't think we need, I need to elaborate anything further. He also <laughs> writes further in his work in 2009 that the colonizer's mass memory actually sees nothing but savagery and barbarism when it contemplates the land, the body, the culture, and the language of the people it wants to colonize, be they the Maoris, Native Americans, Africans, Asians, or even other European peoples. So in other words, once you have been denied humanity, it simply means that you have been denied epistemic virtue. And that is the end of it, because you can't think because you are not a human being or a subhuman being. So my hypothesis here, ladies and gentlemen, is that I think we can move on to the next slide, is that uh, the, 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 is that to decolonize the mind. We need to know how the mind is colonized. So here, what I simply want to focus on are uh, on mechanisms and methods and strategies and institutions that are deployed to colonize the mind. Here's the first step to decolonizing knowledge. So, so there I have a summary, and I have drawn this from the work of San Vira in his book, you know, uh, Decolonizing the Mind, to, to summarize, you know, uh, 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 some of the mechanisms and techniques that are used to colonize, you know, to colonize the mind. As we know, our own Steve Bandu Biko once told us, the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the control of the minds of the oppressed. So how is this mind colonized or controlled? Through many ways, but there are two main ways. One, through the production of knowledge. And in the production of knowledge, it is actually the production of lies. A lot of what we think is knowledge is actually lies that are paddled. And there is this myth 
of 0 0.0 epistemology propounded by René Descartes. That is nonsense to talk about unsituated, disembodied, you know, uncontaminated, neutral, objective knowledge. There's nothing like that. We all write from our own positionalities. You know, our spaces, our upbringing, our locations, they all influence what we write. So it is very important to understand that. And, and there are so, I think we have gone through, I was try, trying to take my time so that you can read some of these methods that are used. The first one, the group is manipulation of information and propaganda tactics. That's how knowledge is all those instruments. The other is divide and conquer strategies. Some of you, you will remember, you know, uh, uh, in South Africa here, a clicks advert in 2012, where it portrayed black hair as dull, fizzy, and not normal, and white hair as, as, as normal, as beautiful, and the like. And that, that's how knowledge and that's how people's minds get colonized. So it's absolutely important to understand these processes so 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 it's also important to say that these notions of superiority and inferiority are also nonsense because they are based obviously as you saw on theological racism biological racism and scientific racism and that is lie number one as René Descartes writes I think therefore I am it also means that you know, it means that the opposite of I think, therefore I am, is also I don't think, therefore I am. And who is that who is I don't think, therefore I am? It is obvious, and we need to debunk that. So in terms of the layers that are used to colonize of the methods, you know, I think we can, we can leave that slide open so that people can digest that as I try to slow down towards the end. To say one of them is the indoctrination of colonial concepts. And language is one of these important, powerful too. English was promoted as a superior culture and indigenous languages as inferior cultures. Right now, you and me and the rest of the people are connecting through English. Why should it not be possible for us to connect through Iskosa, through Shona, through Ndivele? Why these six European languages? So language is very important. After all, I remember, you know, and uh, reading some of Ngugi's works where he was talking about how geek was banned. And if you were caught speaking your own mother tongue in a university space, you know, you would actually receive corporal punishment and X number of strokes or some or buttocks or some fines or even carrying a humiliating metal plaque around your neck, reading or with inscription like, I am stupid, I am a donkey. So this is how the mind is colonized. Ngugi also likened the indoctrination or uh, mover of the hard disk of African memory and downloading into it the software of European memory. He also likens it to the detonation of a cultural bomb at the center of the universe of the colonized. So this is very important. And the other layer is about the, the, through the indoctrination of, you know, I just want to highlight a few examples of colonial uh, concept. There is, there yeah, are yeah, several. This problem with the connection. Yeah. Colleagues, Sorry? please mute. Okay, thank you. There is what is known as, there is what is known as handbooks. And I want to focus on one handbook called the Israel Advocate Handbook. This Israel advocate handbook simply colonize, simply tries to colonize the mind, the minds of people. And in this case, the Zionist settler colonialists have actually uh, called the Israel handbook, you know, uh, wrote the Israel handbook targeting Europe and America or Europeans and Americans in order for Europeans and Americans to support its Zionist project. So it is not even about colonizing Palestinians, but about manipulating and colonizing the West to manipulate the minds of people in Europe and the USA in order to support the apartheid state of Israel and the occupation of Palestinian land and the oppression of its people and the ongoing genocide that we see today. So the Israel 
you know, advocacy handbook is a good and is good at actually shifting focus away from the crime to something positive. Freedom, democracy, social progress, determination. And characterizing those, <laughs> it is, you know, butchering and killing as human animals. Mm -hmm. So this is how the mind is colonized. And the other is institutions of knowledge transfer, our universities, our schools, our uh, public memory institutions, libraries, our museums, the digital resources like Wikipedia, the entertainment industry, films, music, sports, you know, uh, TV shows and theaters. And the media actually is very powerful in the transfer of concepts on a massive, you know, scale. And it's very, very uh, colonial in its manner. In the westernized media, actually, the Palestinian struggle to liberate themselves from apartheid Israel is presented as an evil act of violence against innocent victims of the Holocaust. The rhetoric, we are fighting human animals, is very clear. This is how Malcolm X puts it, and I quote, press is so powerful in its image making role, it can make a criminal look like he is a victim and make the victim look like he is a criminal. So that is powerful and important to understand. So in terms of decolonizing the mind, I think you can move to the next few slides uh, before I conclude. Uh, 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 there's a, yeah, a very good case study here. I think most of us know about Harriet Miriam, who was an advocate of you know, in the emancipation in the USA. We simply said, I freed a thousand slaves. I could have freed a thousand more if they knew they were slaves. This is our situation today, ladies and gentlemen. If some of us know that we are slaves, slaves of the epistemic empire, it would be easy to free ourselves. But the sad thing is that majority of us are not aware Second. that... Second. So Second. the next one is about a one... Frederick who actually fought a serious battle against his master. You know, uh, 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 he deployed his body and spirit to liberate himself. And he writes, my own crushed spirit was, cowardice departed, bold defiance took its place. Not hesitate. I did not hesitate to let it be known of me that the white man who expected to succeed in whipping me must also succeed in killing me. So this is powerful in terms of decolonizing the mind. All we need to do is to deal with our mindset. I think we also know of Marcus Garvey, who established the Universal Negro Improvement Association. And I think one of our leading lines in the uh, FISMA may, before it told it us about how to decolonize, you know, in terms of not only theory, but in terms of practice. And this is exactly what Marcus David did and told us about that, you know, we are going to emancipate ourselves from mental slavery. But because while well, the others might be free, none but ourselves can free our minds. And this is where Jamaican Bob Marley took and developed his song, Redemption Song, which touched, you know, the hearts and minds of millions of people around the world. And Hira posits that it is also the music, the first tones, his I voice, what if I chief say? all yeah. the emotions they arouse in mm -hmm. you. The song the story of the European kidnapping of Africans, the forced shipment of human beings to Abiyala as cargo, and their cry for freedom. So, ladies and gentlemen, decolonizing the body, decolonizing being, and would naturally translate to decolonizing knowledge. Ngugi Wathiongo, Sanduhira, with his book there, you know, you can read it. It's a powerful and very important book, pregnant of examples. And also, uh, uh, any of his works, I urge you to make a debt with his works because all his life he has been doing that. Conclusion, here it is a slight kind of digression, ladies and gentlemen, and because I didn't know how to put it together for flow. 
Here I am going and I want to conclude probably on a very deep and probably controversial note by reading a special letter penned in 2015 by some academics under the title In Solidarity with Library Genesis. And uh, as a way of calling for the engendering of the knowledge commons. I, I will read the selected parts and not the entire letter. And I'm positive many of you, you know, have come across it, especially those of you who work with who work with library information. So I read it in order to find your take about the proposition. I don't have answers to that. One of the important excerpts that I pick from there is that we faculty do the research, write the papers, reference papers by other researchers, save on Nigeria both, all of it for free, and then we buy back the results of our labor at outrageous prices. Complained a one Robert Dutton, who is a former director of Harvard University, who could, where, whose university could actually not afford buying some of the materials. Except two, there are many businessmen who own knowledge today. Consider yourself now the largest scholarly publisher, whose 37% profit margin stands in sharp contrast to the rising fees, expanding student debt, loan debt, and level wages for adjunct staff faculty. Elsevier owns some of the largest databases of academic material, which are licensed at prices so scandalously high that even Harvard, the richest university of the global north, has complained that it cannot afford them any longer. The other one is it, that is the publishing market, devalues us, authors, editors, and readers alike. It parasites on our labor. It tolls our service to public. It denies access. And except four that I also drew from the letter simply says, commercial publishers effectively impede open access criminalize us, prosecute our heroes and heroines, and destroy our libraries again and again. Before Science Hub and Library Genesis, there was, there was library.nu or Gigabyte, Gigapedia. Before Gigapedia, there was text.com. Before text.com, there was little. And before there was little, there was nothing. That is what they want to reduce most of us back to nothing. And they have the full support of the courts and the law to, to do exactly that. And the last one that I want to read is, we are all custodians of knowledge, custodians of the same infrastructures that we depend on for producing knowledge, custodians of our fertile but fragile commons. To be custodian, de facto, to download, to share, to read, to write, to review, to edit, to digitize, to archive, to maintain libraries, to make them accessible. It is to be of use to, not to make property of our knowledge. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, the letter ends with a specific plea and it concludes. Share this letter, read it in public, leave it in the printer, share your writing, Digitize a book, upload your files, don't let our knowledge be crushed. Care for the libraries, care for the metadata, care for the backup. Ladies and gentlemen, your thoughts on this letter. Thank you. Yo, thank you very much, Dr. Mushonga. Mm -hmm. That was very inspiring, scary. Mm -hmm. I'm still traumatized by cut or chop off their heads and boil them in paraffin. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, it is very important to really decolonize our minds, especially as black people. Uh, the colleagues that uh, presented in the earlier session, especially Naomi, showed us that there's still that uh, aggression, passive aggression in the workplace. <laughs> there's still issues uh, referring, you know, there are p still people who are equating blackness to stupidity and not thinking. Really, this was mind-blowing, uh, provocative, 
and challenging. You know, we always hide behind. We don't want to speak the truth. I know the Bible says this, the truth shall set us free, but the Bible got us where we are, but we pass. And Naomi said, we walk with our ancestors. They are with us. We represent them and they are in us. So our blackness is not a sin. Our blackness is not um, something to be looked upon. And uh, it doesn't mean we are stupid. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. I really appreciate you challenging everyone. And I think my, uh, President Mandela said, the former president said, never again. I think with this decolonization, it must be that everyone must leave this uh, symposium saying never again. Change our mind, change our thinking, go back to our children. Our children are, sometimes I feel like they are more colonized than we were or our elders were. So this is, was really, 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 really interesting. Thank you so much. I would like also to apologize to our colleagues who were supposed to start at three. I see you are in. We will take another few minutes because we still have a speaker between you and three o'clock. So thank you. Our next speaker, thank you, Prof. Uh, we, will, we won't take questions now. Please, Prof, if, if you have questions for all the speakers, put them in the chat. They will be here and they will answer the, the questions. If you want to chat to them, chat in the chat with them and engage. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is um, uh, Shadrach Ndide from, uh, he holds a PhD from UKZN. Uh, my brother from Zim, I know you, I saw you, you are in the house. He he's wrote a paper with Dr. Mguizi. Um, Shadrach, are you there? Are you managing to unmute yourself and switch on your camera for us? He is an information professional and he is an information technology uh, specialist. He, he works at NAST as a lecturer. Uh, he's teaching collection development. I hope he was listening and then he can teach the, the, his students the right things. He used to work in the Ministry of Education and Sports and Culture in Zimbabwe. He's also a, a, an advisor to Zimbla, the Zimbabwe Library Association. Uh, Shadrach is a facilitator in digital libraries content management and open access. He is a thinking performer with a rapid ad adaptability to new environments and problem solving with proven record in setting, in setting and meeting target. He's, he's got various interests uh, like community librarianship, performance evaluation, service quality and user satisfaction in libraries. Also, he has published a number of articles uh, Shadrach, over to you, my brother. Um, good afternoon. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Do you have, um, do you want to share your slides or you're talking to us? Can you, can you see it? Yeah, we can see it. Please put it in, uh, in presentation mode. You can see it? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. OK, if um, it's not a problem, just leave it as it is. We, we And then we can continue. Yes. Um, Thank you. I'm Professor Mugwisi, I'm Professor Mugwisi instead, um, presenting with, um, with Dr. Ndinde and Dr. Matienga. You can hear me? Yes. We, yeah, you just can just tell us when... quickly who, who you, uh, where you work and who you are and who, your other co-presenter. I've also done uh, uh, Dr. Ndinde, so just yeah, yeah, seconds. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dr. Dr. Matienga is a colleague also, but he's not on this uh, presentation. He's presenting elsewhere in Jobek. I'm um, an associate professor at the National University of Science and Technology with experience in... Uh, 
several libraries, mostly academic libraries, have been at the uh, University of Zimbabwe before Bindura University. I I did my PhD at um, the University of, Zul University of Zululand. For my master's, also I was at Zululand with Professor Ochola, who presented the earlier earlier on. Um, our paper we're looking at uh, decolonization of um, academic libraries in in, in Zimbabwe. Um, my slide, at, you can see this next slide. It's not moving, we are still at this first one. It, yeah, so most of uh, what I put in the outline might have changed because of the earlier presentations. Um, basically, we were going to conceptualize decolonization and collection development. I think most of the presenters have already taken down, uh, part of, uh, of, of the, the presentation of, of the, the conceptualization. We also look at collection development in the Melbourne libraries, the influ influence of uh, colonialism in on African libraries. Then we zero on the Zimbabwean library uh, landscape, colonial and post uh, independence by looking at the school libraries, special libraries, the, dif the different types of libraries and how they have managed uh, their collection development before and after. Then we also look at um, the Zimbabwe Library Consortium, its role in the acquisition and uh, uh, cataloging classification of uh, library materials and uh, other organizations which are uh, uh, interested or which are participating in uh, information dissemination through libraries in Zimbabwe. Then at the end of the presentation, we'll look at uh, present an overall analysis to show how libraries have responded, uh, how they've realigned their collections from pre-independence to, to where we are now. Uh, the term decolonization has been conceptualized before. And uh, here we quote uh, Viela, I see Kacheni has also been cited where he talks about most African countries, including Zimbabwe, colonialism. Colonialism existed long after direct colonialism. Now we can see a perpetuation uh, of some of the colonial, colonial mentalities in institutions who long after countries have gained their independence. Um, this uh, existence continued in everyday environments, including library spaces, hence our discussion this afternoon. Uh, there is also need, we point to the need to decolonize library services, resources and activities to accommodate everyone um, in the learning spaces and in general. Um, we are fortunate to have had um, uh, former student leaders uh, talk to us about uh, decolonization in the education system in the universities because we see this movement uh, originating from student activism uh, in the 70s, 80s, and even, even now, when we talk about the most recent cited, the fees must fall in South Africa uh, as examples that we have been uh, talked about uh, the, during the course of the day. So libraries as reservoirs of information can therefore not be uh, isolated in these developments. We see post-Zimbabwe, post, uh, post rhodesia early Zimbabwe, in the, after independence, um, the expansion of the education, edu education sector um, to address uh, racial imbalance. Prior to 1980, there was this uh, segregation, right? Where the black people, black people would not go beyond a certain level of education, or if they did go beyond a certain level of education, they were mostly sent to do um, what we called F2 system, where they were mostly to do with the practical side of education, whereas the other groups, the few who were able to do uh, 
form, form one to form five, six will then go to university. So we, we see that white dominance, uh, which the system, a post-independence tried to, to redress. So coalition development includes many different activities, such as the selection and deselection of material, the acquisition of material, and the evaluation of different access points. The selection and deselection of materials is influenced by probably uh, the, the policies which the libraries support, the institutional vision and mission statements, um, and, and, and so forth. We'll see that when you we, when you go further with our discussion. This sorry, activity. Prof, sorry, doctor, hello? your slides are not moving, so I'm not sure if you just wanna click on them again, or do you want us to? Which which one? From... Where, where, where are you're you still, on now? You're still on the first slide. Nine of them are moving. Which one are you seeing now? We're, we're still seeing the, the introduction slide. This one? Yeah. That, okay. Which one are you seeing? The one with your names on them. They're, you're not moving the slides, but you can continue. They are, they we'll share moving. with the colleagues later the slides. Thank you. Okay, it has, has it moved now? No. No? No. You can continue. We'll share the slides with the co uh, the colleagues there we'll, later. We'll share. Sorry, sorry, sorry about that. It's, it's moving on my uh, so the pollution development. Uh, we said includes different activities: selection, deselection, uh, the acquisition of materials, uh, and the evaluation of uh, different access access uh, options. And this. Uh, selection and deselection is influenced mainly by uh, the relevance of material to the institutions, the purpose in which they, 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 they serve. Deselection in some instances uh, may be as a result of the physical uh, conditions of um, the material. It may also to do with other reasons, which we'll further discuss uh, down in my presentation. There's the influence, uh, political influence and so forth. In, um, in in the content uh, of the materials. Um, collection development is designed with a specific purpose to provide libraries with resources that meet the appropriate needs of their client, client populations. And to quote Wilson, who uh, also we have in our panel, libraries are increasingly reflecting on their collection development uh, strategies and determining whether they are compatible with um, yeah uh, with the strategies to, uh, whether they're compatible with the equity diversity and issues of inclusive inclusiveness um library acquisitions can be affected by various factors including budgets for example a lot of libraries a lot of budget cuts and um, within this libraries have to prioritize what the what is necessary for acquisition uh, uh, given the funds that are available uh, the libraries also can be affected by uh, political concerns right we see a lot of uh, censorship and uh, and so forth in, in in libraries but how are libraries going around the issue of uh, of budgets for example we have the open access uh, movement which uh, calls for uh, the publishers and authors to make their material freely avail available uh, to to the public for for, for secondary use I think taking from Dr. Mshonga's uh, presentation on why authors at times complain that you publish and you may not have access to your own material that you've published and you have to follow it up in a database and, and end up paying, paying for it. So the open access movement is one of the avenues which libraries uh, are, are taking on uh, to access these resources which are uh, freely available through databases like uh, the DOAGE and so forth. 
we find some publishers also are making available material through the embargoing system, for example, where six months after publication, uh, the material is freely available. And what is also happening in 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 um, in Europe and other countries, which benefits some of our libraries in the global south, is where if a research is published using uh, funds from um, from government, for example, other research institutions, that material is made freely available because that research would have been would have been funded, right? So, so those are the things that uh, uh, um, libraries are adopting to circumvent the issue of, of budget and so forth. So the cost of uh, library resources, including journal subscriptions, dwindling budgets, um, are factors that are influencing uh, access to, or, I mean, the movement towards open access resources. Uh, libraries also acquire material through donations that uh, can sometimes be bad donors. For example, I always give my students the example of uh, uh, the Kim Il Sung collection, which we in post in Zimbabwe fashionable to talk about uh, communism, Marxism, Leninism, and so forth. And during that process, also we got quite a lot, a lot of material, vo materials, volumes, and volumes of books on Kim Il Sung, which we. We, 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 we were included in our library collections, but they, they were hardly used in the, moving around the shelves now in those libraries. Those, those books are no more in the, in the libraries. So library acquire materials through donations. Um, in the Zimbabwean perspective, we tend to get a lot of material from uh, through Book Aid International, um, the INAS, um, and World Vision. In this world, uh, mostly Book Aid International, we, we 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 get them at the different levels, at university, and schools, and the municipal libraries. So, so, so the, the issue of donations is is is, is where we find ourselves uh, highly dependent on. Um, how then are we working around this? If last says that human being. If a fundamental right to access to expression uh, of knowledge, creative thought, intellectual activity, and so forth. And this is emanating from the United Nations um, uh, Declaration for Human Rights, chapter, uh, chapter 19. However, censorship and government laws tend to work against these initiatives and affects library collections. You will find that material that was uh, banned, for example, by one government is unbanned when a change of government and the reverse also also happens. From my experience at the University of uh, Zimbabwe, we used to have a section called the Special Collections, where we had special material uh, donations by special uh, 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 by people like with Gold London Collection and so forth. We also had a section for banned books. These banned books were only for use in the library. Some of them, others were not for use completely to by, 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 by anyone. So post-independence, we saw a movement of some books from this banned collection back to open open to the open shelves. And we also saw a movement of books that were in, in the open shelves being moved into the banned book collection. So depending on the the government of the day and the policies, certain material may be accessed, may be accessed, and certain material may not be accessed. So the issue of censorship really and government laws, despite if let's say li libraries should provide A, B, C, people should be able to access whatever they want, walk into a library, access what they want, it, it becomes a different case with the with the with the, with the, with the local. Uh, uh, laws of a, of, a, of a country, right? We in Zimbabwe here, we've got the censorship board, for example, which will censor material on different uh, grounds, morally, militarily, uh, and, and, and so forth, right? If material is deemed 
to influence people negatively. Such material may not be readily found on the on the on the library library shelves. So, in as much as we want to have uh, material that uh, uh, caters for all the, uh, the the needs of all the communities, such hindrances actually affect how we in this uh, um, according to law library development in the european colonized nations has been primarily influenced by two factors that's the library situation in the colonizing country and the style of colonization all right um, in zimbabwe for example but the development of free public library services for the entire population and we see the municipal and uh, municipal libraries were also took the same um, were influenced by, by 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 the previous governments and uh, we see that even even up to now where we still have uh, municipal libraries for the low density where the whites formerly resided and uh, municipal libraries for the township libraries take for example Harare we have um, Harare City Library in town taking care of the libraries in the low density areas. Then we've got the municipal libraries um, headquartered in Highfield being responsible for libraries in the townships. And the funding regime in that uh, uh, is diff was different because the Harare the City Library, formerly Queen Victoria Memorial Library, was enacted through an act of parliament. Whereas the libraries in the townships, their funding was based on the municipal uh, municipal generated uh, resources. So colonialism influenced this development of municipal libraries. We still find those differences even is, is even as of now. I think this is situation. You find the same situation in former British colonies. I've had colleagues in. Uh, I've done some work with Nigerian colleagues. I've done some work with colleagues in Kenya. Um, in South Africa, yes, I've done a bit of reading from Professor Ashidik. He has also written some issues on the development of public libraries in, in South Africa. You tend to see the same pattern, similar pattern in terms of the establishment, funding, uh, the resources and, and, and so forth. Um, so these small libraries were established in the townships, in district offices, and municipalities with mostly Eurocentric collections and so forth. Um, some of these libraries post-independence were closed because of change of clientele or support, but their collections uh, are still available if they have not been destroyed, are still available in the district offices, but no longer available for for circulation, right? That's the, those are the, the, the municipal library. Then what is happening also we find in the university libraries and uh, college libraries, the university libraries developed uh, mostly to support academic efforts of the institution and their collection really were mostly to support those courses which were taught in the universities. Uh, so how did this development take place. Firstly, the three patterns that we see. Firstly, to set up, the setup was for special libraries, right? Special libraries which were to serve government libraries of the colony, followed by these college and the university libraries. And lastly, we found, we find the public library development as a third, 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 third phase of library development in Zimbabwe. Um, so how then are libraries realigning their collection? I'll give an example of the three types of libraries. Uh, we have school libraries, for example. You can actually contrast now the private schools, library development, and the former Group A schools, which are government schools, which were formerly white only schools, and then Group B schools, government schools again, which were designed for, for the black people. 
So the library state of library development in in these three types of schools is very different. With the private schools being well funded, the group A schools to some extent, and in the group B school, the libraries are poorly funded, right? And in some instances, you find um, initiatives which may which may be put in place to develop the school libraries in group B schools but with no support from from the school itself you build a library the next thing you go there you find it has been turned into a storeroom it has been broken chairs broken desks and so 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 many things so the library development in these three categories is still probably where it was very independent I, I know my colleagues will say yes things have changed but they've not changed at the same pace as uh, where probably would want to the issue of budgets, right? And then the issue of staff in these libraries uh, is also, most schools will have a teacher librarian, yet other libraries would have a dedicated librarian probably paid by the school through whatever funds which, which they have, right? And then we talked about the donations, we talked about Bookage International and World Vision and Inas. They are still key funders of these school libraries, right? In urban areas, in the rural areas, the libraries are almost non-existent, right? We have organizations like the Edward Love Memorial Library in Gwanda, which runs book boxes. Edward Love Memorial Library gets books from the um, through Book Aid International mostly. So they've got an ex extension service an outreach program where they take these books to schools through book box, the book box project. So those are those are some of the efforts which 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 are taking place with within school libraries. Then of course we have got these special libraries. How are they realigning? Change of policy mostly influences um, the development of, of these special libraries. Most organizations are realizing the importance of libraries in their institutions. Uh, in terms of the importance of knowledge uh, management in their organizations. And we are seeing the development of such uh, institutions, the libraries within uh, organizations, which are manned by uh, uh, trained personnel in some instances. So special libraries also to support their parent organizations, organizations are realizing the need of having such organizations, such institutions within them. Then the public libraries we've already talked about. Uh, I gave examples of the Bula of Arari municipal libraries and uh, the libraries which they support. We have Bula also, uh, and which is also a, a big uh, municipal library system. We have with the Bula public library, for example, serving formally serving uh, the low density areas. Then we have uh, its subsidiary municipal municipal libraries. Um, of course, the number of uh, public libraries are dependent on the expansion of the, the townships, for example. So each township would normally have a library, but this has not been the case of late. So the development of public libraries really has not been to that uh, to the le expected level for both the municipal, the, the, the major, urban, major urban centers. Uh, what else can we say? Top, yes, we've already given about public library, the funding system, the funding regime, and, and, and so forth. Um, within the, the, the organization of libraries in Zimbabwe, we've got um, the library consortium. Um, most here we can cite the Zimbabwe University Library Consortium being the first, uh, which brings together libraries. Zook, for example, was established to negotiate journal subscriptions with overseas publishers. It was formed to provide leadership in access to knowledge and promote information resource sharing 
because then we were talking about foreign currency, subscriptions were too high. We even had a token system, uh, which was supported by UNESCO, so that we could buy, pay subscriptions uh, to overseas uh, for databases. But then this also presented a problem because some universities were more established with many courses, for example, use it. And some universities were relatively new, upcoming, with less programs than, than other universities. And so that pre presented a problem in terms of sharing who pays what and for how much. So Zuruk was able to go circumvent that problem by negotiating on behalf of um, most of these major academic libraries. Um, Zook is responsible for collection development policy within the consortium. Uh, the description and organization of material, for example, this cataloging and classification of material, curation, and so forth. Trying to standardize the issues probably around cataloging and classification. I think this has been mentioned uh, several times where you find the bias of our library organization, library cataloging and classification towards Library of Congress, for example, towards CS yeah. list of headings, towards the uh, um, Jewish classification scheme. From my experience as the working in the, in, the, in, the, in the academic library, we always had a problem where you want to classify an in, uh, indigenous content, for example. This can be from a dissertation or thesis, and the, the, the terms that are in the project were not, were not found in the, in, the, in the list of subject headings. Yeah, you know, they the used for broader term, narrow term, etc. So you've got a book that describes traditional medical practice, for example. I remember sometime I wanted to give a rating for traditional medical practice, and the nearest that you could put that book was witchcraft. And witchcraft was, was what? Was the representative term to, for me to put this book that was looking at traditional medical practice. So what we then do, did as institutions is to create our own subject headings within the system so that at least we give an access point to the material that we had. So those are some of the shortcomings that you will find in the, in the, in the, in the catalog and classification, the bias towards um, those type of, uh, of, of libraries. Uh, so Zook and these areas of activity in decolonizing, pra decolonizing practices, uh, collections and services, we find that in the acquisition, Right, where we talk about equity and diversity, libraries must acquire a wide range of materials. In cataloging and classification, I've already said how we are standardizing um, our cataloging and classification and the adoption of uh, uh, library management systems, for example, where we find in our case, CORE has become the most popular library management system because of the cost involved. Libraries that automated earlier, like use it, they were on more expensive um, library management systems which needed uh, higher subscriptions. Um, what else I've already talked about? The challenges that we face with the Library of Congress and its bias in processing materials. We think that we have um, organizations which are outside these other broader organizations, which are also helping to make available material to the communities. We've got Zimbabwe Rural Trust, Schools Trust, um, which is uh, different civic organizations established to, put, to push the development of school and rural community libraries in Zimbabwe with the view of rural information access to fill the gap between, also we see the coming of IT, ICTs in, in, in the process. The gap still exists, not between uh, former dominated and black, but also within the black uh, communities themselves, with the rural and urban, we find that gap in terms of information provision, in terms of information access. 
So it, organizations like this Babu Rural School Trust uh, come into play to develop school libraries and information resource centers, working closely with the Ministry of uh, Education. So to sum up what, what, what we observe, um, um, from the collections that we have in our libraries, library collection building in Zimbabwe library is largely dependent on foreign materials, right? Mostly from US and, uh, uh, and Britain, right? Uh, I see this example uh, from the study by Kevin, where also, they also noted, we didn't do a study per se, but based on experience, from our processing, cataloging, and so forth, we find that we type on mostly material from England and America, probably because of language, uh, English. Um, we also get a lot of material that support STEM, science, uh, technology, engineering, and so forth. These materials we get from outside because of uh, we don't have publishers locally who can uh, who publish those types of uh, materials. A poor publishing industry means that you will have to rely on importing for certain advanced uh, areas like, like the science, engineering, medicine. Uh, of course, we do get some uh, material from... Uh, this is material which is published in Asia under license from Cambridge and so forth. But then you find such material being imported, right? Being imported by, 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 by local publishers who supply mostly universities. Here I'm talking of a publisher like Baroda, for example. Uh, they source this material from, from Asia, but it's published under license from, uh, from, um, from publishers in Europe, like Cambridge, Oxford, and so forth. So the same also applies for e-resources. We subscribe to e-resources mostly from outside Africa, again, from Europe. We tend to get material from neighboring subjects when it comes to law, law material because of the Roman Dutch law that we share and most of the publishers and the law reports we get them from South Africa. So that problem specialized area where we get from within the region. Donations, we've already said, Bookage International comes into play. Inas runs a lot of projects for our universities and World Vision. Language is dominant uh, and official. You find in schools, in offices, and so forth. So our material is mostly, yes, that orientation, we, hardly have uh, a demand for other languages like Sp Spanish. Of course, French in schools is taught, so there's a demand for, for, for that type of material. Um, we have Mandarin now, but I'm not sure what is happening in universities uh, where they are teaching Mandarin. It's also another area where we find a, a, that language. But most importantly, the absence of an established public industry contributes to the shortage of material in also in local languages. We, we, we have 19, is it 16 official languages? And some areas are not well catered. They don't even have material for secondary school. So let alone for libraries, for teaching primary and secondary education. You're talking about uh, Venda, Sutu, Shangani, and so forth which are now, have now been introduced in school. So that basically sums up our situation regarding the challenges that we face in, term, in our libraries and um, post-mortem, post-independence. Post, uh, How are we realigning these collections? Uh, I think I, yeah, that presents my, my last, my last um, slide. Thank you so much, Professor. I know it, it is uh, challenging for you. You know technology does that to most of us. But yeah, like a professor that you are, we went, you went through and you figured it at the end. And thank you for highlighting the important part of school libraries. You know, we, we, 
in Africa, we don't really pay attention to school libraries. In South Africa, we have a campaign that was started a long time ago, one school, one teacher, one librarian. I don't think mm -hmm. we have that. So it is very important for us to really take care of school libraries and make sure that they have relevant material. You know, it, it's said that we depend on, on donations in Africa. We sort of like a dumping ground for what we don't need, that the North, global north doesn't need, they dump in Africa. But it is up to us as Africans to create our own knowledge, to produce our own research, not export it and give it to the, you know, when we say open access books, open access publication, academics think, oh, there goes my money. But it is to improve and build research and in, uh, innovation in Africa. Thank you so much for your presentation and sorry for the challenges that you experience. I'm now going to give back uh, back to our chair, Sademonde. Thanks a lot to Mentor. Thanks a lot to the Prof also for the wonderful presentation, those insightful ideas. Uh, May uh, Zuki, are you on the line? Yes, sir. Thanks a lot, Zuki. I'm handing over to you for the last session, and I could see uh, our two professors are, are ready, and they've been ready for some time. And I keep it uh, just what you said uh, 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 to apologize to them for that. But we we are on we're on the last session now. Over to you, Zuki. Uh, thank you, Chair. When are we supposed to end so that our presenters can? can plan around that since now the program has been updated uh, while our chair is uh, working on that i would like to welcome everyone uh, in, in this last session my name is uh, zuki swamaya i'm facilitating the session uh, in South Africa, we call the afternoon session, it's a graveyard session uh, because <laughs> most people are very quiet at that time. Uh, but I'm happy that uh, we still have people on the call. Uh, Monde, are you ready now with our time so that yes. we may continue? Yeah, up to uh, 10 to 5. Okay, uh, my presenters, please take note of that. Uh, we have been extended. I'm not sure if we are decolonizing the time or not. Uh, well, maybe is this the African time or what's going on? But we are here. We Our time has been extended because of interesting uh, presentations and conversations that all our speakers have been prepared. We would like to welcome our last uh, two professors. Um, uh, on the podium, I will then introduce um, them. I will of them so that I do not interfere with the with the program. Also, to save time, uh, because of what's going on uh, as uh, behind the schedule. Uh, I have tried to help. Uh, to be held by the artificial intelligence on how to pronounce uh, the names. Uh, I would like then uh, to apologize in advance if I did not pronounce them correctly. I've been practicing the entire morning uh, thanks to artificial intelligence uh, tools because uh, they really uh, have been good with me. I hope so. I will also present the summary version of the profile. I'll start uh, with uh, Prof. Uh, George uh, Day, who is a renowned uh, educator, researcher, and writer, who is considered by many as one of the Canada's foremost scholar on race, anti-racism, uh, anti-racism studies, black and minority education, African indigenity and anti-colonial thoughts. He has produced a lot of uh, research output colleagues. We are all here, either academics or librarians, which we know how to find information 
please go to your tools and know about him. In 2023, Prof was given an honorary research associateship in the Center of Excellency in Disabilities at University of South Africa. He has written about 47 books, over 80 journal articles, so he's really indeed a scholar. Can we give Prof a, a round of applause, colleagues? Let me see you clear pink. Okay. Uh, then we will move to our next speaker, uh, Prof uh, Bonventure de Sousa Santos. Uh, Prof is a professor of sociology at the University of Comra, uh, Portugal, a, a distinguished legal scholar at the University of Wisconsin, Madison and also a director emeritus of the Center for Social Studies at the University of Coimbra. He is uh, widely renowned for and has written and published extensively on the issues of globalization, sociology of law and the state, epistemology, social movements, and the World Social Forum. His book, have been published in Portuguese, Spanish, Italian, French, Germany, Chinese, Danish, Romanian, Polish, and Korean. Prof, I challenge you to publish maybe in Sisuto or Sikosa, uh, so in one of the South African languages. Uh, Prof has been awarded several international acclaimed awards. The most recent one is the French a final lifetime achievement award by the Caribbean Philosophical Association. And Prof, he has been awarded 21 honorary degrees from university in the world. May we give a Prof a round of applause, colleagues, uh, to our presenters, are ready for you. Uh, we are still here as our chair Monday has apologized. We will apologize for the delays uh, that uh, took place. Uh, but we are here looking forward to hear from your papers and learn uh, more. But before uh, I present my mic to you, to my audience, I would like uh, to take this opportunity uh, to wish myself a happy birthday. Today mm -hmm. is my birthday. <laughs> happy birthday. Uh, the, reason, the reason I'm happy declaring birthday. that, I don't want you to leave me alone on my birthday. Please, even if you were thinking of leaving this session, just think about me and my birthday. It's <laughs> yes, birthday. it's my birthday, so don't give me that present of leaving me. I want to have you here. And also, I want to challenge uh, my audience here yeah, uh, to wish me a birthday in their, on their uh, we call here mother tongue language <laughs> because it's my first time to to celebrate my birthday in the international platform. <laughs> so I'm very excited. That's why I couldn't wait for Monday to say that. So on the charts, can I have, I want to archive this moment to have birthday wishes in all the languages that are in this platform. <laughs> Uh, Prof. Antura, I want Polish, I want everything, <laughs> Korean, I want those messages on the chat because it's, it's, it's a moment in my life. It's a moment in my life. You see, and there I see Sisuti, uhule, uhule, zugi. So I want that, guys. I will archive them and say on this day, my birthday was celebrated internationally. Over to you, uh, colleagues, uh, according to my program. Uh, Prof Day, you are number one. Uh, however, if the programs have changed, we will accept that. Thank you, uh, colleagues. Um, can I share, share my PowerPoints? Yes, please. 
Yes, please. Um, hmm. This, you guys are using Teams, and I'm not so familiar with Teams, so let me see. I do. Uh, Dr. Monde, do you guys have the presentation where you can assist a uh, prof? Was it sent to you? Or prof, can you agent to send to? I sent it, I sent it to Monde long, long ago. Okay. Okay, a uh, technical team, please uh, help us. Is that the presentation, uh, Prof? Or it yeah. has, has changed? That, can you see it, Prof? Yeah, I can see it, but it's just in small pieces. Okay, right. no, they will sort it to presentation mode. Don't spoil my birthday, technical teams, please. <laughs> Is it fine now? Um, it's small, but um, I would, I would, I would, I would, in the interest of time, I would guess. Uh, uh, first of all, let me. I just arrived in Ghana from uh, Toronto, right? Um, just around midnight last night, so I'm already jet lagged, right? And um, I'm so privileged to be in this session with uh, Santos. Can you see it, um, Yeah. Can, I can you just it, let me know when you want me to move, please? Yeah. I'll, okay. I'll let you know. Um, I'm just so glad to to be in this session with Santos, whose work I do cite uh, in my teachings. So next slide. So I begin by by acknowledging the land um, in which we are. And one of the things I always say is when we look at it, um, in every space, right, the land has been a space where people are to fight to liberate, and it's very, very important to to recognize that. I also want to bring in the elders and the ancestors to join the discussion that we haven't. Uh, by the way, how many, how much time do we each, each have? Um, Will 25 minutes be enough, Paul? Okay, I may forgo some slides then. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, in the west of Maya Angelou, the late Maya Angelou, I want to say I also come to you bearing the, the gifts of knowledge given to me by my ancestors, right? And I want to thank the organizers of the symposium for uh, asking me to speak. Um, and what I'm going to share with you is uh, my travel when it comes to questions of decolonial, anti-colonial teaching and learning, and particularly in the way in which we have black omissions, silences and negations, but also black resistance in academic knowledge, knowledge production. Next slide. Um, some of the highlights, one is the idea of de decolonizing library acquisitions and collections. Why is this so important? Uh, to me, it's important uh, precisely for some, some issues that not only I, I've made, my, my colleague and friend, mentor, Malifia Santi also talked about it, right? That when we look at Africa, what we need is African universities, not universities in Africa. And why do we say that? Because one, the universities in Africa are simply a colonial satellite of the Western Academy, right? And we need to challenge that. And I think nowhere is it more clear when we look at our library acquisitions. So the questions of the who, the what, and how um, we, we talk about library collections and how they inform D and anti-colonial practices become very, very important, particularly if you want to subvert schooling and educational practices. And this is where to me the epistemic and philosophical relevance of this Symposium is very, very important because it becomes fundamentally a question of knowledge production and how we reveal the relevance of that as it has to do with teaching and learning, blackness and Africanness. Next slide. Um, let me quote Asante here, right? Uh, because it's relevant to the discussion. He writes, quote, if colonialism's influence had been merely to the control of the land, that would have required only one form of resistance. But when information is also colonized, it is essential that resistance must interrogate issues related to education, information, and intellectual transformation, quote Malefia Santi. And I think for black learners, for African learners, we have a particular responsibility and obligation to demonstrate authenticity and integrity in whatever academic space that we find ourselves. 
because of the continuing legacies of colonialism on our bodies, on our histories, and on our knowledges. Next slide. Uh, I think, go back, you, 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 yeah. The question, I, I think the question has always been who, who exercises the locus of control over our story and how we tell the stories about ourselves, right? And this is why it's very, very important for ways to vocalize our politics. We have to vocalize our politics. And then when we talk about to know is to act, right? We are acting politically, responsibly, but also timelessly because time is of the essence in terms of the issues that we want to talk about. And, and so we need a radical inclusion when we talk about, for example, of library uh, collections. How do you talk about inclusion? It has to be radical, right? Which is we have to look at the processes of educational delivery, which touch on questions of teaching, learning, and administration. Because at the end of the day, education becomes uh, a foundation to human liberation. That's what education is. So the question of bodies and knowledge become very, very important because it's the bodies and the knowledges that we produce that allow us to resist uh, and also and become who we are in the academic spaces that we are. Next slide. And, and I mean, I'm sure, I mean, some of the previous speakers have spoken about decolonization, right? Uh, but I want to make this point by Sandy Grant because it's very, very important because uh, look, not only is decolonization being liberalized or domesticated, right? But it's also, it's a, it's a way, as Sandy Grant talks about, to uphold whiteness in academia, particularly where our universities become an arm of the colonial states. The role that our universities play in becoming an arm of the colonial state, as Sandy Grant talks about. And this is why we need to challenge the continuing refusal to acknowledge the place of local cultural resource knowledge as counter knowledge to Western science and the conventional approaches of schooling and education. Next slide. De Decolonization demands that we ask certain questions. For example, within our schools, who have, how have we all become complicit in perpetuating colonialism, both wittingly and unwittingly, and consequently have avoided collective and shared responsibilities. How do we also shed the layers of inherited colonial knowledges and subvert imperial education that start with our library acquisitions? How can we work with the idea of infinite possibilities in our critical teaching resources? The infinite possibilities in developing critical teaching resources. Next slide. The question of whose voices count and whose voices are missing in some of these dialogues. How can our universities also examine their own complicities in the colonial atrocities so that we meet our shared responsibilities rather than simply doing this lift service around decolonization and anti-colonialism? I'm asking us to think through about the, the intertwining of the question of decolonization and indigeneity. And in this particular place where Africanization comes into the conversation, because this is, these issues are very, very intertwined. Decolonization, indigeneity, and Africanization, because they are very, very intertwined. Next slide. Next slide. Um, uh, sorry, Prof. Colleagues, uh, we are hearing background noise. May you please, uh, all of us, uh, mute except the speaker. There's such disturbing noise. You may continue, Prof. Sorry sure. about that. No. Um, I, I have been working with anti-colonial theorizing, right? Which to me is not just simply about definitions in and out of itself, but rather how we talk about explanations of relationships and the exercise of power in an anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist critique of our educational institutions. We all know that the university is not a neutral space. So we need to question what is 
and what has been internalized and what is also presented to us as land disposition. And in that process, how violence can be concealed or embedded in the so-called common sense knowledge production. And this is a point also that Pierre Boudot talks about it and my colleague Diane Farmer talks about it in terms of that land disposition, what is concealed in, in, in the process of schooling. Next slide. We also need to dis disrupt Euro modernity, where our libraries have become laboratories of Western Euro modernity in terms of what resources they hold, whose books they collect, what is absent, what is omitted, right? Through that process, they become laboratories of producing Euro modernity. And also, we see how the way our schooling and our educational processes are steeped in very Eurocentric patriarchal and imperialistic cultural logics of modernity. I already talked about the question of whiteness and whiteness is not just in North America. There's whiteness in the African space. The way we value whiteness becomes a problem. And if we look at even our library acquisitions, right? Who's scholars, right? And we look at those scholars and you see that they are marked by particular bodies. So Western modernity to me has functioned in a way to change the rules of reason, the standards of logic, rationality, authority, authorial control, and credibility. And it's very, very clear when it comes to library acquisitions, right? Whose work is given authority? Who is given that authorial control? Who tells whose stories, right? Who is giving credibility? Whose work is giving credibility? These are issues that we need to address in that. Next slide. And then um, we all talk about Walter Mignolo. A long time ago, he talked about that colonial modernity dialectic. It still continues even to this day because it suppresses the ontologies and the epistemologies of African and indigenous peoples. And in, through that process, it universalizes a particular subject as universal of all humanity. And we need to subvert this colonial hierarchies of schooling. And in doing so, for example, to highlight the significance of history. So we teach you see, to our students to acknowledge our own ancestry, our own privileges, our struggles, and to appreciate each other's history and to use this knowledge for human liberation. Uh, one thing that in my recent book I talk about is that, for example, when we teach history, we teach history not simply for what we want to know, but what we should no, so as to create ethical learning subjects. Um, um, next slide, but let me warn the audience that it's started to rain here. So if we hear some background, it will be the rain that is disturbing. It's this started to rain in Ghana here, right, where I am. But we need to pursue a very subversive educational approach that is not a superficial add-on, right, but it requires intentionality. We need to be very, very intentional in what we want to do. If you want to dismantle and rebel, as Taiki and others talk about, right? Because our decolonial, our anti colonial process cannot be hidden. It cannot be an undercover scholarship. It has to be in the open. It is going to be messy. It is going to be confrontational. We're going to make some people very angry because we're talking about them getting rid of the way they have canonized certain collections to the absences and negations of others. And this is going to be very, very messy and confrontational. But this exercise cannot also be about seeking validation in the eyes of the dominant. You cannot talk about decolonization that seeks legitimation in the eyes of the dominant. If this is so, it is not decolonization. So we need to be continually vigilant of how decolonization is being domesticated, is being liberalized. One of my students, Huna, uh, Lord Henry in, at the University of Toronto talks about, now is some people see it as, quote, rearranging the colonial furniture. No, we need to get rid of the damn furniture, not rearrange it. Okay, next slide. But I also, in my recent work, I'm talking about the metaphoricity of decolonization, right? And, and this borrows from some of the things that people have talked about earlier on. I know we talked about uh, in Gujiwa Thiongo, um, but Paul Ferrer's point about 
the cultural invasion, also the question of the oppressor consciousness, which is very, very important. But the reason to me why we need to talk about the metaphorality of decolonization is that it's about the power of the mind, right? Uh, so we talk about how we unchain our minds. The African-American scholar Wimak talks about unchaining minds. We have chains around our minds. So how do we unchain it? It also goes from our own, the late Steve Biko's black consciousness, how it comes with black, that black consciousness. That to me is about unchaining our minds and to be asking some very, very tough critical questions of our institutions. Next slide. And of course, there's hope and futurity. Could you just uh, go on to the next slide? Uh, um, just one point before we move that. Um, please go back. Yeah. Um, this point is also very, very important because I think I need to make it. You see, the anti colonial process that I'm talking about, it's not just about de Westernization. It's not just that. That's not the full story. It's not just de Westernization. But that's again, my friend Mulefi Asante talks about it's about placing Africa at the center of our knowledge production and regeneration. They are not the same thing as de-Westernization. It's placing Africa at the center, right? Because you can de-Westernize, but do not place Africa at the center. So the question of placing Africa at the center of knowledge generation and regeneration is very, very important in this thing I'm talking about. Next slide. But we also have to be aware of that D slash colonial tension, right? Uh, and what I'm trying to get at is, this is different from the decolonial. The D slash colonial tension is that sometimes there's that easy and selective slippage into the very things you are trying to contest, right? And also let us remember that any time we try to decolonize, the colonial is latching behind, pulling us back from where we want to run away from. So we need to be aware of that tension. Right, because sometimes even our own practices, when we say it's decolonized, right, becomes very, very hegemonic, and they are also very, very dominating, and we need to be aware of this. And other scholars like uh, Maduro Torres, Andrew Garcinia, let's also talk about this. Next slide. Now, I want to talk about the fact of blackness here, because I think to me blackness is very, very important, because it's very, very important in the work that I do, right, uh, because. This blackness is conduced not simply in the body, not simply in the skin, but in questions of history, culture, and politics. And some of the presentations that I caught earlier just, just to this point, blackness has conduced in culture, politics, outside the body and the skin. Now, Fanon in his The Fat of Blackness alludes to that colonial project where it locates blackness as always an object, less than human, something of inferior civility in relation to whiteness, something which, which is always or already made supreme. And this is very, very important, how blackness is being taken up. Blackness is degenerated, is accorded, ambivalences, is desired, and is also repulsed. So there's the desire and there's the repulsion of blackness that we need to be aware of. We also, when we look at his racial epidemic schemata, right? Uh, Panon's fact of blackness helps us to understand how the black body is red, specifically what it means to be black in a very racist colonial encounter or in a white supremacist space. Go back to my point that I said, don't talk about this as we are talking about North America. We're talking also about this in Africa because of the way our academies are colonial satellites of the Western Academy. They are doing everything that the Western Academy does because of the race to internationalization, as others talk about. And you need to be very, very careful of this. So the larger educational implication here is ensuring that our library resources hold acquisitions that help learners to conduct a critical examination of the cartographies of blacknesses in the plural, cartographies of blacknesses. That alludes to questions of historicity, complexity, multidimensionality, and the genealogy of land and geospaces, because it's all part of the global resistances. 
right? When I talk of the multidimensionality, for example, when I talk about holding library acquisitions that engage blackness, right? Multidimensionality of blackness means that it's not just about black male authors, black female authors, black transgendered authors. Questions of black sexuality become very, very important. So this is what we mean about those holding that multidimensionality of blacknesses. So that we don't even also end up, oh, okay, let's decolonize our library acquisitions. And it's all about black men or black male authors work that we are using. We need to use about black transgendered, black sexual, gay, lesbian scholars work if we are basically what decolonizing our library acquisitions. Next slide. For no access to resist, to be resistant subjects, when he says, oh, my body makes me a person that questions, right? So the policies of naming blackness as primarily racialized is very, very important. And that means that what we call ourselves or what we mean when we call ourselves as black peoples or African peoples is as important as what we do. In my African or Ghanaian adage, there's a saying, it's not so much what one is called, but it's what you respond to. That is equally very important. So what do you respond to when you are called? What does blackness mean to you as a scholar? What does Africanness mean to you as a scholar? Is what I'm asking you to think about when you are called. It is the white gaze that leaves the black man. It fixes the black man. It's not the black man that fixes his blackness. So let's get this straight. Sometimes people talk, oh, well, we talk about blackness and well, we see blackness as something which is fixed. No, 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 no. It's the white gaze that has fixed that blackness. The black man never fixes her or his blackness because we see the multidimensionality, we see the genealogy, we see the complexity of that. Next slide. So this brings me to the question, does blackness need to encounter whiteness to grant its legitimacy? Would blackness exist outside of the colonial encounter? How do we also articulate the importance of connecting our blackness and Africanness to challenge the false reading of black experience as beginning in 1492, right? This is very, very important here also, because I think for some people, when we talk about that blackness, they see it as the beginning of colonization. No, Europe is not the advent of human history. There was a world before Europe. 1492 is not the world, the beginning of the world. This is why we need to talk about African indigeneity that goes way, 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 way back. It's very, very important. So to connect blackness with Africanness, that takes us way, 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 way back. Right? Next slide. Giving blackness is clearly race. We also have to make the sense those who try to run away from that blackness, what are, they, what are they running away from? What are they afraid of it? Let's confront it, let's engage it. Let's engage it in its complexities because there's power in doing that. There's also power in engaging blackness in a very positive solution oriented because it helps us to fight anti-blackness. It helps us to fight anti-Africanness because if we are proud of our ancestry, our culture and our heritage, if we call for these issues to be taken seriously. It allows us also to counter anti-blackness that we have to confront with. I mean, there's anti-blackness in North America and there's anti-blackness in Africa, right? There's anti-blackness in Africa. We have the police in Africa sometimes treating our own people as if what? They are, quote, animals, right? So there's also anti-blackness. Don't think anti-blackness is only somewhere else. It's also in our continent. Let's deal with that, right? Um, next slide. So the, pos the possibilities of black thought, that's what I'm getting at. Uh, let me, uh, um, so first is um, looking at some epistemic and political challenges for black radical politics going forward, right? Uh, I think the first is, which is very, very clear, and I think people have been talking about it. Yeah, colonialism is a careful, deliberate design. It's very incoherent, it's very illogical but it creates a complete disorder. 
we also have to see Fanon's point that colonialism is not a thinking machine, nor a body which is endowed with reasoning. One of the things that to me this helps me to think about is what might have happened if colonialism had not happened. Colonialism didn't happen by accident. It was a conscious decision. So when we look at Africa, for example, Africa would not have been stuck. So this idea that somehow colonialism, what colonialism basically became a disruptor of the African experience. We could have found our way, own way forward. So we have to continue to address the harm of coloniality and not resuscitate it because it's a dying system, as Amy Cesare talked about long ago, right? We need to be aware of the harm of coloniality because there's ongoing coloniality. Sometimes even we re re revisit it on our own kind within our institutions, right? The hierarchies that we produce. So you can have, say, African scholars who think in hierarchies, whose scholar is smart, who is dumb, who is deep level thinker, who is surface level thinker. We are reproducing the same colonial hierarchies. That is what we are resourcing a dying colonial system. So let's look at the ongoing colonialities that happen within our own spaces. This calls for a strategic re remembrance. Questions about remembering, restoring, re reconnecting to African history and heritage. Next slide. Secondly, to insist on what some would ca call audacious, unapologetic blackness with no false humility. I add that, with no false humility. But one which we are with love, honor, and respect for our ancestors. Thirdly, we need to reframe blackness in ways that does not empower whiteness. And fourth, we need to work with the pedagogic lessons of black pluralities. The earlier on the point that I talked about blackness in multiple spaces to work with that. Next slide. And then to resist the dispossession of the black ontological register by rewriting black history, claiming black resistance and consciousness in order to subvert the continuing conflation of blackness with criminality and deviancy. Also, my student, my, of my PhD student who is about to defend Mary McLeod, talks about advancing oppositional black theory. It's very, very important. What is this oppositional black theory we are talking about? It is designed to give voice to those who have been denied the competency to theorize, to quote, overturn the epistemic norm overturning the epistemic norm, very, very important, right? Because what it does is when we overturn that epistemic norm, we are dealing with the invalidation and the erasures of our communities, even before Europe. Next slide. There are critical teaching implications for resource collections that I want to just so the, on the question of curriculum, right, how could you undertake a curriculum scan or audit of our library collections to ask what is included, what is excluded, what is negated, what is devalued? We need to be also very, very intentional, looking for and including Black and African authored resources and to seek help from Black scholars themselves, right? We need to seek help from Black scholars themselves if we claim that we can't find their, so their resources. They are people to ask. Next slide. What should be our starting point in our analysis of Black history? How do we consider Black subjectivity with a full connection to Africa and Africanness? These are questions that the, the, the curriculum, if Labrick acquisition is about the curriculum, to be thinking through these questions and to teach blackness in 
as a social, historical, cultural, political, and spiritual condition, category, and phenomenon. Next slide. Also, decolonizing black masculinity. Decolonizing black masculinity. It's a question for the curriculum to engage in. And how do we trouble the notion of that weaponized and imprisoned black masculinities as a colleague, Mr. Kisho, talked about? Next slide. To speak about blackness as relationalities, solidarities, and conferences, and not to be dismissive, but to understand the why, the how, the who, in questioning the essentialisms that are embedded in the articulations of blackness. And then to restore the land and earthly teachings of relationality, sharing, reciprocity, connections, mutual interdependence. Somebody will ask, what does it, this have to do with library acquisitions? Well, how do we talk about sharing some of the resources that address the issues that I'm speaking about. Change up within our own institutions, across institutions, to make this scholarship available to others. This is working with the indigenous African teachings of relationality, reciprocity, mutual interdependence, connections, the Ubuntu philosophy, the African adage, it takes a community to build what? A school of learners. Next slide. So that, and I think, um, just, I, I may want to end with this because I'm looking at the time. The challenge for black education, right? We need literature, texts, and resources by black lawyers that ground our learners in their lived essential realities. We also need to articulate our centeredness and connectedness, as Amy Cesare and Mary as they talk about, as we speak about this. Particularly if you want to build new Afro free charities with a particular understanding of Afro pessimism, because Afro pessimism is also very, very relevant because it allows us to see about or bring an anti capitalist critique to our institutions, right? When we, we, okay, we don't have this book because we don't have resources or we don't have the money to purchase the book. That's a very capitalist reading, right? So to be very, very critical of that, that we need these resources because it becomes very what? Inclusive. And that money should not be the deciding factor as to which resources we acquire. But we acquire resources that are very inclusive and speaks to the diversity of the human experience. Next, next slide. Also, we need to engage resources that will allow our learners to address the question of black phobia, as others talk about, or the circumference of blackness. Uh, Jimama uh, Pia talk uh, about the predicament of blackness. And actually, maybe the black necropolitics, right? When we don't have library collections that speak about us, it's a form of black necropolitics, right? It's a form of speaking about why. We are in this period they come in, where our scholars have no sense of our blackness and our Africanness. Our learners have no sense because we are not giving them those resources to them. We are only feeding them with very Eurocentric resources. And also to be very, very critical of the institutional speak. That institutional speak, well, what I mean is we hear people say, oh, we need to contest our categories. Of course, we need to contest our categories, but that doesn't mean we should refuse blackness. Because for some, when they say, let's contest our categories, and they talk about blackness, oh, blackness, oh, well, blackness, contesting our categories is refusing blackness. No, we cannot refuse blackness. We can contest it, but not refuse it. Because to me, it's a very important entry point to some of the things that I'm talking about. So we talk about an entry point in making institutional demands. So we may have to make demands on institutions that, come on, our library collections, right, should include works of black authors, black scholars. That's making institutional demands, right? We have to make it. 
and insist on those things because to me i see them as forms of black restitution and black reparations and not let our academies continue to be colonial satellites of western academies next slide of course bringing attention to the uh, um the question of the black lens in academia and uh, this discusses that you know when we talk about this i'm not saying there are people who think oh we are making ourselves victims no we are actually resisting that's what it says it's not a discourse of big cancer victims because at the end of the day, every oppression leaves behind victims. So that to me, anybody who talks about, oh, we're we always talking about this blackness to make ourselves victims and that, no, we are talking about blackness the way which is very resistant, right? Because we want to see ourselves represented. We want to see ourselves in our library acquisitions. It's about resistance, right? And it's also being aware that spaces acquire the skin of the bodies who occupy them or who is allowed to occupy them, as Sarah Ahmed talks about. Because sometimes what happens is that when we show up in certain spaces, right, we are seen as transgressing. So a black book showing up in a certain space, somebody will be there saying, oh, we are transgressing. This book shouldn't be here, right? And this is some part we always have to deal with. Let's like. The challenge to work with our blackness, condemning with its Africanness, and also to resist the false and luxurious decoupling of the black scholar from black scholarship. I've never understood why people would decouple black scholar from black scholarship. Every black scholar must be involved in black scholarship, and everything we do must have implications and relevance for our people. So that notion of a black scholar as separate from black scholarship is very, very problematic to me, right? But of course, we need to do the intersectional analysis that I spoke about. Next slide. The indigeneity that I've always spoken about is also very, very important in this. Okay, next slide. The black experience. Next slide. Go next slide. Um, go on, go on. I, I'm just okay. no, go, go ahead. Are you going back or what? Go, go for it. Go, get to a conclusion. Yeah, some concluding thoughts, right? Just for your conclusion. All what we're talking about, right? We're talking about library acquisitions, but what is this by way of text in our institutions? There's a key question we have to engage. One is, what universities do we want? What schools do we want and are willing to fight for? That's what I'm asking you to think about. What schools do we want? What universities do we want and are willing to fight for? We also have to see our schools, our universities, as carceral places. Because they have, there's violence taking place. The exclusions that I'm talking about, the negations, the absences, those are, these are forms of violence. When we don't see our office, when we don't see our own stories being told, when we don't see our own text, that is violence. So the, our institutions are cast up places, but we can't run away from them. We have to fight to decolonize our institutions. Nobody's going to do it. We as scholars have to do it. So while they are cast up places, we have to embrace what Honey and Martin talks about. We have to embrace the policies of fleeing without leaving. So we flee from the violence, but we don't, but we don't leave because there's more work to be do. We have to do it. Next slide. And mentorship is going to be very, very important in creating communities. We can't do this by ourselves as scholars. We have to be mentors of each other. We mentor each other and stop thinking in hierarchies and to think in her circles. There's a difference in thinking in hierarchies and in thinking circles. Our learning and teaching must focus on black subjectivities in ways that allow us to connect to Africa and our Africanness and also to affirm black counter narratives. How can you affirm black counter narratives when you don't have the text, when you don't have the collections speaking to that? So we need to affirm that because it's a way of us telling our own stories 
and telling our stories, not in any other way. Because you can tell your story in an Eurocentric way, but we need to tell our stories in an African centered and through the prism of black centricity. Next slide. To connect to the land is very, very important because we can get lost on the land when we don't connect to the land. Because connecting to the land is bringing the, the interface of the body, the mind, the soul, and spirit to the issues that we talk about. This is what makes us who we are. Next slide. And to theorize Africa beyond its boundaries, of course. Next slide. So in the words of Iswahili, I thank Santi Sana. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Prof. Can we give a round of applause to Prof? Uh, <clears throat> of time uh, by commenting or on the presentation. I would like us to continue to engage uh, with the presenter on the charts, I mean on the chat box, uh, so that we will engage after the both uh, speakers have presented. <clears throat> Prof Santos, I, I was about to quote a, a Bible verse, but now uh, I was just told in the previous presentation that the Bible have been used <laughs> as one of the tools <laughs> uh, to colonize, as they say, the boat that the boat that had civilization had colonization and Christianity in the same boat. But I want uh, to say there in the Bible, there's a. Uh, there, there, there's a there's a verse that will make other people want to leave this session. That say the last wine, the the, the best wine was served last. <laughs> so as we are here, we are still a uh, very 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 interested in your presentation. We believe that the best wine was served last. So do not be anxious. We are here to stay. We are still interested in your presentation. Uh, I still have uh, my birthday, my birthday uh, people with oh, me you here. To, I will also. The food is ready. Want this? Prof, uh, Prof Des, uh, your mic is on. I am now feeling hungry. I want to have that meal with you. <laughs> <laughs> Please send the palm on this side. <laughs> uh, over to you, uh, Prof Santos. Uh, the stage is yours. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we really appreciate that. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's late to you. Um, many people have left already. And uh, but I was lucky because I've been here on time, uh, and I was privileged enough uh, to listen to uh, three excellent lectures, and um, I thank you for that. I learned a lot. Uh, I don't have much time. I don't want. To, I don't have uh, powerpoints. Nothing. I just uh, would like to share with you some ideas as they came out of uh, the things that I've been listening to. I've been written extensively uh, about the decolonization of, a, of the university and um, of the epistemologies, what I call the epistemologies of the South. But my point here is just to stress a couple of things that I have not uh, uh, seen sufficiently mentioned in the previous uh, excellent lectures. The first one is that even though we have been discussing for many, many years decolonization, 
I myself am uh, old enough and the Portuguese empire last long enough for me to be in the anti-colonial anti movement up until 1975 when the colonies, the Portuguese colonies became independent. One of them, your neighbor, Mozambique. And I could only go to Mozambique after that. And many ministers had been my friends in the struggle against the colonialism. But I think that uh, we are not, even though we have been talking and discussing a lot about decolonization, we are in a period of recolonization. Things are getting worse for us. At the university, at the libraries, at the public sphere, at politics. And they are getting worse for several reasons. And one of the reasons is another unsaid concept in this conversation capitalism. Savage capitalism in which we live today. And this savage capitalism has managed to interfere and, in fact, uh, contaminate our universities and our libraries now. We are in a period in which colonialism is returning. It never left colonialism, as I have been uh, explaining in the epistemologies of the South. Colonialism never left. It's always been here, different forms, of course. It's always been here. But now it's returning even in the oldest forms. Some guy in the United States a few years ago wrote a piece called In Defense of Colonialism. In a sense that black people don't know how to govern their countries. Well, this is seem to be very current when we look at the election, recent elections in South Africa. I've been reading the DA's communiques, quite troubling. After many years of apartheid or of neo apartheid, genocide in Gaza returning ever more savage. Colonialism. So, in spite of our laudatory work and, uh, of course, comforting, I, I speak for myself, capitalism is doubling down on our universities, on ourselves. And it's controlling our minds and our students. Our students today are getting to a kind of a neoliberal subjectivity. They want to be not workers, but collaborators. They seem to be completely autonomous because they don't care about the conditions to be autonomous. It's like the people that deliver food, the Uber people, the Uberization of, econo of the economy. They are autonomous, of course. But uh, what kind of autonomy is self-slavery? Colonialism is coming back with self-slavery. So I think that we are in a period of recolonization because capitalism is getting more and more in our minds and in our universities and in our libraries. I have discussed that. I was lucky enough to discuss this at length here and in your country with a great friend, Mogoba Ramoza, great friend of mine, and also Valenta Mudimba. And the reason why I say that is that today we have accepted in Europe as well as in Africa, elsewhere, the idea that the value of knowledge is the market value of knowledge. That's why we have rankings about universities. That's why we have rankings 
about the journals in which we publish. That's why we are bound to only publish in English because uh, 90% of the high impact journals are in English. That's not a problem for you, but it's a problem for me because my native language is not English, it's Portuguese. And many people, of course, speak other languages and English is impoverished. Your language, I say in quotation marks, because as we have seen in the congratulations to to the happy birthday of our moderator, there are many, many languages in your country. But English is the university language. And that colonialism begins there. So I think that um, we have to talk about politics because we have allowed that universities today are markets. They only, they're not only produced for the market, they are managed as a, a market enterprise, cap capitalist enterprise. And therefore, the logic of the value of knowledge is the market value is everywhere. So many other studies are, you know, going away from the universities. I see that in the United States. I know I, I've known Professor Days for a, day, for a long time because I made the connection between Paulo Freire who he also mentions with uh, many other people in education in which we have been fighting for uh, uh, pedagogy of liberation or liberation pedagogy. So it is very difficult, this struggle these days for the librarians, for the professors, for the faculty, for the students, because the, the professors are more and more precarious. They are, in fact, in a situation in which innovation is not possible anymore. To decolonize our minds and our universities, we need the revolutionary knowledge. But if we go on publishing in the main publishers and the journals, that's impossible. Because you may cite every one of, of you, particularly younger faculty, try to present your paper to a major in this, uh, journal. Sometimes you may know lots of people that have been writing. I remember the story by Ngung Batyong when he was uh, publishing in his, in, his, in his own language and not in English. Well, if we don't cite, you may cite all kinds of English, but if you cite something in Portuguese, Spanish, which is also a colonial language, Kiswahili or whatever, they don't accept that. The reviewers are the new ignorance in our system that control our knowledge. They are the surveillance. So revolutionary science is impossible. And without revolutionary science or knowledge, no decolonization takes place. And why do I say revolutionary science? Because science is a scientific, is a valid form of knowledge, but it is not only valid knowledge. Professor Dave, for instance, was speaking of the ancestors. That question, who are the ancestors? Why are they with us? That question cannot be formulated in scientific terms and therefore cannot be answered by science. So science can only answer questions that can be formulated in scientific terms. But there are many important questions that cannot be formulated in scientific terms. Why are we in this world? What is the meaning of life? Why are our ancestors with us? What is happiness? These are non-scientific questions. And that's why I've been pleading, and my master here has been a great Kenyan philosopher, Odera Uruka, the Sage philosophy. It started lots of things. And now my colleague from Senegal, Suleiman Bashir Diani. 
and many others. Vazi Viredu was also a great master, like Gungbat Young, many others. I, I cannot really mention them here. But what we, we can say is that we need other, the idea that other knowledges are also valid in their own terms. Science is valid, but it's very much part of it. It's colonialist. Part can be used by us for anti-colonial struggles. Who taught me that? A great liberator of Portuguese colonialism, Amilcar Cabral. He said, no, we are not going to throw away science, modern science. He was an agronomer, actually, trained in Lisbon University. We are going to select what we like, what is useful for us in modern science. <laughs> and what is not useful, we throw it away. There are other ways of knowing our knowledges. Ancestors' knowledges, knowledges born in struggle, as I call them, in my epistemologies of the South. What are the epistemologies of the South? All the knowledges born in struggle of those that have been fighting against capitalism, colonialism and patriarchy since the 16th century. And they have resisted. And they are here with us. But can they enter our libraries? Probably not. Our universities, not. Why? Well, you know that the term that was in fact invented in Africa, not by me, it's called orature. Our colleague from Uganda, in fact, assassinated later on. How can we put orature in our libraries? We put literature, but not orature. How can you bring our orature to our universities? the wise people of our communities to speak to our students. Other medicines, other laws, other ways of uh, prying people, what we call legal pluralism. So it is an immense task, I think, that we have ahead. And in fact, decolonization has to take place both, both in black people and white people, in every brown people and everyone. But we don't do that without fighting against capitalism because capitalism is becoming ever more savage. We are on the brink of a global third world war. Extreme right is everywhere. Domestic violence is growing everywhere in the global north as in the global south. And I think that your country, my dear friends, South Africa, because it is a democracy, <laughs> with all the limitations, but it's a democracy. <laughs> and Brazil, who is also a democracy, are part of BRICS. <laughs> and uh, they are probably going to be destabilized. I finished here. I don't want to take your time. I'm not... Uh, I, of course, go, could go forever uh, on these questions. I just would like to throw a little bit, uh, not a pessimism, I'm not a pessimist. I'm a man, a person of a tragic optimism. I think that we have to know the fears in order to have hope. Because I think the imbalance in our world is that too many people have too much fear and very little hope. And a few billionaires have too much hope and no fear of enemies. So I think that we have to be, to have more hope. We have to create some fear among the powerful because the powerful don't fear us anymore. They think that we are, in a sense, quite resignated. So my uh, call here is for struggle, both inside the university and outside the university, both in the library and outside the library. And in the university, build the counter-university, 
as I say, the subversity. That's what we are. We should be doing as much in Africa as in Asia, in Latin America and Europe, because the global system is becoming ever more global. And uh, our space to speak is in, in fact uh, diminishing in spite of all these technologies that we have available. So I wish you all the luck in the world, as I wish to the younger people everywhere. The struggles are going to be very tough in the future, in the political terms, in epistemological terms, because I don't think that there is global justice without cognitive justice. Cognitive justice are the epistemologies of the South, and those epistemologists will bring us hope. But for that, we have to struggle. Thank you. Yeah, can we give a uh, Prof Santos <coughs> around? Yeah, I don't even want to start uh, to say what was said, but I am taking a uh, recolonization while we're still busy wrapping our heads around decolonization, as Ntabi has said before, that it seems as if the next generation is more colonized, but now we say they are recolonized. As in this session, we are coming close to the end, is that we are not anti-Western, but we want to put Africa in the center. We want to unchain our minds. As we do that, we still have uh, the struggle continues because of colonialism never left us. Uh, it's still with us where our universities have been made, the market, uh, the marketplace, uh, our knowledge that uh, in general we would share freely. Now we have to put tech in that. Uh, but now the revolution of knowledge needs to take place. I want to believe and I am committing UFS, the University of Free State Library Management, in that this conversation needs to continue. There's so much that, uh, because there are questions that we should ask, we should not uh, fear so much that uh, we let the those decision makers, the powerful, comfortable, while we have still voices that are missing in the critical dialogues. Uh, let me see what's happening on the charts before I continue. Uh, there are comments here. Uh, there are no questions, uh, which we appreciate uh, the audience uh, for what they are taking home. We really appreciate uh, Prof. Santos and Prof. Des for your time. That uh, it's really, as I said, uh, we saved the best for the last. They say yeah, it's wisdom of elders. I think they're looking in your cameras, in your faces. Mm -hmm. They decide that you are elders. <laughs> so we. <laughs> yeah. Can I? Can I? Can I? <laughs> yes, you may comment. You may comment. No, no. I, I mean, I, I can't. Um, be in this privileged space with <laughs> Professor Santos and, and not I, I honestly I, I it's a privilege right uh, and to me to hear him say that actually um, it's also aware of my work it's, it's even ice on the ice on the cake um, you know you're right I mean the question of the um, how uh, colonization has left us and then rest is becoming uh, more and more capitalist right I, I, I see it and I think this is why we are so caught. We see we are so caught in it, and it's very, very difficult to break in it because of the political economy of academia, right? We we so caught, and I, you're so right in saying that we, we need an alternative or counter spaces, right, where we can be ourselves, right, and not be detected to by the 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 mandates and details of capital, right? And 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 this is to me where the point about we need to be when we look at say in the case of Africa, uh, there's a difference between having a university in Africa and having an African university, right? The universities we have now are basically copying the West, right? Everything that you were saying, they're doing it, right? Everything, 
right? The savage, the savagery that you talk about, right? It's all happening in our universities. It's all happening. And this is a big challenge. This is a big challenge, right? And you know, I mean, you've been in this for longer than I, right? You know that, for example, when you try to make those resistances, they come at a cost. They come at 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 at, at, at a cost. Because sometimes you are seen as anti-intellectual, right? You are seen as anti-intellectual, or and and that and that's sort of it. So I, I just wanted to make that comment, right? Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, thank you, Prof. For, the, for those comments, we, uh, colleagues, uh, just before I hand to uh, Monde for for the closing remarks and announcements, uh, you know, uh, oh, as a birthday girl, thank you for all the messages. I did not want to interrupt the flow of the of the presentation. I am very happy. I have done screenshots. Those who follow me on Facebook and on any other social media, you will see there I'm taking them there. So uh, those that are really comfortable with putting the camera on, please put your camera on. Now we are going for the photo shoot. It's a gift from me that you have been with us until this uh, time. So I must have you as memorizer from me. I, I need to keep these faces say, the year we were busy, we were talking about all the recolonization, re decolonization, you know, all these big words. Uh, while colleagues are putting camera on, you know, uh, here in South Africa, other thing that is uh, we, are, we have been colonizing is with our native's name. Uh, sometimes we shortened our names so that other people are able to call our names. Uh, and the, our names have to do with our identity. So when someone is pronouncing it wrong or calling it wrong, then the meaning of your name changes. But we are comfortable with that. Uh, we understand that uh, there are people that will not call us. I seem to be not comfortable. Uh, but the, the, what I'm trying to say, there's so a lot in this uh, unchaining of our minds that we have lived with it as so much that we think it's a right way to do it. We are not even challenging that. Why I cannot write in this course? Because I always think, but who will read this? It will not go international. Why? So today, I repented on other things. Uh, I think I am taking the baton from the elders, Prof Santos and Prof De. I I will be your score from today. A uh, technical team, are you ready to take our pictures? So all of you must say happy birthday to me, so that your pictures you are, you will come smiling. I don't want uh, people. So three, two, one, smile. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for a sign from technical team. <laughs> uh, Monday, your technical team, please do thumbs up when we have managed to take our the screenshot. I guess they've taken them. Thank you, colleagues. With that, uh, cameras on, all smiling. I am handing over to the organizers. Thank you. <laughs> uh, in my language, I say Diabulela. <laughs> Thank you. Enkos. Enkos, Suzuki. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Suzuki. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, colleagues, uh, we've finally come to the end of this um, very important uh, uh, symposium. And as Zuki has indicated, saving the best for last. I think the last two speakers, the elders, <laughs> they've given us a lot of. Uh, in, I mean, I mean, we've been hearing a lot from the from the beginning up to now. We are very excited, and uh, I can promise you, whatever that we have shared, we are. It was going. It will go to our um, whatever policies or procedures that will come. And uh, starting from the beginning, I just want to ask, uh, help uh, to to say thank you to the to the director libraries uh, who gave us a, a green light to go ahead with this symposium. Thanks a lot, and also to our DVC uh, Pro, uh, Professor Reddy who gave.
supporting uh, message and even though it was recorded in absentia we also are saying thank you to the the, the speakers first one up to the last we've been hearing a lot from the different speakers from different corners of the world but with the common about uh, uh, decolonization we really appreciate and i can as i've indicated earlier promise you that whatever that was shared here it will uh, be uh, implemented in one way or or the another and i also want to thank the the session chairs including the birthday girl for the wonderful job that they have done we really really appreciate it this uh, library staff all campuses we want to thank you and also the university community, and also the presenters like Prof. Dr. Mushonga, who is also our colleague, and also want to thank the, the technical team for the wonderful job up to here, presenters, all the uh, member, the attendees nationally. Thank you for being with us up to here. I can promise you that the next one will be bigger than this. I'm already thinking, uh, starting with the, with the preparation for the next symposium, and we want to make it bigger and stronger. And we are happy that you've been with us until this time of, 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 of the day. Uh, it's been a worthwhile, and uh, we, we're looking forward, as I've indicated, to the next one. And uh, 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 and we're looking forward to seeing you in the next uh, by annual. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank, Thank you. you chair.